Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning session on uh, tropical and precipitation studies and more. These will be five virtual talks, and I want to remind the presenters that they should give two, and two or three minutes for uh, questions afterwards. Uh, the first talk is given by Dr. Chi Chi Cheng at the Cluster Tech Limited in Hong Kong and is named MPAS A with hierarchical time stepping and customized mass generation 2023 updates. The floor is yours. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is Chi Chi. First of all, I would like to thank my colleagues with names here and also some contributors with something here. They contributed to the work. Today, I would like to talk about the background about uh, CPAS functionalities. And then I will talk about 200 meter resolutions for a city in a global model. At last, I shall be, uh, talk about some learning resources on kickstarting CPAS usage, which is an online course. So our start begins uh, with uh, adaptive mesh refinement techniques in some previous background we would like to apply it to weather prediction. So we based our work on the atmosphere model with appreciation. We created an online HPC platform, which is called cluster tab platform for atmospheric simulation CPAS. And then we maintain it for four years. So on the platform, the first thing you can do is to create a customized and structured mesh. On the web interface, users can draw regions like this, any location, any shape with nesting and then specify target resolution. With some clicks, the platform will generate the customized mesh for you, usually in about one hour. And the mesh is a valid SCVT for both MPAS or CPAS usage. So probably you may have a some kind of mesh like this now. There can be small cells and also a large number of big cells covering the group. So computational costs become an issue now. Um, if you use uniform time step, uh, it, you will be constrained by the stability condition for the finest grid spacing. If this is small, then you, you, you need to use a small time step. And for large cells, it will needs a large, the same number of uh, time steps, which is costly, but uh, it is not necessary for its own stability condition. So can we use variable time steps? Uh, we are inspired by Wolf, which use uh, a larger time step for coarser domain. So we implemented jumping steps uh, like this uh, in a factor of tools and like this. And the result is we can have a reduction of computational costs shown by the green bars here. And also uh, we can uh, reduce unnecessary numerical dissipation for large cells. And some more new features on the CPAS platform in recent year. Firstly, we support four dimensional data simulation as shown in the user interface um, on the right-hand side of a figure. And this can be used for reanalysis. And for high resolution, we support uh, multi resolution static data sources. Three second resolution uh, source data will be automatically used if you specify regions with finer than two kilometers. That includes uh, updated modis land use data with a uh, cost line, a uh, better cost line, and uh, soil type data and terrain data. Uh, three seconds resolution. Thirdly, we have integrated Shin Home PPL scheme for the great song resolution, and it can be chosen in the web interface. And not on web service, but uh, we have uh, already integrated is the GSL GWDO scheme. And also we are able to convert the resulting NWP data to open form boundary condition data. And also under progress, we are working on integrating the P3 micro physics scheme. And also we are working on improving uh, the mesh generation itself. So uh, we have that tools. We go to try 200 meter resolution in a global mesh. And uh, before that, 
we carry out idealized tests to test the dynamical core or uh, with hierarchical time stepping. So uh, we have an initial condition uh, having a sonar wind profile as in the paper, and we do a time integration up to 15 days. And we see that um, baroclinic wave appear uh, around uh, 9.5 days. And the mesh uh, consists of uh, a small region of 200 meter resolution parts uh, shown in the here. Here is the uh, fine pattern uh, of the meridional wind uh, with uh, varying uh, color scales to show you the pattern. And then the mesh has uh, cosen and cosen, and then the wider part is uh, 100 meter kilometer. And so uh, the observed uh, baroclinic wave patterns are similar to the outcomes of other NWP models. And we go ahead, uh, we go ahead evaluating the two norms used in the original paper. And we observed that uh, before 10 days, the norms are small. So uh, the quantities that need to be conserved are basically conserved. And we see that uh, this model should be good for practical users. Then we uh, try some cases. Uh, these cases is the uh, Typhoon Mankut. And uh, we have some results on wind pattern. Uh, the first one is the uh, wind pattern simulated over mountains. This is a plot of uh, the highest peak in Hong Kong, which has an elevation of over 900 meters. And mountain ridges are well represented by 200 meter resolution. And uh, the other figure is uh, a contrast using a 1km resolution. And we see that uh, the quality of a simulation uh, has a big contrast. Uh, in the high resolution one, the wind speed over reaches the uh, simulator to be high and looks very realistic. And we track against observation data. First, uh, we pick three, uh, three hills. And firstly, we find that the terrain data resolve uh, the altitude of the stations very well with smaller bias. And the result is the simulated winds which also have smaller bias. So one application we can think of is the, is the damage risk analysis of outdoor facilities uh, like a power transmission lines. Secondly, we look into the uh, sheltering effects of mountains. In the study, we uh, divide four quadrants for the changing uh, wind directions and then evaluate the prediction of wind speed in areas sheltered by uh, mountains. If lower resolution is used, usually the bias is positive. And after using a uh, fine resolution, we see that the bias is reduced. We pick one interested case and put it out. Uh, this is one station in southern part of the Hong Kong Island, which is actually surrounded by some hills. Uh, using one km resolution, the, uh, the hills are not very well resolved. And the, in the typhoon, uh, there is uh, obvious positive bias in the simulated wind speed. If you use 200 meter resolution, the bias is reduced. Uh, these results are published in this paper. So uh, now we have better simulation uh, for wind space uh, at mountain top and sheltered area. We look into the city area. This is the Kowloon Peninsula, which is kind of protected by the mountains surrounding it. And uh, this is the Hong Kong Islands with some complex terrain. So in the typhoon, as wind direction changes within two hours at different locations, actually the sheltering effect changes a lot. Uh, in the typhoon, there are some buildings with many glass curtains broken. So uh, can we do something to help developers design their building? Um, here is uh, one more plot, uh, the vertical section uh, on, on the complex terrain on the island. Um, one interesting we see with high resolution simulation is that uh, even flow separation can be simulated behind the mountain. And in front of the mountain there, it is actually an urban area with buildings like this. So there is hazardous wind speed. Uh, 
In common computational fluid dynamics analysis for aerodynamics or for buildings, uh, idealized inlet profile is often used. Now uh, we have the NWP model with high resolution, which can represent the terrains of the environments. And the resolution is very high that uh, if you want to look at a location in the city, uh, you have, uh, they, are, they are very well represented. And also in, uh, in the vertical dimension, the resolution is also good. So we tried supplying the NWP data as a realistic inlet data for CFD computation. So here is one result. Uh, the plotting shows streamlines, uh, which is uh, rain solutions, uh, rain noise average, navy stock solution uh, of the computation. Uh, the coloring shows that a uh, high speed, high wind speed is uh, near ground, and you can see that the wind is squeezed between the gaps of the buildings. And if you analyze the pressure, uh, you see that red pressure represents positive uh, relative pressure. And, and blue colors represent negative uh, relative pressures, which are, which can be hazardous to the buildings, curtains, uh, glass curtain. Uh, one more figure showing the, the squeezed wind. So we think that uh, one application of a high resolution entropy model can be for supplying realistic boundary conditions for CFD uh, aerodynamic analysis for buildings. Uh, so here is an uh, 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 online course which was taught uh, right uh, last year's summer in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. It can be uh, materials for uh, kickstarting uh, learning how to use CPAS. Uh, the recipients uh, uh, undergraduate level only a mix of year one to three students. So uh, the Go is to is is kind of a hands-on learning of uh, NLP for these undergraduate students, and we use an approach and experiential learning in which uh, they have to do projects, which we we require them to role play with the conference uh, to re-simulate severe uh, weather events. Uh, group students in five students per group. Each student is required to uh, make two prediction runs under uh, computational resource constraints. So they have to carefully design the mesh and, and have some reasoning on why they design so. Um, they are decrypted with some- Three minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so the university do not have to uh, set up system for them. The students uh, use browser to operate them and uh, students did uh, very good jobs. So uh, here is the conclusions, uh, all are just like above. Uh, C++ is an online platform, you have uh, time stepping, and then uh, two, 200 meter resolution, you have, we have some good results on wind prediction, and we are going to uh, give public access of the online course, and we are also working on integrating urban canopy model to C++. Uh, thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Questions are welcome. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. I thank you. It was a very interesting talk on adapting impasse to some other um, <clears throat> situations there. When we, when our experience in changing time steps across a variable resolution mesh mostly comes from wharf. And what we found typically is that it's not the response of the dynamics to the different time steps, but typically the response to the physics using different time steps in the fine resolution region and coarse resolution region. And we see oftentimes a mismatch at the, where the resolution changes. Do you see anything like that in, in any of your applications? And do you have to do anything to, to deal with that? Uh, yes, this is indeed a challenge for us. Uh, we also know that in such application, the scale awareness of parameterization schemes is, is vital. So we have to uh, uh, make sure the com combinations of the physics scheme uh, matches uh, the 
aside uh, resolutions of the regions. Uh, this is this is uh, quite uh, demanding, and we 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 did we actually did uh, hard work in in uh, in finding solutions for this. But uh, we do have some. Uh, successful cases, which uh, you can browse our website uh, or blog articles. Um, th uh, also, that depends on uh, the aim of your simulation, whether you want to find greater data for some specific location and for what period of time, three days or nine days, then we may have some combinations that really work well. Thank you. Um, we are ready to move on to our next lecturer, which is Dr. Akiseti Maduluatha at the MOES Kiaps in India. And the topics of the talk is effect of a single and double moment microphysics schemes and change in the CCN latent heating rate structure associated with severe convective systems over the Korean Peninsula. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Am I audible and visible? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Are you going to share the presentation or shall I uh, share? You should be sharing your presentation. Uh, but here it's I'm testing. showing one, uh, one participant can share. Can you close from your end anything is there? We can share for you. This is your presentation? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Just tell us when to go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, hi, everyone. This is Madhula Takisati from IMD New Delhi. I would like to thank Convenience for this opportunity to present our work. And uh, this is the work I have conducted at my previous workplace, Kiabs, in collaboration with uh, the to DSR and CAR. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the nice collaboration. I also would like to acknowledge Dr. Hong, sir, for initiating this collaboration and other colleagues from Kiabs for their support. And also, I would like to acknowledge my current colleagues at IMD and MOS for their support and encouragement. And uh, today, I'm going to speak on uh, the sensitivity of double and single moment schemes on simulation for MCS. Next, please. Uh, if you see uh, in numerical models, cloud microphysics plays important role in representation of different cloud hydrometers. If you see in your cloud, there are basically two types of microphysics are there, below freezing level and above freezing level, uh, warm processes and cold processes and warm microphysics and cold cloud microphysics. Uh, the representation of these microphysical processes are done by the cloud microphysics schemes. As you know, there are two types of microphysics bulk and binary. Uh, today, BIN, sorry, BIN. Today, I'm going to discuss on the sensitivity of bulk microphysics schemes. Actually, these bulk microphysics schemes produce the prognostic of uh, mixing ratio of cloud hydrometers and also number concentration. There are, if you see this picture, there are variety of microphysics, bulk microphysics schemes are available. For the single moment, they represent only the hydrometer mixing ratio distribution. And uh, if you go to the double moment, number concentration also comes into picture, which give more detail of the cloud hydrometers in different convective environments. I will explain in detail. If you see this cloud picture below, freezing level, uh, most of the solid uh, liquid hydrometers are there. Above the freezing level, solid hydrometers are there. So the water vapor is transferred into different types of uh, cloud hydrometers. So uh, if you see the uh, double moment scheme, for example, the distribution of cloud hydrometers below freezing level and above freezing level are different for both single moment and double moment. Uh, the solid uh, warm uh, cold cloud microphysics is same, but 
uh, the, the different in warm cloud metaphysics means uh, if you take the cloud and the rain for WDM6 double moment, uh, they're giving the number concentration also. And also there is CCN activation in double moment, WRF double moment scheme. So it affects the condensation. So these three processes, CCN and number concentration of cloud and rain affect, differ the both in uh, warm cloud microphysics and it indirectly affect the cold cloud microphysics and vertical distribution of cloud. So to get more detail, we try to see the latent heat uh, uh, structure using these schemes, how they are affecting the uh, rainfall simulation and vertical uh, dynamics of the cloud. And also we try to see the change in aerosol concentration. Next, please. They, uh, we have considered this case study, which was formed over South Korea in 2017. Various uh, platforms from satellite, radar, and TR and MMM satellite showed that there is a large system which was formed associated with the synoptic forcing in the Changma season. You can see over the so large record breaking rainfall was happening. To simulate the system, we tried to use the WRF nested domain. We have conducted a variety of experiments to see the sensitivity of physics resolution and domain says finally this is the control setup which worked better and uh, today i'm going to discuss on sensitivity of uh, uh, single and double moment schemes in capturing this uh, rainfall over the south korean region next please uh, as i mentioned uh, to see the sensitivity of these schemes we try to simulate the latent heating rate using the microphysical transformation terms available in the uh, microphysics module. Representation of, I mean, formulation of these uh, microphysical processes affect the latent heating rate simulation and the subsequent uh, storm evolution. Basically, when the water vapor is transformed into cloud hydrometeors, the phase transformation takes place, both warming and cooling. So this major uh, warming process, condensation, freezing, and deposition, major cooling process, evaporation, melting, and sublimation are study it to understand get more insight of this microphysical processes and these are output into the wrf output to calculate the latent heat both from single and double moment schemes next please yeah coming to the results first i'm going to see show the rainfall distribution if you see the top panel first one is the aws second is the trm you see the third one is wdm6 and fourth one is single moment if you see the spatial distribution of uh, rainfall is a uh, little different in double and single moment schemes but overall the pattern correlation is improved it is 0 0.59 in double moment compared to single moment. So to understand what causes this difference because of this double moment schemes, we try to investigate the uh, different cloud hydrometeors. For this, we have uh, considered this precipitation correlation red box over this uh, map. And over this region, we try to segregate the developing and dissipating stage of the system based on uh, the rainfall. You can see the TRM and rainfall. So these are the developing and dissipating stages considered over the precipitation region if you see the total hydrometeor content on the left side is wdm6 you can see that this is the total hydrometeors dominant more hydrometeors more total hydrometeors are noted in a double moment compared to single moment you can see the difference also is positive so wdm6 is giving more more uh, hydrometeor content we try to see separately also so as i told there is difference in uh, uh, formulation for warm cloud uh, warm microphysics in WDM6. If you see in the developing stage, all are showing um, are dominant in WDM6. Uh, if you see the liquid hydrometeors, means the cloud and rain. Cloud is dominant and rain is also dominant. And above the freezing level, and the distribution is also different below because one is following Gaussian distribution and the WSM6 is following exponential for representation of these cloud hydrometers. And above freezing level, the distribution is more or less same because both are following the same formulation. But the warm cloud may affect these things and it has caused some a difference. But if you see, look into the detail why this uh, cloud is more, if you see for uh, WDM6, there is condensation activation is there. It will activate the condensation processes because of the condensation nuclei compared to WSM6. And it has caused more cloud at the lower levels. And uh, at the upper levels, uh, rain is also more to 
get more details, we try to see the number concentration from the schemes. Next, please. Yeah, so if you see, this is the rain number concentration. Uh, uh, left panel is single moment and right panel is double moment. If you see for rain, it is more, uh, since it is exponential distribution, it is more or less uniform in uh, single moment, but in double moment, you can see multi-cell structure is there. Actually in WDM6, this rain number concentration is also added. This is the prognostic variable. In order to compare, we just calculated from WSM6 using the particle density. Uh, the formulas are given here. If you see the rain number concentration is more or less uniform from surface to meet levels in uh, um, WSM6, but in WDM6, it is, if you see the rain number concentration at mid levels, it is more. If you want to connect this way, why rain number is, uh, rain is more at the mid levels, this is because of more rain number concentration in WDM6 and cloud is also more. If you see the cloud number concentration, cloud number constant, uh, concentration is constant in WSM6, but it is available prognostic in NC. So it is called Using here a low 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 cloud number concentration at the upper levels correspond to the high number rain number concentration and increase in rain. But at the lower levels, if you see the cloud number concentration is more made because of uh, condensation activation. So more cloud at upper levels and it is enhancing uh, the condensation process. So more clouds at the lower levels. Then after that. Uh, at middle levels, because of large rain number concentration, the conversion of cloud to rain is more. Uh, so, uh, by considering, by including the number concentration of uh, both cloud and rain, actually it has activated auto conversion and accretion processes in WDF6, and it is uh, multicellular structure means more detail of rain and number concentration is evident, which has. Uh, caused more cloud at lower levels as it, as in real cases and then convert into rain at the upper levels, but it is absent in the single moment scales. Next, please. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so in order to, to get more insight, we try to see the latent heating, individual latent heating rates from both the schemes. If you see uh, the left is single moment and uh, it is WDM6, you can see that more multicellular structure is evident in WDM compared to WSM, particularly for condensation it is more and freezing is also more. Uh, so increased uh, uh, evaporation in WDM6 and during developing stage uh, and dissipating stages in WDM6, this can be attributed to the number concentration of cloud and uh, rain number concentration, which affect both warm and cold cloud microphysics. Next, please. Yeah, next please. Yeah, so uh, next thing we try to see uh, how the change in CCM will affect the vertical distribution in WDM6. Generally, it is initial CCM is 100. We increased it to 1000 and we try to see here uh, the rainfall plot is missed, but the spatial distribution pattern correlation of rainfall is more improved by increasing in CCM. It is around 0.62. But if you see the total hydrometer content also, it is more dominant by increasing in CCN. Basically, change in CCN will affect the, uh, will uh, if there are more CCN, it will suppress the warm rain processes according to the Rosen field and it will increase, means more uh, droplets will form and this uh, droplets will go upper side and it will affect the cold, increase, increase the, uh, suppress the Membrane processes and improve the cold cloud processes and it will enhance the vertical distribution of cloud which is very much important for cumulonimbus cloud of severe weather. You can see that freezing is more. So uh, the thing is it is affecting both vertical distribution of uh, reflectivity and hydrometer. For this case increase in CCN has improved the simulation. Uh, means pattern correlation is improved. Uh, so next please. Uh, so we then try to see the net latent heating contribution. This is uh, from all the three experiments. Then we compared with ERA-5 based on NI et al. If you see in the WSM-6, the cloud array, uh, heating structure is more or less similar. Multicellular structure is not evident in single moment. But if you see in WDM-6 with increase in CCN, the uh, multicellular structure, which is uh, as it is close to reality, and you can see the multicellular structure in ERA-5 also. So the active 
regulation of condensation and the inclusion of number concentration of both uh, cloud and rain hydrometers improved the warm cloud uh, microphysics and affected the uh, cold cloud microphysics. And by increasing the CCN, the aerosol, cloud aerosol interactions are taken care properly and uh, uh, improved the vertical distribution of cloud and subsequent rainfall. So the thing is, if you see that, uh, contribution from different microphysical processes here i am showing there are differences so the implication of the study is if you see in detail the latent heating uh, profiles it can see it can be the proxy for testing the sensitivity and also how the individual microphysical processes which are formulated that how they are changing and how they are affecting latent heating rate can be studied and also next please i will conclude in the next slide 3 minutes yeah can you please go to the next slide? I just conclude there. Yeah. So uh, uh, first thing is it can use full as a proxy to test the sensitivity of these microphysics schemes. And also by seeing the contribution from different microphysical processes, you can further evaluate in deep and develop these microphysics schemes. And also uh, to study the cloud aerosol interactions also and how they are affecting the warm and cold cloud microphysics also we can see and how it is affecting the vertical distribution of, of cloud also see here it is only one case maybe for this case it, it is different but if you do, do for different cases you can choose which microphysics is uh, uh, better actually it is very much important in real simulations uh, see if this scheme is working for this for forecasting on real time it is very much important so we can we have to do more more studies and uh, uh, dip, depends on type of weather, thunderstorm, depressions, and tropical cyclones. And we can further, uh, it is for very much further helpful to evaluate and develop the microphysics modules and also to study the cloud aerosol interactions from small scale to the global scale. So currently this manuscript is under internal review. Thank you and I am open for questions. Thank you very much. We have time for one quick question. If not, then thank you for your talk. And we move on to next one. It's yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Which is given by Dr. Mishra at the Department of Planning and Development, Government of Bidar in India. And the title is Atmospheric River, the Cause of Extreme Precipitation over in Eastern India in 2019. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone uh, in different parts of the world. I hope I'm audible. Uh, so technically, in this talk, I'll be briefly presenting you some new results where we have just operationalized the WRF model and we have tested it over an extreme precipitation event. So this event basically transpired in 2019 and it was, you know, an unusually uh, delayed retrieval of monsoon year. And along with that, uh, along with that, that was an year with a unusually higher Indian Ocean dipole. So these are some of the factors which kind of at a climatic perspective, which could have driven such an event. So uh, without really kind of uh, taking more time, I'll just quickly give a brief background of atmospheric rivers. These are basically, as you all know, I mean, they have led to large scale uh, flash flood precipitation events in different parts of the world. Uh, they are basically narrow, long, bands of extremely high water vapor in the atmosphere. And as I said, they can trigger extreme rainfall events. Now, one of the proxies to kind of identify their presence in the atmosphere is computing the IVT. That's basically uh, the integrated water vapor transport where we look into the column of uh, atmosphere and how much water vapor is there. Mathematically speaking, is just a computation of the wind speed at that particular level and the corresponding specific humidity. So somewhere we end up with the units of uh, kg meters per second. Okay, just to give a feel of things. Now here's a study which got published in Nature in 2020, which also talked about these atmospheric rivers which can trigger extreme events in the 
Indian subcontinent, especially during the monsoon season, they got a p-value of 0 0.20. But one thing which is very significant that we can see that continuously these events have been occurring over the past you know, 60, 70 years. Uh, in which this was primarily based on, I guess, on era five data. And so in this, one of the major objectives was how well the WRF model will uh, you know, perform, and we perform different sensitivity studies as LL show. So these are the basic objectives with which we started this study. Uh, where was we wanted to identify this extreme event? We use different data sets to do that. We investigated the synoptic meteorology. We looked at what are the triggering factors which you know cause, which can cause such an extreme event. Is there an uh, you know the the AR factor involved? Then we set up the WRF model simulation now. Our domain was slightly challenging. We had a flat land of thousands of kilometers and the Nepal borders, the Himalayas. So we had a very high top level in the model and we had to dampen the variety waves. That was a, one of the challenging uh, kind of prospects. And then I'll just briefly present about the validation, how the results kind of go in this study. These are the tools or techniques are which we have primarily used. We have used the WRF model. You can see we have zoomed in over the eastern part of India at three kilometers. These are different schemes, right? The, the microphysics schemes, the, the RRTM model. Uh, we didn't use a cumulus parameterization in the innermost domain, right? We switched off the cumulus parameterization. Then to have a synoptic understanding, we, we investigated the era five data and we also looked at the GPM data. Now, also I would point out that we had a, a network of ground-based rain gauge networks. That was the only kind of uh, true thing, ground true thing available. So we have analyzed and taken that data set also to kind of confirm. So this is the basic, the image from GPM, the global precipitation mission from 26 to 30. September 2019, where we can see that on the eastern coast, where I've highlighted through a red box, that we kind of received more than 400 mm of rainfall in a span of four days. That's in the heavy rainfall category for continuously for five days. On the right hand side, I've just zoomed in over, you know, the state is called as Bihar, where I'm also currently sitting and giving my presentation. So uh, the shape file is exploded on the right hand side where we can see how the rainfall pattern was there on each of the days where we had more than approximately 100 mm of rainfall on each of the days. Now, the same thing as observed in GPM, we had ground based observation network as well, rain gauge in place. We can see that these each of these circles are representing the quantity, right, and the color code. So you can see that there are events where more or less on all these three days. I mean, we have the data. I mean, getting ground level data is, is a big uh, kind of a deal in this part of the world. So we have a uh, large scale observation. You can see where we can see the category of rainfall was mostly between moderate to heavy, but there were certain points where we also observed extremely heavy rainfall events, right? More than 204.4 mm in a single day. So we quickly, uh, you know, uh, perched the, I mean, not first looked at the era five data and tried to analyze what was the mean sea level, look at the synoptic level understanding of the event. So during this period, now this, as we know that the monsoon is peculiarly active in this time, there was a period when the monsoon was on a delayed retrieval. So we can see somewhat at the surface level and the surface wind, a high pressure kind of system was, is not high pressure, but still uh, relatively higher pressure on the, parts where we are observing uh, these extreme precipitation events. On the right hand side, I'd like to bring your attention to that where I've plotted the 500 meter hectopascal vorticity and overlaid with the 500 hectopascal wind. We can see that over Bihar, there was significantly higher vorticity observed and a, a thin band continuously right from the Arabian Sea could be observed as a, as a proxy of things what, uh, what were what was causing this atmospheric disturbance is kind of present in the data set. So, as I said, we set up the WRF model over this region. I'm just showcasing some of the best results which I got. So this is from the innermost domain, which was at three kilometer resolution where we simulated WRF model with the different schemes, as I said earlier, three, four slides back. And we can see that the, the rainfall uh, pattern was very well being captured. I mean, we can see that it's as high as 300 to 400 mm of rainfall as we had observed is being simulated in the modeling domain as well. I kind of did two main simulations as I say, one was 
with nudging, nudging above the planetary boundary layer to the global analysis field, and one was without nudging. Now, this is basically just a brief comparison of two of those rain gauges, where we can see that the first kind of three columns show about the observation, and the next two chunks of data are representing the wharf without nudging and wharf with nudging. So, one of the things which is very peculiar or which is uh, which was really good and kind of uh, showing the operational point of view that the temporal variability, how the rainfall was basically changing is very well being captured by both the simulations. We have incorporated era five data in the model. I mean, we have downscaled, dynamically downscaled era five data through WRF, but while using the nudging, the analysis nudging above the PBL towards the global analysis field, we observed that uh, the quantity of rainfall, the underestimation kind of reduced by 25% when we you, when we nudged the model. So that's one of the significant results along uh, with, you know, the setting of the modeling domain. Now, what if, if I have to investigate, what is what was the triggering factor? So this image at 850 Heta Pascal shows you the presence of atmospheric river where the, uh, where you can see this is the IVT, plotted at 850 hectare Pascal, and we can see the significant value and how we can observe the river, atmospheric river, which kind of originates somewhere in Arabian Sea, and it, you know, gives down all the water or the rainfall, not the water, over Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, which kind of triggered this uh, extreme event. Now, I quickly looked at, at the anomaly using the 30-year uh, average data and, and compared with this event. So you can see that's significantly higher as has been observed by different studies, but more importantly, the quantity or the quantum of rainfall in this event was significantly higher and which kind of led to ultimately large scale flash floods as well as there were inundation in different parts in the state and ultimately these were the uh, atmospheric career was the main triggering factor behind this so with that i'll come to the last slide where these are the take home message from the study which we have kind of conducted till now that an extreme event was identified for which we have utilized gpm era 5 data and ingested the era 5 data in wrf to investigate this event. Now the 500 hectare Pascal vorticity gave an indication of a continuous band of instability in the atmosphere right from Arabian Sea till, uh, till the eastern part of India over Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. And when we further investigated, it was basically an atmospheric river, which is kind of transmitting this, this large amount of water and uh, kind of incorporating the, uh, the the moisture to 2,000 kilometers. And WRF is able to accurately uh, represent the observation, I mean, the temporal variability in the rainfall with nudging the model above the planetary boundary layer, the uncertainty or the underestimation further goes down by 25%. The IVT analysis shows significantly higher anomaly, indicating the presence of an atmospheric river. And also, as I can say, the implication of this, which also kind of uh, gives a second round of study is the inundation, which kind of impact the flood, which kind of the flash flood, which resulted out of this extreme event. So with that, I do thank you. The images which I have used, I mean, this is during that event, the real world images, we can see the thick uh, band of clouds, which kind of triggered these extreme events. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. Last one. Um, nice talk, Abhishek. Um, so, I as the atmospheric river goes over the Indo Gangetic plain, yep. it's picking up a lot of emissions mm -hmm. with hundreds of micrograms per cubic meter of aerosols. And I was mm -hmm. wondering if you intend to look at any effects of those aerosols on the meteorology. Um. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. I'll, I'll take a note of that. Actually, in this study, as of now, we had just used the WRF. So, of course, we'll uh, take the chem part and uh, for sure we'll integrate and really explore that because I think that would be very interesting to look 
the I think that that would lead to uh, the transport and uh, some new chemistry, if, uh, uh, which which what is actually happening over there. So thank you for the suggestion. I'll actually try to uh, investigate this through the dwarf chem as well aspect as well. Yeah. Well, and, and probably, as you know, and like, you know, I work with Rajesh too, right? And yeah, and we know yeah. that the aerosol concentrations affect the PBL height. And, okay. and so it could yeah. definitely affect the precipitation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no more questions. So we move on to the Next talk, which will be given by Dr. Daniello Huda de Souza at the University of Sao Paulo. And the title is Evaluation of MPAS A Microphysics and Convection Schemes for Hurricane Katrina, uh, Brazil 2004 Simulations. The floor is yours. So, greetings, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to present you the work we've been developing on University of Sao Paulo. This is part of my thesis project and is still in CPN phase. So any feedback is very welcome. So first of all, the Hurricane Catarina was the first ever recorded hurricane in the Southern Atlantic. Uh, usually the Southern Atlantic doesn't have hurricanes or tropical cyclones because of its high wind shear and relatively cool sea surface temperatures. But uh, during the time that the Catarina happened, there was an unprecedented blocking event happening in Southern Atlantic that's favored its development. And RC interactions because of some warm CST rings on the Southern Atlantic it triggers convection and help the Catarina to intensificate. So doing, due to its unique configuration, the Catarina represents a challenge for numerical weather prediction. And up to this day, it remains a challenge and, and there is no, there's no study that actually accurately represented for today. So the objective of this work is test which combinations of microphysics and convection schemes are the best options for simulating the Catarina using the mps -A model. And we also want to investigate the effect of the microphysics and convection schemes on the Lorentz energy cycle of the, the simulations. So for a quick reminder, the Lorentz energy cycle uh, segregates the energy in the atmosphere into kinetic and edge energy and also on its zonal and eddy components. So for the model configuration, we created the numerical mesh using an algorithm from the MPAS BR repository, which uses the JIGSAL program for creating a global variable resolution mesh on the atmosphere. And this mesh had 250 kilometers on global scale and increases to eight kilometers on the regional, the regional scale, which is close to the Southern Brazil, the oceanic region close to Southern Brazil. The integration started at 21st of March and ended at 23rd of March. So it's 48 hour simulation. And this period represents when the system has its most intense uh, conversions. Um, during that time, the barotropic conversions leading to the system intensification was the most preeminent. And here on this figure, we can see the Catarina full track and the red, the red line represents the period we're trying to simulate. So the physics uh, schemes that we tested was the combination from all microphysics and convection schemes. We tested all the possible combination of them. And going to the results, the first thing we did was comparing the tracks of the simulated system with the observation tra uh, observed tracks. Here for observation, we use the satellite estimates by COMEC target, this dark line here on the figure, and the, color li the colorful lines are the simulation uh, tracks. So we, we can see here that most of the tracks had a similar pattern and they are very realistic but we can see that the overall the system is northward than what we would expect it. And going from the central minimal pressure, here on the figure, we can see the average minimum pressure for all experiments and the ETA-5 as well. 
And you can see that for most of the experiments, the central minimal pressure was lower than data five, but it's still higher than the, the estimated by the by satellite. So the model minimum pressure we, we observed on the experiments were 995 hectopascals, while the satellite estimates went to 975 hectopascals. And we can see that when the microphysics schemes were turned off, we, we is when we have the highest central pressure. And going for the comparison of the precipitation, first of all, here we have the image results for the total accumulated precipitation during the event. And you have two prominent features here. The first one is the precipitation associated with a cold front that was happening before the, the Catarina. And, the, and below it, we can see the precipitation bands from the Catarina itself. And on the right, you can see the accumulates for all experiments. And you can see here that for the, when the microphysics schemes were off, we didn't have much precipitation. But overall, all experiments present homogeneous results. We, there is not much difference between them, except from some, some minor differences. And looking for the precipitation bias, we can see more patterns. And we can see like that overall, the experiments tend to put the precipitation upward from what, what was observed. And they, they did not capture the whole precipitation for the event. So the, the observation captured 700 millimeters of precipitation from some grid points, while the model maximum precipitation were 400 millimeters. But though this maximum precipitation was very localized, it represented just a few grid points. And overall, the mean bias was around 200 millimeters. Uh, and for the experiments, the precipitation was less organized than the observations. It, more, it, it is more spread across the domain. And now looking for the energetics, here we're comparing the exper experiments with the era five energetics, and we are using the root of mean squared error for this analysis. And the, the term is which presented the highest uh, RMCA was the kinetic zonal energy term, the residual of the kinetic zonal energy, the budget of kinetic zonal energy, and the, the transport across boundary, and as well the eric kinetic energy. And this ind indicates us that the model might have systematic errors on represented zonal jets because all of the experiments present higher RMCMs for those terms, and possibly the subpolar jet is not being well represented, which needs to be further explored in the following experiments. And the errors on the kinetic energy um, are related to the model not being able to represent the full in system intensity, which can be seen in the central pressure because the model was not able to represent the, the minimum central pressure. And the residual is accounting for super greedy errors. So maybe increasing the model resolution can reduce this error. So as most of the results was, were homogeneous and we could not distinguish between the best op option, we decided to construct a square table. So here we are analyzing the normalized RMCA for all the the parameters we analyze. So here we can see the distance from the from the, the observed track, the system minimal pressure, wind speed, precipitation, um, and the main Lorentz energy term is responsible for the system intensification. And using this square table, we were able to identify that Thompson with NTDIC, Thompson with TDIC, and WSM6 with NTDIC presented the best re results for these short-term simulations. But as we want to decide which is the best option for the simulations, we proceed with a, a further experiment. So this experiment represents extended forecasts. So we have 96 hours in total of forecasts for the Catarina. And those uh, and for those experiments, we select the three uh, parameterizations, the combination of parameterizations that performed best in the previous experiment. Uh, so going for the tracks, here we can see the comparison between the simulated 
and the track estimated by satellite and by era five. And now we can see that the, the tracks start to diverge from the observations because the system starts to move eastwards while the observation, the observed system moves westwards. And for the bias precipitation, we can see that the bias increase from the Lex experiment. So the model is not capturing, not representing the full precipitation related to the Catarina. And the precipitation bias follows the, the pattern we can see in the tracks. So as the tracks are going eastwards, you can see that most of the, the precipitation by the model is as well as going eastwards following the track. And for the Lorentz energetics, we can see that the, the highest uh, MCA are found for the zonal kinetic energy, eddy kinetic energy mainly, and as well for the boundary and budget, budget stands. So the system, as we identified before, it's, the simulations are not representing the, the, the zonal jets, both intensity and position, and the system intensity as well. And this needs to be further explored in future experiments to see what we can do for improving that. So the final result here, uh, we have the same square table as before, but now for just the three experiments. And the Thompson and TD presented the best results overall. And so we select it as the best parameterization, uh, configuration of parameterizations for future X studies. And the next steps comprehend first extending the experiments for boundary layer schemes. So we want to see if the if changing boundary layer has uh, deep impacts on the, the results. And we want to simulate another phase of the Katarina as well to see if the, the results persist. If you for incipient stage or decaying stage of the Katarina, the Thompson TDIC is as well the best option we have. Uh, we need to investigate the, surf, the source of the observed bias. We need to see if the zonal jets are not being well represented, if the precipitation, um, the vertical uh, velocities associated with the precipitation is not, are not being well represented. And as soon as we identify the source of the errors and try to identify, to correct them, we want to perform the simulations for the whole Catarina and see if we can accurately represent it, its complete life stage. And in the long term, we want to use the earthworks for copeless simulations of the ocean. So the concluding remarks is that the Fort range forecast, despite the experiments where the microphysics were turned off, all options presented similar results. And even though the experiments present realistic tracks, the results from their genetic analysis indicates that the model has some bias on representing the zonal jets. The three best options for, were selected and we perform extended simulations with 10. And on the, those extended simulations, the Thompson and TDK combination present the best results. But still the tracks from the experiments diverge much from the observations and this needs to be further explored. So those are the references I use on this work here. And thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Jamie. Um, could you remind me what resolution uh, grid size you had for these simulations? We have 250 global and eight kilometers on local resolution and near the southern coast of Brazil. Okay, and another experiment, I'm not sure you did one, is to turn the cumulus off and just keep the microphysics on. Have you tried that? Yeah, we, we did that. Yeah, um, I can show you here. Okay, sorry, I missed it. Yeah, we have some experiments where the, um, let's see. For example, uh, we have all, uh, the cumulus off and TDK on as well. You had Thompson and cumulus off, I see there. Yeah, there. yeah we tested all, uh, all the possible combinations. Hi, um, so you were saying that in the um, refinement region, you had eight kilometer cell spacing. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about that 
with eight kilometers, you cannot capture the full intensity. So your pressure will probably always be a little bit higher than the satellite estimates. Um, I, I think that's just a limitation of having eight kilometers. Um, you will probably have to go down to three, four kilometers to capture the full uh, inner core dynamics to get the pressure to where it was observed, uh, just a comment. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you for that suggestion. I have a um, question, comment. Uh, did you use ERA-5 as initial and, and SST forcing? Yes, ERA-5 was used in the initial forcing as well, and as well for the ocean. Okay, I thank you for your talk and move on to the final talk of the session, which is by Dr. Uh, Sakaguchi at the PNNL. And uh, the title yes. of the talk is Exploring MPAS Physics Suites to Simulate Tropical Convective Systems Consistently Across Scales. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my presentation slide? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Let me start my winter as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Koichi. I work at the piano now. Uh, this is my first time to present at this workshop, so I really, really wanted to be there physically. Uh, particularly, uh, I learned after that there's a beer in the reception on the first day. I didn't know that, so I wish such information would be on the agenda uh, before the deadline. <laughs> but uh, uh, let me do my best in this virtual presentation. Uh, so this is the uh, really ongoing work that's about to be done still. And this is a collaboration between the LACSIM, uh, Science Focus Area Project at PNL, and the DNA Climate Project in Japan. And uh, we are mainly trying to use MPAS atmosphere for the climate uh, time scale study, particularly how the uh, tropical organized convection and its interactions between dynamics and radiations uh, contribute to change in the extreme event in the future. And probably I can skip those background information because yesterday's presentations really covers the characteristics and the importance of this uh, tropical organized conviction. But just wanna uh, re-emphasize that uh, really we need a model that realistically capture all the interactions between different scales and different processes for reliable climate projection or prediction. And that's what we are aiming for here. And this is just one verification done by ourselves that the MCS being a building block for the larger scale equatorial waves and MJO. So the left is the, uh, just the space time uh, power spectra for the symmetric wave component using the just OLR on just uh, observations through, actually I'm using observations through the fixed tracker and the tracking system. And this is 11 year mean. And that's in the right is the same spectra, but I masked all the time and grid point location that is there's no MCS. This is only using oil out coming from observation uh, identified as MCS. And then you can see MCS does reproduce most of the features in this total uh, wave uh, time spectra and then captures all uh, Kelvin natural gravity waves with an MJO. So that really indicates MCS is indeed a really key player in tropical hydrological cycle. And then the model has to do good at simulating MCS. And uh, you know, this MCS is really can be captured really well by going down to conviction permitting resolution. However, uh, even at the conviction permitting resolutions, oh, let me switch off this view. Uh, oops. Okay, excuse me. Okay. There are actually more that does not really agree well with each other. So this is a subset of the conviction permitting global simulations uh, in Diamond Winter. I'm just showing two examples of simulated biases of the number of MCS. 
So some model like I completely underestimate the number of MCS, and the other model tend to be quite actually overestimate MCS. And looking at those different regions in this, this bar graph for different model, same bias in the number of the MCS, we can see the large range of MCS biases across those similar resolution models. And of course, uh, those organized convection uh, really depends on how the convection is represented in the model. That's nicely uh, documented by those huge and various various series of papers. I really love these papers. And uh, also at convection permitting resolution, now the, we can see other sensitivities to the microphysics and surface carbon exchanges. Those other sensitivities are actually used by Sermat et al. to tune the NECA model, that's one of those global commission permitting models from Japan. They tune that NECA model to reproduce uh, how overall as the anomalies associated with MGAO propagates better compared to observation. So this is before tuning and this is after tuning. And this tuning was used for those diamond winter simulation. So again, uh, going to the next slide, our goal is to, for this uh, phase of the study, to find a good impasse configurations to capture good con conviction. So this is the mesh we are using. The target is eventually goes down to four kilometer, but for this experiment, we are using nine. It's really to capture not just tropical, but subtropical region in the refinement region. And in this presentation, I'm gonna focus on four experiments. That's control out of box conviction permitting suite. And then uh, same conviction permitting suite, but switching the conviction scheme to the new TLG scheme, but this is not scale aware out of box. And then one simulation, we turned off parameterized conviction. And another one, this is our first attempt to port the MGL tuning from the NECA model to, to MPATH. And then, uh, yeah, let's just go to the next one. So this is to verify uh, how tropical organized conviction look like in this our experiment period. I forgot to mention that we are running only about four weeks for parameter sensitivity experiments and an extended period of four months for some selected configuration. And in that period, this uh, tropical uh, regions has really active MJO because we chose MJO period and active equatorial Rossby waves, some Kelvin and natural gravity waves, but not too strong. And then for MCS spectra only, they are really mainly contributing MJO and Rossby wave. Looking at the total oil spectra from MPAS control simulation, we can see a really, really strong uh, Kelvin wave and natural gravity wave that's actually only documented by previous uh, studies, really impact like those waves. And we see do uh, some MJOs and then those be waves a little bit displaced uh, peak, but still we see that, good. And actually looking at this, how well anomaly propagates with time, so like December 1st to December 24th going down, this is observation and then three simulations control and no conviction, uh, no, no parameterization, and then utility. Uh, just from you know, visually, the new TLK actually looks the best. It does capture the initiation over the Indian Ocean of this big anomaly, and then propagating to the maritime continent. And uh, after this period, the engine actually propagates further, but this is where we propose simulations. And uh, also we are looking at not just OLR, looking at this coupling to the large scale zonal wind that is captured by uh, this real time multivariate index. So we're comparing this control simulation this blue line to our target observation, which is actually gray line because we had to simplify data pre-processing for the shorter time period. And this is actually the, uh, the default pre-processing pre data. This Short and simple, that changes quite a bit to this, this gray line, but this gray line would be the target right now. Both MT and the no QS parameterization moves both curves closer to the observation. 
But the propagation speed tends to be overestimated to compare to observations. So they just go too, too fast. That's sort of MJO quick view. How about MCF, the smallest scale we are interested in? Well, compared to this observation, this all time mean uh, for that four weeks period, controls doing the job, the underestimated uh, MCS precipitation, no chemist quantization, for good, maybe a little bit of improvement, but not always statistically significant, I don't know. But now new cheese like, does not really produce any MCS as identified by our tracking program for sex tracker. Really only near the land mass, that's where we see MCS. So that kind of puzzled us why. Why the new cheese scheme does, you know, all, all anomalies propagate to the east, but there's no MCS, that really does not agree with our physical uh, expectation. And so we are not really looking into the detail of those both isolated versus organized or MCS conviction in these simulations. The fixed tracker algorithm by Fenadel 2021, uh, MCS criteria, you know, main three criteria is that the does part really cold cloud top, identified as cold cloud core, has to be this cold in terms of by this temperature. And then the surrounding area we found as such, that has to have certain area. And they have to keep this area for certain times. That this is where I really have not, have not evaluated yet. And also uh, under those cloud cold sheet, we have to have certain threshold for the precipitation rate. For the area of the cold cloud systems, I don't see any differences between new children and other simulations. For example, this is the uh, probability distribution of the whole uh, cold cloud shield outside. There's not really difference amongst the simulations. In the core, new TDK schemes tend to overestimate for the larger system, very cold, uh, large systems, but similar arc of control. And so that should help actually have more MCF in identified in fixed structure. And then for cloud top height by sort of analog to this is that just by this temperature, I don't see too much differences among simulations either. For the precipitation amount, this is total precipitation both from microphysics and the conviction quantization, then uh, we see much less precipitation amount or this is the sort of histogram for precipitation amount in each beam. The red is the new TDK. And then among those, the parameterized convictions are play really minor role. And that's not much different between scale area GF and MT in our resolution. So it's really, it's coming down to this resolve scale precipitation. Then from those results, uh, we see first, those large cloud systems in this utility is not really consistent with observed uh, in this case with structure. And then because of the small contributions of quantized rain and those frequencies, looks like maybe new TDK may remove instability at the result scale more efficiently than GF for given amount of precipitation. And then leave rain with less convective instability to deal with for the result scale dynamics and microphysics. But this is just hypothesis. We are doing more analysis to verify that. Three and minutes. Might, okay, thank you. I might just skip this. This is just to reaffirm that point I made in previous slide. This is a more diagram for the total precipitation and the precipitation from non organized, non MCS deep conviction system. This one has much smaller magnitude. But as you can compare these two for the new Chiliki, really, those small precipitation system is the one propagating. Uh, the particular is to add as in jail with a really high cloud top and large cloud top area. And then again, we are doing more analysis to better uh, different aspects of this generation. Lastly, quickly, uh, we did the first attempt to port uh, MGO tuning because the, uh, didn't like new chili at this time. And then we are probably going with this control uh, Conviction permitting suite 
And then the hope is to improve the MJO aspect of this three. So we just put it to tuning. Tuning in just focusing microphysics and those part, uh, you know, target processes, it's outcome. I cannot go into detail for the time, but it does improve, for example, by moving this RNA phase curve closer to the observation, green and your tuning, and then also throwing down a little bit the, the propagation speed. But we did sort of overdid it uh, for this tuning. So at the beginning of the simulation, we had gigantic cloud shield covering almost all the tropical atmosphere. That's the biggest MCS I ever seen. And so we need to do some work, but the good news is that MCS precipitation is remains similar or even a little more increased. So it does not negatively affect smaller scale MCS, but maybe positively affecting larger scale MJO. So here's a summary, uh, but probably I'm going to stop here and then uh, I'll try to answer any question if they are. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Jimmy. So it was interesting that the new Tiki produced a good MJO, even though, and it was a long forecast for it, right? Because it, it, it started in the Indian Ocean maybe a week into the forecast. So in that sense, it was a good simulation. So it's, it's kind yes. of strange. It's not, it's not able to do the MCSs. Uh, That's right, just, yeah. Just redefining the MCS somehow. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a long way, yeah. This MCS tracking has been going through really many sort of hyper parameter, hyper parameters tuning, going through observations globally and the United States. I think we feel like it's indeed, but still, the hyper parameter space is converging, but more is really inconsistencies with precipitation intensity and uh, the cloud top height and then size. So it's a really big, convective, cold cloud top, really large cloud, making much less precipitation. So that might be something tuning we could do in the closure uh, aspect of the scheme so that maybe we produce more, maybe increase precipitation efficiency so that for a given closure, mass flux maybe produce more precipitation that is more consistent with observed cloud structure. That's some, some one idea we are having. Thanks for the comment. Hi, this is Falco Jude from NCAR. Um, hi. I know, hi. Um, I know, so you're running the TKIS game without scale aware, right? Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering with nine, kilometer, nine kilometers, I wonder if it makes sense to actually switch to the scale aware TITKA scheme. Because I've, mm -hmm. I've noticed too that the TITKA is just very efficient at removing the cape. So it oh. just, there, there's not much cape left for MCSs to actually live. And so if you're using the scale awareness that kind of throttles down the effect of, of Tika just eating up the, the cape. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure, so I've run a seven and a half kilometer run. And with that, uh, most of the precipitation comes from the microphysics. So Tika is actually... Mm. Um, not active very much, maybe 25%. And so nine kilometers is kind of around seven and a half. So I'm wondering if you get a pretty good result if you run the scale aware Titka because you're kind of keeping the good parts of the scheme, but uh, you're you're also keeping the, um, well, you're also creating like real nice MCSs, I believe, with the mm, scale scheme, yeah. So I, and I think it's- yeah, I think in MPAS version 8.0, you actually have access to this to this TITCA scheme. So I, I would suggest if you can to try that out. Mm -hmm. I, I would mm -hmm. hope it gives you a much better simulation. Thank you very much. Yeah, I definitely yeah, try. Interesting work though. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's really nice that we can have scale away in the version eight. So I'll definitely uh, give it a try. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Kelly Nunes from NCAR. I'm just uh, wondering if you've looked at how sensitive would the results be if you changed the cloud top temperature. I'm thinking about 
how mm -hmm. across the different schemes you have different microphysics. So that relates to the ice particles that then mm -hmm. relates back to the cloud top temperature. So if you change, have you tried that? And see how yeah, I did. I did one experiment swapping the microphysics scheme in the commission permitting suite. It does change uh, the, so if I look at the mean particle profile, it does change uh, quite a few different things. I don't remember, cut of, but the temperature. And uh, I will actually look at more in detail, but the uh, largest difference in our sense for the MCS, particularly it comes from switching this convection scheme. So we just focused on that, but uh, that's a good point. Yeah, I'll probably go back to this one simulation of in microphysics and uh, include that in the deeper analysis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So that concludes this morning session. Give a big hand to the presenters. And we'll reconvene in 10.45. Thank you. OK, if we could get started with our session on surface and urban studies. Our first presenter is Robert Fogel from the University of Albany. He'll be talking about wind and humidity forecast during downslope windstorm events. All right, thank you very much. So I want to start off by mentioning the 2007 witch fire in San Diego. That was sparked and spread during an intense Santa Ana wind event. It grew to become the fourth largest fire by area burned in modern California history since 1932. I mention it because it directly inspired the first large scale public utility mesonet in the state of California. And in the 16 years since the, the witch fire, it has dropped from fourth place to 19th. So this is a map of all of the surface stations that have been deployed since the witch fire was extinguished. There are about 3000 stations on this map deployed by the three largest electric utilities in the state, Pacific Gas and Electric, PGE, Southern California Edison, SCE, and San Diego Gas and Electric, SDG&E. These point forecasts and observations are being used for public safety power shutoff decisions, that's PSPS, that's when someone determines who loses their power, when and for how long. I am so glad I don't live in Southern California anymore. The forecasts involve winds, temperatures, and humidities, and the question I'm asking is how good are these forecasts? So I am going to assess the ARW-based high-resolution rapid refresh, her version four, during periods of significant fire threat in California. All of the utilities use their own wharf-based forecasting systems, but their forecasts are proprietary, so that's why I'm looking at the HER. To establish a baseline, I'm not just looking at downslope windstorm conditions, but I'm selecting a month-long period, October 2021, that had challenging fire weather conditions in both Northern and Southern California. And I'm looking at the entire month, zero and 12 UTC cycles, extending to 48 hours for October 1st through 29th. The surface stations that I'm going to look at, uh, the observations come from ASOS, which is primarily at airports, Raw stations, which are primarily on mountain slopes, and public utility mesonets, which, as you may have guessed from that picture I showed on the previous slide, are concentrated in the urban wildland interface. The HER forecasts come from AWS. The ASOS data come from NCEI because METAR winds are bad, and non ASOS observations from METIS and verification was done with NET. So let's start with sustained wind speed, looking at network averages. This scatter plot, the horizontal axis is forecast wind speed in meters per second. The vertical axis is observation. Each dot is a forecast time. There are about 3,000 forecast hours for all, all times uh, in the month. Each forecast hour is an average of approximately 800 stations scattered across the CONUS, spread over four time zones. You can see that the relationship between the forecast and the observation is excellent. The R square is very high, the scatter is very small. So basically when the forecast for the average conditions across the CONUS are saying it's gonna be windy or not, the observations are basically backing that up. 
This is a plot of the same 3,000 forecast hours, but now distributed according to time and UTC and the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is forecast wind bias. Bias is forecast minus observation. You can see there's a little bit of a positive bias at night, but really nothing to be too concerned about. I like to see no correlation between the forecast wind speed and the bias, and you indeed do see that here when the forecast is for slower or faster average across the conus, there is no relationship with the bias, and the same is true in the observations. So this is truly an excellent forecast, and these are a very, very good start. So now the next slide, I'm going to shift to forecast for roughly 2,000 raw stations across the United States. We can see that the same model that is forecasting very accurately in the mean across the conus for ASOS stations are actually over forecasting raw stations by almost 40%. Let me go back and forth between these two a little bit. Oops. Well, what am I doing? Okay. Okay, so here's ASOS, here's RAWS, ASOS, and RAWS. As a consequence of what you see in that first panel, the forecast wind speed is correlated with bias, and so is the observation. When the forecast and the observed wind speeds are relatively higher, the bias is even more positive. But there are differences between RAWS and ASOS stations. The first one is the mounting height of RAWS stations is closer to the ground, 6.1 meters above local ground level instead of 10 meters. So we shouldn't be comparing a 10 meter wind forecast so as to a 6.1 meter wind. But that's not going to make a difference of almost 40%. Okay. There's also characteristic siding and exposure differences. Raw stations tend to be on mountain slopes in rugged terrain, much more likely to be uh, poorly exposed as a consequence of buildings and trees. And there are instrumentation differences. Raws are usually propellers or cups. ASOS use sonic anemometers that could be relevant. Propellers have a lot more calm wind forecast uh, winds that observations than sonics do. There are averaging interval differences, et cetera. Now I'm gonna show you the utilities. Utilities tend to follow the RAWS roadmap. So it may not surprise you to see that these sequence of scatter plots, this is scatter, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric look a lot like the RAWS do. Okay, so let me kind of summarize this part. The same model that predicts very well at ASOS stations over predicts at other sites by up to 50%. This tells me that I can't use her forecast for RAWS and utility stations without further processing. We can't blend ASOS with non-ASOS wind observations because they are not fungible. And it also tells me don't configure the model against non-ASOS stations, not because they're perfect, because they certainly aren't, but if I try to tune my model so that I am predicting accurately minimizing the error and bias at RAWS and utility stations, I'm going to over predict everywhere else by quite a bit. The most important characteristics, I believe, are mounting height and site exposure. ASOS, primarily airports, 80% of them are at 10 meters above ground level, but only 80%. Raws, primarily mountain slopes, often obstructed 6.1 meters mounting height. Utilities, many sited in foothills and or urban areas with obstructions, and their anemometer mounting heights can vary quite a bit. So exposure is site specific, but I think that the scatter plots I showed you motivate that the first step is to apply network adjustments. So you saw the top panel before that was RAWs were over predicting by almost 40%. And what I've done for the bottom plot is I have taken an empirical network adjustment coefficient that I determined from the least squares line, multiply it by every forecast and that's the bottom row. And so now you see that there's good correspondence between the adjusted forecast and the observations and there's no correlation between forecast or observation and bias. I can do that for PG&E. I can do that for SCE. I can do that for San Diego Gas and Electric. The adjustment coefficient is a little different. It's in this table here. These numbers are not written in stone, handed down from Mount Sinai, but basically they're uh, the adjustments that I need to basically do this. So again, the same model that is very skillful for ASOS over predicts other stations by large amounts because other stations are more profoundly infected by 
Local factors, trees, buildings, they have rougher surfaces, steeper terrain, lower mounting heights, but in aggregate, we can empirically adjust these out, taking advantage of the law of large numbers, and this adjustment is compensating for mean variations in measurement and sighting. Okay, so now let's move on to the station analysis. We care about this because station point forecasts are being used for these power shutoff decisions. So, uh, and if there's any network adjustments needed, I have already done that. So now you're seeing another scatter plot. This is ASOS forecast versus observation. But now each dot is a station. There's about 800 of them. And for each station, it's an average over close to 3,000 forecasts. And we can see there's more scatter now, but there is still an excellent correspondence in the mean between forecasts and observation. There are some outliers, and those outliers are a reminder that not all ASTOS stations are at airports. That one near the top of the diagram, that's Guadalupe Pass in West Texas, that is on a cliff. I wouldn't want to land an airplane there. And one of the dots near the bottom is New York City Central Park. If today a plane lands there, tomorrow it's global headline news. So here is a plot of forecast versus bias. Again, these each dot is a station, and I don't see a problem there. And observation versus bias, oh, there is a problem. We are systematically over predicting where the observed winds are relatively slower and under predicting where the winds are relatively uh, higher. So again, this bias is biased. So we've seen this before. There's a bunch of uh, papers that uh, we have been discussing this. It, varies from uh, network to network, but this is basically what we got for ASOS. So now I'm gonna move on to PG&E. I want to remind you that the network average bias is zero, but there is a big problem in this scatter plot. There is a large range in observations there between close to calm and almost eight meters per second, but the forecasts vary over a very small range. You may remember from the plot I showed you earlier that PG&E stations are, have very, very high station density. Maybe the problem here is too many stations are getting the same forecast. I'll come back and visit that. The middle panel, forecast versus bias, doesn't look very pretty, but maybe it's not a big problem. But look at that plot at the right. There is a very, very, very strong relationship between observation and bias. That's a consequence of what you're seeing in the left panel. This is a really serious problem. We are seriously over under predicting the winds at high wind stations. Okay, so now let's look at RAWs. 2,100 stations spread across the CONUS. This is not a station density problem. These scatter plots look pretty similar to what you saw on the previous slide. There's a very strong negative correlation between observation and bias at the right-hand side. And that's also true at SCE, et cetera. So network adjustments, I made network adjustments to compensate for network-specific characteristics, mounting height, typical exposure, et cetera. Within a network, site adjustments are necessary to compensate for site-specific characteristics, primarily local terrain and exposure. We have been trying to use gust information to try to rationalize making these site adjustments, and there's some papers here uh, on that. That's an interesting topic. I can certainly fill the rest of the talk with that, but I want to move on to temperature and moisture forecasts. So the executive summary here is temperature forecasts are pretty good, even at RAWs and utility stations, which is a little surprising given how much abuse they get. Dew point forecast, pretty good at ASOS, problems at RAWs and utility stations. And what this is revealing to me are minor issues with the model and major inherent deficiencies in using dew point for some of these things. So we're looking here at a network analysis for dew point for ASOS. Each dot is a forecast hour averaged over about 800 stations. There's not a lot of range in the average dew point across the CONUS, but you're really seeing nothing wrong in any of these panels. This is for Pacific Gas and Electric. There is a big problem here. The lower the observed dew point, the forecast dew points are even lower still so that the forecasts are way, way too dry. So there's a big problem here. And it's not just PG&E, it's all the other utilities and at raw stations as well. 
So regarding the dew point issue, I will stipulate the differences in landscape setting, elevation, instrumentation, mounting, height, climate, and weather like downslope windstorms are likely relevant here. But I wanna take a step back and remind you what is actually being measured and predicted. ASOS stations measure temperature and dew point directly and then relative humidity is derived from that. Raws and utility stations measure temperature and relative humidity and then dew point is derived from that. The WARF model is even different. It is predicting temperature, pressure, and mixing ratio. So both relative humidity and dew point are being derived. So the issue is going to be, as you'll see, that the dew point becomes suspect when the air is very dry, okay? So this is a scatter plot for ASOS stations of a whole bunch of forecasts and observation pairs, again, for the entire month of October, 2021. There are 2 million points on this diagram. The horizontal axis is forecast dew point. Vertical axis is observed dew point. We want to see these points clustering along the one-to-one -one line and to a very large degree they do. So again, these are really excellent forecasts, not only averaged across the network, but now even on a grid point by grid point basis. And, but if you squint hard, you can see there's a little bit of a positive bias. That is the forecasts are too dry when the dew points are low, but you don't have to squint for this diagram. This is Raws and Utility, a combination of 5,000 stations, 8.1 million points. And clearly when the dew point, observed dew point is getting low, the forecast dew point is getting lower still. So we have a serious under prediction of the dew point when the dew points are low. I'm gonna show you on the next slide, the same data but I'm gonna back off and show you a larger range, okay? Look at those dots on the left side of the diagram now. There are forecast dew points as low as minus 120 degrees Fahrenheit. That's drier than my sense of humor, okay? And for some time, I thought that that was uh, a numerical problem, okay? But I've been able to reproduce it and convince myself it is not a numerical problem. It's a problem inherent in the dew point. So this plot is dew point temperature on the horizontal axis versus mixing ratio on the vertical axis. So for a given station pressure, okay, when the relative humidity, when the absolute humidity is very low, like below a half a gram per kilogram, as can occur in downslope windstorms, small and irrelevant differences in the absolute humidity can provoke huge shifts in the dew point that are just absolutely who cares. Okay, so in downslope windstorms, very low uh, absolute humidities can produce very, very, very low dew point temperatures. So the alternative to this is many people don't use dew point and dew point depression anymore. They use vapor pressure deficit. I am now a convert to the vapor pressure deficit religion. Okay, and I'm going to evangelize it for you here. Okay, so now this is dew point on the horizontal axis versus vapor pressure deficit on the vertical axis. So now when the absolute humidity is very low, the vapor pressure deficit doesn't get any bigger because instead of being bounded below by absolute zero, it's bounded up from above by saturation vapor pressure. Okay, so it's, uh, and also a, another benefit is that VPD is most directly related to what the model is predicting. Okay, so I have to end here, but I just want to show you very quickly, VPD is very good, okay, for both ASOS and for utility stations. It cures problems with respect to dew point bias as a function of relative humidity and also uh, dew point. The model probably still has a dry bias at low dew point, but this renders it moot. And there is my summary, and I will stop. Thank you. I think we may maybe should move on. Hopefully, you know, if anybody has any questions, they can talk to you afterwards. Okay, so our next talk is uh, simulating New York City's urban environment using wharf urban physics by Roger Turnow. He's uh, from NC State and EPA. Okay, good morning. I'm a PhD candidate at NC State, and for the past year, I've been working over at the EPA in Research Triangle Park as part of an ORISE fellowship. And I've been working on this project, trying to figure out 
sort of how well it does worth worth simulate urban environments and can and you know which configuration works best so a lot of my model is based on some previous work which you can find in torres vasquez et al 2022 on uh, working on the listos project and i added another domain it's very high resolution so the little black box you can see in the middle there just over the new york city metro area at 444 meter resolution with urban uh, physics turned on i've also increased the vertical resolution especially near the surface so there's 25 layers at or under 500 meters and right by the surface the, these layers have a thickness of about eight meters and then these simulations are run from May 1st, 2018 through August 31st, 2018. So one thing that was changed in this project, uh, again, over the basic input that Wharf gives you when you turn on urban is improved building parameters. So when you turn on urban in some cities, you get this here, which is some, which is data from NewDapt for various building parameters. But as you can see, it's completely lacking Staten Island, most of Brooklyn and Queens, and some of the Bronx, and the highest building heights are 50 meters. Uh, using a data set called Pluto and mapping that to the high resolution grid, um, we got this. And you can see in the reds, there's some places where the average building height is over 100 meters, and you have those missing parts of New York City added in as well. There are some challenges to this project and some limitations. Uh, the first one is, is actually a little bit helpful since it limits the number of simulations necessary to test these things out, but there's only a couple of land surface models that can be used and there's only a couple of boundary layer models that can be, boundary layer schemes that can be used here. And one other, one problem that we ran into is that there's limited workable land use categories. NLCD, which is commonly used by my group at EPA, uh, does not work with no MP, and it although there's nothing on paper that should be wrong with it working with the uh, the third urban scheme, which is BPBM, it doesn't, so it can't be used for that either. And then there's local climate zones, which increased, which we we heard a little bit about on Tuesday, and increased the number of urban categories, and should help increase um, how well cities are represented. At least the way I implemented them in for version 4.4 and 4.4.2, it did not work with no MP, which is unfortunate. And then because this is very high resolution, it's in that gray zone, and that causes issues with the PBL schemes, especially MYJ, which is unusable. There were also a number of simulations that were attempted that did not manage to complete. Um, a lot of them died pretty early on. So while I would have liked to have simulations where only one thing was changed, where I only changed one setting to better figure out what that changing that one setting affected, uh, I generally had to have two or three settings changed because some of those simulations didn't go. So briefly with the local climate zones, again, we, we talked about this before, but here is the map I've been using for New York City. And ideally, using a local climate zone will improve some of those surface variables, especially moisture, since instead of, say, MODIS, where, which I think is the same as um, like compact low rise, where it's, I think, 95% urban and 5% vegetation. So I mentioned that there's some problems with the PBL schemes. Here is um, in the afternoon on, the, on May 1st, there's a sea breeze front coming into New York City. And you can see that as sort of this shape down here in, get this over, oh, down here. So you can see the sea breeze front progressing. This is vertical velocity. Uh, MYJ in the middle is a complete mess. It's unusable. There's, there's something, it's, it's having issues with the gray zone. You do also see some um, vertical uh, oscillations occurring behind the sea breeze front in Bullock on the left and YSU on the right. And although they're a little stronger in Bullock, and that's still problematic. And some of these are coming from the boundaries and some of them are because it's in the gray zone, but it doesn't make these, these um, PBL schemes unusable. 
one really big problem I did run into, uh, I originally wanted to compare BEP, which is the second urban scheme versus BEP BEM, and found a really strong cold bias in BEP. And this is across a bunch of different simulations with different settings. And it all looked kind of like this on, on the left where it starts off okay and then it gets progressively colder at night, but it's still pretty close to fine during the daytime. I'm not sure exactly where this is coming from. It seems to be worst in areas with, with tall buildings. So maybe there's too much radiation coming off of the building walls. Um, but you can see there's a, in that diurnal statistics plot, it gets very cold at night and only really at night. And that's not an issue that's showing up with the same configuration using BEM. So at least for New York City with, with the current state of, it's almost certainly a bug and it's probably not something that can be used for longer simulations. So looking at the results of the simulations I did get complete, so here, the scatter plot, you can see there's, that is from, you know, all these different sim, you know, observations compared against model output. And there's three different groups of data that went into this. So there's seven METAR stations. There are 20 MetNet stations, which was the predecessor to the MicroNet, which was put in, I think, in 2020. And then there's 84 MesoNet stations. And these aren't just the, you know, New York's, State and New Jersey Mesonet, but I think it also includes a lot of personal weather stations, so it's of dubious calibration. And you can see that overall, it's done looking at all of these sites, it's done pretty well with no MP in its default configuration, uh, MODIS, and YSU as the PBL scheme. It's a little bit off with the mixing ratio, but if you look at just the sites that Probably that work better and you can pr be pretty sure are, have better calibration than METAR and MetNet, it's done pretty well. It's not good at all in the wind speed, however. Um, very, very low correlation, weak wind bias. Part of that might be that the sites tend to be in more open or elevated locations, like on rooftops on, at 20 to 25 meters up. But overall, this does pretty well. Uh, another thing to point out, the, the simulation starts June 1st uh, because I had originally started it on May 1st and realized halfway through the summer that I had made a mistake and wasn't actually putting in the high resolution building data and didn't have time to restart it all the way from May 1st. Looking at NOAA LSM with a local climate zone map and YSU, uh, it's, a whole, it's a quite a bit worse. There's a very strong warm bias at night, so it's got the heat island too strong, and but it has improved the mixing ratio, as you would hope by using the local climate zone map. And you can see in, with all sites, it's pretty bad. You've got a mean bias of 2.29, and you've got a root mean square error of almost four. And it, it, looking just at METAR, it looks fairly decent. But if you look at METNET, the temperature is still pretty bad. So, and the, again, the wind speed's quite bad. So it does well with the, with the uh, moisture, but not with the temperature. And this can be at least somewhat attributed to the higher resolution, taller buildings. Um, as I mentioned, there, there, there's, there was a simulation which went through July, which accidentally didn't have the buildings and comparing those, it's a little bit warmer at night with the buildings than without, but it's still, it, it's not the source, it just contributes a little bit. And then here's a simulation which is ongoing and it's only made it through July 7th. And this is looking at the Bulak PBL scheme and NOAA LSM with MODIS. I couldn't get this working with the LCZ scheme turned on. And this is sort of in between the other two. It's doing better with temperature than the NOAA LSM with YSU scheme, but it's doing a little bit worse on the mixing ratio. And if you look at MetNet, it's it's decent, but it's not particularly great. And again, all of these have poor uh, have poor wind speeds, you know, poor 10 meter wind speeds. So instead of looking at the surface to see how well they do with the winds, we'll look upwards using some LIDAR data from the Bronx. So you can see the Mesonet on July 1st up on the top, and you can see there's sort of a, a nocturnal jet. And then if you look at the bottom, you can see the simulations looking vertically from the same location. 
and they seem to do a fairly good job representing this structure. Um, no LCZ and no MP are more similar because they're both using YSU, but they look pretty good. Uh, Bulox maybe lift, lifts the, the core of the jet up a little bit and has a little bit less winds close to the ground. And if we look at a day where there's much higher winds, like the sixth, you can see some much larger differences. Uh, so, especially with Bulock, where you have the, the core of the winds is much, much higher than observed or modeled in the other ones, and it's sort of um, diffused and spread out a lot more. So it, it doesn't appear to have done a very good job recreating this vertical structure. NOAA MP and NOAA LCC look pretty similar, but there are some weird spots like this in the NOAA LCC. And NOAA MP is maybe a little bit better at recreating this vertical structure than the NOAA LCZ, but they're both better than Bulak in this case. So a brief summary, uh, Wharf BEP has a major building cold bias. I'm not entirely sure what its source is. It appears to be a bug and you, pr and you shouldn't run longer simulations with it until this bug has been resolved. Uh, Bulak seems to have has more vertical oscillations than YSU, but it's still usable. MYJ is not because those vertical oscillations go insane because of the gray zone issue. Uh, NOAA MP performs a lot better at temperature, at surface temperature, than the NOAA LSM plus LCZ, which has a very strong warm bias at night. Uh, but NOAA LSM plus LCZ is better at mixing ratio, as one would hope, given the um, given the more uh, ver the greater variety in land use type and vegetation within the city. And the Bulak, the ongoing Bulak uh, run is somewhere in the middle. All the simulations performed pretty poorly on surface winds, but did fairly well looking vertically. Uh, NOAA MP might be a little bit better, but the Bulak and NOAA LSM didn't work as well, especially in that high wind day. A little bit about some next steps in this work. Uh, John and Jerry are developing a simplified urban scheme using ACM2 and PXLSM. I think when in some of their testing they found it's it's not a large increase in, in speed. It's, I think they said it's some, in some of this initial development that it's only maybe a 3% increase over not using it at all, which is great. Um, one reason, to, you know, using BM over BEP was something like a 65% increase and BEP is already slower. Uh, they're using the same domain and setup and high resolution building variables that I've been using in this project. And they'll be comparing against my results here to see how well their in development model is working. I'd also like to test this uh, new data set we heard about on Tuesday, this combined you know, global LCZ map and MODIS land use data set using NOAA MP in WARF 4.5 to see if that makes improvement to the moisture variables which I, I hope it would, but I'd like to test that and see how well it does. And then I'd like to, and I plan to use the best performing setup in uh, future work for my PhD, where I'm planning to look at interactions between heat waves and heat islands in Atlanta and Phoenix. So I can sort of look at um, differences in dry and moist environments. And that is all, any questions? We have time for a couple of questions. Yes. I guess I would like some clarification on mm -hmm. your first point of your conclusions on the building cold bias. So are you saying that the urban model is radiating heat and it's somehow not getting translated to the temperature and morph? I could you clarify that? A um, bit? I'm, yeah, so this this plot, so if you look at you know short time periods, it seems to do okay with BEP, but if you go to long time periods, it's very, very cold at night. It's not really clear right. where this is coming from, especially since the both BEP and VEM ha should have the same building effect parameterization code in them. BM just adds in energy inside the buildings and so anthropogenic sources of heat. But as you can see that by this very large difference, there's some sort of bug going on oh. in BEP causing this accumulating cold. I'm not sure what it is. It might be 
there's too much radiation from building walls. Maybe there's cold accumulating, you know, in the ground and in the buildings. It's, I've tried looking for it. I haven't gotten very far. Okay, I guess a couple questions. If Morph is under predicting temperature, then shouldn't you want the radiation from the building? And does, and I don't know the urban model at all, does it, does it continue to radiate after the sun sets? Um, yeah, so again, I, 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 this is, I think this is a bug in the code causing this because oh. the, the effects on the en environment and on the wind should be the same in these two models. It's just BEM doesn't I, include any in internal building stuff. It just looks at external impacts on the wind. And so you, you do have radiation being absorbed by the walls and then readmitted. And, and, yeah. and you do, and you would have some of that going on at, at night. And I would expect, it's a bit weird that you're getting a cold bias rather than a warm bias. So you're, you're sort of getting um, the opposite of an, you're getting like an urban cold island at night rather than an urban heat <laughs> island, which you're not supposed to be getting because the, the buildings are supposed to, you know, treat that, tra tra trap that heat in the canyon and because they can hold more energy than urban areas so and then just one more curiosity question does does the urban model include air conditioning impacts on uh, BEM does yeah. so okay. BEM adds in the internal energy which includes air conditioning BEP doesn't include any of that at all thank you try to be quick please we're yeah. running a little late they, yeah, uh, yeah. Thankful, uh, we're thankful for these people doing this kind of uh, study with the urban models, and uh, I hope you can give feedback to the mm -hmm. land service group on these uh, biases because they definitely will be interested in in them. And also, I just wanted to know what application do you use this data for? Um, so, the the older project Listos was, I think, looking more at uh, tropospheric ozone, near surface ozone in, in this area, I'm more interested in looking at heat. And at the moment, just seeing how well it's how well it's performing. That way I can look at interaction between heat waves and heat islands and eventually get into look, maybe looking at those interactions and how they might change with climate. Our next speaker is going to talk about incoming land surface data quality and high resolution urban climate simulations and the improvement ideas and physics equations by Petter Lee. Good morning. I'm pleased to share some uh, findings from our urban climate simulation studies and uh, some ideas for uh, the model physics improvement. Our study area is the Hong Kong Shenzhen area. We put it inside the innermost domain, the domain four of the model. We decide to one year's urban climate simulation cases using the default and defined lens of face data to evaluate the impact of the lens of face data quality on the quality of simulation result. The lens of face data include four major uh, components, land cover, vegetation coverage, urban morphology, and the uh, anthropogenic heat. We conducted two cases by the Wolf lower lens of face model coupling with the uh, urban canopy model. Then we'll compare fine modeling near surface atmospheric variables, the uh, surface temperature, the air temperature, wind speed, precipitation, and the relative humid humidity of each case by the spatial uh, distribution. We also evaluate the variable with the uh, corresponding observation by the Perkins skill score and the PDF of the difference between the modeling and observation variables. At first, let's see the difference in the lens of face data between the two cases. The left figure is the four land cover and the right one is the refined land cover. See the default one, miss many details. 
the default one also miss the details in vegetation coverage. Let's see the uh, difference in January, the winter seasons in Hong Kong, Shenzhen area. Vegetation coverage in Jinai, the summer season. Let's compare the urban morphology data of two cases. This page shows the default and defined lumber mean building height. This, uh, this page sh uh, shows the building plan area fractions of, uh, of two cases. This page shows the default and defined air rated, air rated mean building height. Uh, this is the standard deviation of the air rated building height. The default and refined functor area index. The default and defined urban area fraction. Let's see the difference in the anthropogenic heat. This slide shows the default and refined and anthropogenic sensible heat. This slide shows the default and refined anthropogenic latent heat. To summary, the refined lens surface data has some more spatial details than the, uh, the, the default one. After compare the uh, urban lens surface data, let's move on to see the difference in the modeling results. The first comparison is the two meters temperature. The upper figure show the evaluation of the uh, default case, the bottom one, uh, so the uh, refined case. The refined case produces more spatial details than the default one. However, there are no significant difference in the Perkins skill score and the PDF of difference between the two cases. With the same manner, the refined one also produces more uh, spatial details, but never see the significant difference in Perkins skill score and the PDF of, the, of difference, whatever in surface temperature, relative humidity, precipitation, and 10 meter wind speed. To summary, the refined urban lens of face data produced more spatial detail. However, it didn't make impact on the model quality. From our point of view, the model would have something need to be improved. We check the source code of the urban canopy model. We'll find an error in the uh, formula for calculating the uh, grid street width. However, we don't think it is a major factor to cause the model sensitivity losing to the quality of the urban land surface data. We took a further step to look inside the physics me uh, me uh, mechanic mechanisms of how the uh, lens of phase data make impacts on the real surface atmospheric variables. We found the roughness is a one the key lens of phase elements. However, the, fo uh, the fo uh, formula to uh, calculate the roughness in the Wolf model originate from uh, the paper's core uh, improved method for estimation of, surf, uh, of service roughness of optical array. However, this is a uh, limitations. The building shape in the real world is more complicated than the uh, assumptions of this formula. The building is a cubical optical. Finally, I would like to share some information of our uh, ongoing projects to, uh, to improve the physics in the urban climate simulation. Our idea to, is to develop a set of urban roughness schemas for the roughness sub-layer with coupled to the uh, Wolf UCM model with a similar method of, uh, uh, of uh, previous research. We introduce a connection term into the both equation to develop the schema 
by using the data from uh, observation tower in Beijing and its neighborhood urban data. And thank you for listening. We have time for some questions. I think you said you were using the single layer or yeah. canopy model. Um, there is a multi-layer model and for places with tall buildings, um, well, to start with, it's sometimes difficult to get the single layer model to work uh, with tall buildings, but um, you might find some improvement by using the, the multi-layer model. On the other hand, it's expensive. So I don't know if you've looked at that. Uh, because it, our studies um, is complete many years ago, about five years ago. So uh, at that time, the, uh, the multi-layer uh, model is not so popular. One more question. I have a comment. Uh, I think maybe we do not communicate that uh, clearly, but I think it's not meant for anybody everybody to use the default uh, urban parameters uh, from the model and that the developer, I, I think they intended for user to make local modifications, but that's why you, know, you see so much difference between refined uh, data and the, the so-called so default data. They're not default, they're just a, a placeholder maybe more <laughs> like, but we should communicate that more uh, to the user. Yeah, thank you. Else? Let's thank our speaker again. Okay, our next talk is applications of the New York State Mesonet with high resolution numerical weather prediction using WARF by Lloyd Trainish. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me uh, start by uh, Acknowledging my uh, co-authors, uh, uh, Tony Prano and Mukul Tavari. Um, I'll provide some motivation for the work that we're doing, uh, talk a little bit about the um, uh, model configuration we have for uh, New York City and discuss a case study and some of the issues. Uh, also, I appreciate the comments made by a couple of the speakers uh, already in this session because they've actually introduced some of the issues that uh, we've, we've seen and we're uh, still trying to address. Um, as you heard on uh, uh, the other day, uh, there's a few of us in IBM that have been do doing work with numerical weather prediction for a number of years. Um, and uh, that's also included work with uh, urban deployments, uh, especially in New York City, uh, going back uh, a couple of decades. Our, uh, we have a, we're, we're based in, uh, in New York State, so we have a, a, a strong New York State uh, emphasis. And uh, some of that uh, work that we're doing, uh, which I won't talk about today, is looking at very high resolution in uh, lake watersheds uh, around uh, issues of water quality. Um, and in any of these activities, uh, we, of course, uh, always need more data to evaluate uh, the models uh, and to uh, potentially use for uh, data assimilation. So one aspect of that is uh, our use uh, with the New York State Mesonet. Um, and uh, just as a, uh, the uh, earlier speaker had uh, referenced this, but this is a, uh, one of the densest uh, mesonets uh, for an area the size of New York State. It's been developed and deployed by the State University of New York at, at Albany. Um, it includes um, 126 uh, sites with standard observations, um, uh, fairly uniformly distributed across the state. If uh, these uh, uh, green dots are showing those locations, uh, the photograph on the lower left shows a typical configuration. It's a, a comprehensive set of uh, ob observations. Um, uh, excuse me, instrumentation for uh, for uh, surface and near surface observations. This is also supplemented with a number of uh, uh, other or more specialized sites. Uh, earlier speaker uh, referenced uh, some of the profilers in. Uh, uh, in the New York City metro metropolitan area, um, and uh, where there's a, also a greater density of the uh, surface uh, observations. Uh, just as a just as a quick uh, uh, teaser, um, so uh, uh, so I appreciated the uh, earlier speaker showing the lidar data from the site in the Bronx. Here's just some of the surface observations from just a snapshot from uh, last week. 
Um, so our goals in using these data are pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, we're uh, you know, uh, uh, interested in being able to do automated uh, validation and data simulation with these observations and understand the value that they could bring in, in modeling studies. Um, and of course, bridging uh, data gaps. And uh, they're also complementary to some of our own work in the lake watersheds where we've built uh, uh, micronets uh, uh, at, at a, uh, a finer scale. So the uh, configuration that uh, we're uh, uh, using for uh, uh, WARF uh, is um, this is in an operation. This is an operational configuration. We're going down to 667 uh, meters, uh, you know, covering the metropolitan area. Part of the reason for this choice is to avoid the uh, the gray zone complications that uh, one of the earlier speakers uh, uh, had uh, introduced. We are interested in this problem, but for this application, we're trying to avoid that. Um, we're running typically twice daily, 72 hour uh, model runs and assimilating conventional observations uh, using 3D bar. Uh, uh, with 50 vertical levels, although typically it's only about 10 in the boundary layer. Um, and I've listed the physics configuration. I won't go into a lot of detail as to the particular choices. Uh, this has uh, evolved over uh, past experiments, uh, but I will uh, you know, make, I'll make some comments a, bit, a little bit later about the Thompson microphysics. And also this is using uh, the single layer urban canopy. So this is not using the, the, the urbanized uh, configuration that, uh, that the earlier speaker uh, had used. Uh, we are using RAP analysis for background fields uh, and hourly GFS for lateral boundaries. And then a number of NASA data sets we're using to, uh, uh, to initialize various uh, surface fields. Um, so the, the map here shows um, the, uh, uh, the highest resolution nest at 667 meters. I've uh, marked locations of ASOS stations with the dark red uh, uh, squares. The locations of New York State mesonet sites are shown as gray squares. And so you can see within, within the city itself, uh, it's uh, fairly complementary to the locations of the ASOS uh, uh, sites. Um, so the particular case study I'm going to focus on is uh, the remnants of Hurricane Ida. Um, and uh, just as, a, 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 you know, ju just for your uh, reference, uh, that if you don't recall, this uh, had, a, was, had landfall in, um, in Louisiana on the 29th of August, uh, 2021. It's a, a category four of a, a hurricane. It quickly degraded into a post-tropical depression. Um, and the important perspective here is that it, as it moved to the Northeast, it interacted with a frontal zone. And then this led to uh, a significant impact in the New York City area. Um, and in fact, uh, astonishing amounts of rainfall, record breaking. Uh, so uh, over seven inches across much of the metro uh, uh, area, um, uh, nine inches recorded at Staten Island. Um, seven inches recorded at Central Park with an hourly accumulation uh, of the, uh, at the site there of uh, over three inches, uh, despite the issues that uh, uh, were mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, not trying to land an airplane based on observations at the, that ASOS site, but still astonishing the levels of, uh, of accumulation. So uh, perspective here is that uh, this led to unprecedented flooding. Uh, uh, subways, uh, platforms, and uh, streets look like rivers, as you can see in some of these photographs, and unfortunately, a number of fatalities due to uh, drowning. Um, and this was actually the first time the local office of the National Weather Service had issued a flash flood emergency. So um, our, there was clear communications about, these, uh, about this event, uh, uh, but one of the questions that we have is, well, what's the level of predictability for these, for, uh, for using model data to improve the, uh, or understand how well the uh, event like this can be predicted. So I'll show results of a few simulations uh, that uh, examining uh, this. Uh, the first one will be for uh, a model initialized at um, zero UTC on the 31st of August. So that would be um, in operations about 36 hours before the, uh, the onset of the uh, extreme rainfall. So um, in, in, this, uh, uh, in this set of maps, uh, we're sh we show the, the 667 meter accumulated precipitation for 24 hours, 1st of September uh, through 2nd September, 8, uh, 8 uh, uh, a.m. Eastern time, corresponds to, the, uh, to this inset uh, for the observed observations, uh, the ob observed rainfall from, uh, from NOAA. So I could sort of wave my hand and say, well, you know, that, that looks pretty good. 
but the impacts here were all pretty low, were very localized. And so, you know, we want to understand, well, uh, you know, uh, how well does this actually uh, compare to, uh, to observations? Um, we can also take a look at uh, uh, observed reflectivity. And we, again, we see, you know, pretty similar uh, geographic patterns uh, within, the, uh, within the small inset for the, for the city. Uh, but we, we want to understand the, 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 uh, the local details. Both these cases, this is with uh, assimilating data, data only from METAS. So the, the, here we introduced uh, data from uh, New York State Mesonet. So the map on the right was uh, provided by our colleagues at, uh, at the University of Albany. It's uh, showing the city um, uh, with the uh, locations of various observation sites, including the, including the Mesonet sites. Um, and then the maximum hourly accumulation at each of these sites. So now if we look at uh, model precipitation rate at a specific uh, uh, time, we see that, well, you know, the outer boroughs are not captured at all. Uh, we, it does pretty well, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Manhattan and the Bronx. So we want to uh, then explore this. If we now assimilate the New York State Mesonet data, we see some improvement, but the outer boroughs are still not all that well captured. So let's try to look at this in a bit more detail. You'll see a number of plots here where I'll show uh, model data at uh, interpolated to uh, specific New York State Mesonet sites. Uh, this is showing the total accumulation as a function of, uh, of, uh, of time, and that is the, the model time. Uh, from, um, in this case, uh, zero UTC on the uh, 31st of August. Uh, the red lines show the, uh, the model, the blue lines show the observed. So we, here we see assimilation on the left of just the MATIS data and then MATIS and New York State Mesonet on the right. Um, we see that um, some improvement in the rainfall rate, but uh, notice that the, uh, uh, the accumulated uh, rainfall error actually increases after the mesonet data are assimilated. Um, also worth noting is that the, the start time for the heavy rainfall, the model has it about six hours too early compared to what is actually uh, observed. And the end time is roughly, roughly the same. We see similar behavior at another site in Brooklyn um, and uh, where uh, we see a decreased uh, you know, skill with the additional uh, data being assimilated. So next question is, well, let's look at another simulation with, um, uh, uh, with using data from 12 hours later. And uh, we are able with this course comparison to see um, uh, better uh, correlation with uh, uh, total rainfall compared to the observed. So I could sort of wave my hand to say we're done, but we, we're interested in, in at the local, uh, local level. Again, similarly with the reflectivity, so now we could take a look at times when the instantaneous rates were highest for, you know, for, uh, for a few of the boroughs. And we see some better correspondence uh, with the, using the later background data to compare to uh, what's actually observed. If we now go into more detail, uh, one element here is that we're improving the uh, start time of the uh, uh, forecast uh, model where the error is now a bit, it's only one and a half hours at, the, at uh, these two sites late, uh, but it's late rather than early. But we have an increase in the error in the total precipitation. We see similar behavior at uh, two of the outer boroughs in terms of Queens and Staten Island. Um, and we could repeat this experiment by using another 12 uh, set of data 12 hours later, uh, but we find that that's, um, actually doesn't really help that much. Um, and in fact, let me just skip through these just to, uh, just to illustrate that. So in fact, the later initialization time, if we look at these two plots, we find that uh, we actually have an increase in error in the, in the precipitation uh, amounts. Um, and there's no change at all in the timing of the, uh, of the storm start or end even with using data that's uh, uh, 12 hours later. We see some similar behavior uh, with uh, two other sites, Queens and Staten Island. Um, and so that, uh, uh, that, that leads to a number of uh, uh, observations um, and sort of next steps. So I only showed three simulations, 
where in practice that could have lead times anywhere from 12 to 36 hours uh, before the event in an operational setting. Yeah, at the course level, we see good geographic distribution of you know, intensity and accumulation, uh, but we do see significant errors in the model timing uh, for uh, the most intense parts of the, uh, of the event. Precipitation accumulations were lower than observed, although we had reasonable correspondence in the rates. And of course, for any of these experiments, the data from the New York State Mesonet was, uh, uh, was critical. Um, we did uh, observe a warm bias in comparison to the observations, didn't, didn't, not showing that uh, here. Um, we, uh, we do see that the Thompson microphysics are problematic, um, and we're wondering if this is a, uh, an example of what uh, Cliff uh, introduced the other day in terms of you know, uh, 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 underrepresentation uh, for warm rain. Uh, so that's something we're interested in studying further. Uh, we did notice a, a lot of variability in the spin up. You know, highly dependent on the initialization time, which we want to study further. Um, so we're in the process of evaluating other model configurations, uh, including much larger nests to, uh, to better capture uh, IDA's post-tropical uh, uh, transition, uh, experimenting with other microphysics schemes as well. And uh, we also want to evaluate uh, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, 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 different configurations in the urban physics beyond the simple uh, single layer that, uh, that, we've, uh, that we've used. Um, we'll also be doing additional hind casting and forecasting experiments for other case studies as well, uh, and doing the data denial with and without the New York State Mesonet uh, uh, data. Um, in parallel to that, we are using those data in, uh, in operations you know, for our regular model runs uh, being assimilated in, in uh, real time. And uh, I was excited to see the example comparison with the, the profiler data. Uh, that's next on our list. We haven't done that yet. And we're uh, looking forward to, to seeing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the results of that. Uh, with that, uh, let me, uh, uh, sorry, I meant to go backwards. Uh, with that, let me uh, 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 thank you uh, for your attention. And I guess we have time for a question or two. We have time for a question. Yeah, so that's some uh, really neat work. Um, and another kind of bullet point as to how a, a time lag component is, would still add value to us is designing a short-term ensemble. Um, yeah, yeah, we've not, we've not um, uh, uh, tried to do that uh, yet, although some of my other IBM colleagues, that's a, an element of their interest in, uh, you know, in the uh, hourly analysis, the hourly update uh, cycle that was uh, uh, um, uh, presented uh, two days ago. But, you know, I've noticed you went to pretty high um, resolutions and even vertical resolution at that. I've noticed, granted, particularly using the non-local schemes like YSU, that when you get to higher resolutions and to continue to have to pack, to have good vertical resolution in the boundary layer, that you end up around any sort of terrain, tilting your, verti tilting your wharf levels too much and introducing quite a bit of yeah, I, I would hesitate to call it numerical instability, but where it's where it's you're conflating now vertical and horizontal velocities that just creates a lot of CFL violations, if anything else. And I would think New York State would have enough at that resolution terrain variability to to show that problem. But granted, you're well, it, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because one area of our interest is trying to run at high resolution for the for the whole state to have that uh, examine that variability. Uh, we are familiar with the the CFL uh, issue. And so some of the model tuning that we've done, you know, that's led to this, what we're running regularly now. And then also for the, uh, at higher resolution for the, uh, uh, for a few watersheds uh, upstate, we, you know, we've had to uh, work through that. We also are, are using adaptive time stepping uh, uh, as well. So there's an additional uh, element of the tuning uh, to avoid CFL in that context, as, as you probably know. Okay, I think we probably better move on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is the configuration and evaluation of wharf chem air quality model in Thailand and by Warapop Thangsam. And please correct me if I get your name wrong uh, <laughs> from the University of Colorado Boulder. Hello, everyone. My name is Warapop Thongsim. I'm from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And for today, I would like to share some part of my research, the configuration and evaluation of WAPCAM in Thailand. 
In Thailand, we have the problem of high PM2.5, which you can see that in this figure on September, you can see the clear sky and the mountain in the back, right? But in March, everything is covered by the PM2.5. And the PM2.5 have the detrimental effect on the human health. There are some previous study from the Redditong AR in 2019, they do the annual simulation from webcam in entire Southeast Asia, and they found that the biomass burning industry and the power generation are the main source of PM in Thailand. And then if we zoom in the North Thailand, the main contribution of PM here is the biomass burning. That's why in order to reduce the concentration of biomass burning in North Thailand, my local government, they launched the zero open burning policy since 2016 to the recent. And this policy means that during the February to March every year, the crop burning is not allowed in the northern part of Thailand here. And in the future goal, I would like to evaluate the impact on this policy. But right now, we would like to find the optimal setup for the Thailand domain with webcam uh, simulation. And for this project, we would like to test the performance of different uh, emission inventory in Thailand for the anthropogenic emission and also the biomass burning emission. And the observation that we use for this study, it's going to be like the ground based observation from the Pollution Control Department Thailand and the satellite data. And for the workflow, we first uh, start with the October 2019, which is in our pay season. The PM from this period is mainly come from the anthropogenic emission. So we evaluate the performance of anthropogenic emission in this period. And after that, we apply that suitable anthropogenic emission to do the simulation on uh, March 2019, which is we mainly prepared to evaluate the performance of biomass burning emission. And here is my uh, webcam configuration. We do the simulation on nine kilometer resolution and we use the Mozart mosaic scheme because we would like to gain some information from the SOA in Thailand. And here is going to the, our first result. It is the comparison between the four different anthropogenic emission in Thailand. For this project, we apply the four anthropogenic emission Eclipse, Edgar, Cam, and Risk Inventory. And you can see that, right, different emission inventory, they have a different resolution here. And for the first step, we're going to compare the result from model with the uh, air quality station. The yellow uh, dot here represents the location of air quality station. And here is kind of the, the result that we find out in our pay season. This graph shows the daily average of the PM2.5 comparing between the observation and the webcam simulation in our pay season. And from this figure, you're gonna see that, right? And the Edgar and Reed, they tend to overestimate a lot of the PM2.5 from the observation, but Eclipse and Cam, they provide the comparable range of the PM2.5 concentration. And if we are looking at the uh, correlation coefficient here, you're gonna see that like Cam is the one that have highest correlation here. That's why like for this project, we think that the CAMS is the more suitable anthropogenic emission for the Thailand domain. And the next one, we're gonna move from the evaluation from anthropogenic part to the biomass burning emission. The figure on the left here represent the monthly average PM2.5 emission from four different biomass burning. The first one is like, FIN 2.5 using the MODIS satellite data only to detect the burn area. Second one is the FIN 2.5 using both MODIS and VIA satellite data to detect the burn area. And the third one is the FIN 1.5 and the last one is the QFED. And the plot on the right here represent the daily average PM 2.5 emission from each inventory. You're gonna see that right, the FIN 2.5 here gonna have like higher PM2.5 emission, but 1.5 is the lowest here. And the same thing before from the last slide. Yeah, we have the uh, daily average PM2.5 comparing between webcam and the observation, but this time is in head period in March 2019 here. Yep. And you're gonna see that right, our model can like capture the 
monthly trend from the observation, you can see that we get peak around like this time. And after that, the PM2.5 slow down. And after that, we get a peak again during like almost the end of the month here. But you can see from this figure that Fin 2.5 with both like using modis only or with modis and where they are like over predict a lot of the PM 2.5 here and Fin 1.5 and QFED they provide a comparable range of the PM 2.5 concentration. I think this one is because the uh, emission factor for the Fin 2.5 is a little bit higher than the 1.5 version. And if you are looking at the correlation coefficient, you can see that right, the 1.5 version have the highest correlation one. And in addition now for the ground based observation for this project, we evaluate the performance of the model via the satellite data. This one is the cloud part between the MODIS AOD and WAPCAM AOD. And to gain uh, further information, we also divide the Thailand area into like three separate subdomain here. We have the surrounding country in blue and the rest of Thailand in like orange here and not Thailand in yellow, which is the area that we have the crop uh, zero open burning policy here. And in general, uh, FIN 1.5 and the QFED provide like a little bit comparable performance here, but the 1.5, they are like underperforming in the North Thailand, but they have a better performance in the rest of uh, area of the domain here. And this one toward the correlation part between the MOPIT CO and the WAPCAM CO total column, the scale here in log scale, and the same thing like we divide the our domain into like three sub area here. And you can see that like the performance of like these four and uh, biomass burning inventory, they kind of like have the same performance, like the correlation coefficient, they are about like 0.9 here for the all inventory. So I'm gonna say that like for the MOPCO, there is no like significant better performance among these four biomass burning inventory. So in conclusion, I think like for the Thailand domain, the optimal setting for the emission inventory is gonna be like FIN 1.5 and CAM anthropogenic emission. We have the correlation coefficient about like 0.7 for the PCD station and the MODIS AOD here and the 0.9 for the MOPIS CO. And a little bit notice here, we have like the under prediction for PM 2.5 from the model here comparing to the ground bed observation. And one sort of that error might be due to the meteorology. This figure represents the wind plot coming from the observation and the warp cam. And the uh, rectangular here represents the location of the observation here. And if you look at the wind speed first, you're gonna see that, right? The wind speed from warp cam is higher than the observation. And this is like the reason why we underestimate the PM2.5 because the higher wind speed can diffuse the PM2.5 concentration from the model part. And the another one is gonna be the wind direction. If you look at the like yellow one and the purple panel here, this like this station is near the coastal area. Uh, this area should be like the ocean is the, the Gulf of Thailand. And you can see that like the wind direction for the yellow and the purple panel is high up like up a little bit from the observation. And this is because like our resolution is nine kilometers. So it's hard for the model to capture lo the local wind perfectly. And it might be some influence of the seabed for this location. And so the conclusion, we found that the CAMS and the FIN 1.5 is the best optimal setup for the Thailand domain. And we overestimate the wind speed a little bit from the PCD station. And for the future work, we would like to evaluate the impact of the policy on the PM 2.5 of Thailand. So we're gonna use this setup for the, our future work model. Yep. Thank you for your attention. Yep. We have time for questions. Talk. Uh, oh, it was just surprising to see when you showed the emission inventories, when you come back uh, among each other, uh, I guess the Edgar was showing much more uh, like higher resolution data, I guess it was 0.1. Um, do you mean anthropogenic emission? Anthropogenic uh, emissions. 
but as I was surprised to see that you got better results with the cams and not with the uh, the Edgar. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, for the overestimating, the, my question is that yeah. uh, do you think that the Edgar, Edgar is overestimating over the region? That's the reason. Yeah, I think like the one actually, if we consider only like the magnitude of the emission, the Edgar is like far overestimate the emitted. PM 2.5, but if we look at the correlation, actually like each Edgar and Cam, they have like the same like order of the correlation coefficient in original, but in here we modify the parts of the non-volatile organic material in Cam a little bit. That's why our Cam is got a little bit higher performance here. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Another question? This is a very interesting study. Yeah, thank you. Uh, have you looked at the like uh, the sensitivity to the temperature as well, like a two meter? Yeah, actually, like we look at the uh, like other meteorology variable like temperature and relative humidity, comparing with the observation, and it's quite up like quite okay in terms like of like temperature, but relative humidity is uh, our model is tend to like, underestimate the relative humidity. And the another thing is we turn the aerosol feedback on in this project, so every different setup of the biomass burning and anthropogenic emission is gonna affect the meteorology as well, but it a little bit yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank all of our speakers one more time. We'll call the end of the session. Okay, welcome back from lunch, everybody. You've made it to the last session of contributed talks of this Wharf and Pass workshop. So, and, and there'll be a discussion session following ice cream at the break after this session's over. So. So, so I ask our speakers to stay on time because we've got to get to ice cream. Um, so with that, uh, the first talk in this session is going to be by, by Dave Bromwich, who's going to talk about the regional Arctic cyclone prediction with an MRI 4D VAR with Polar Wharf. So, so please, it's all yours. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've heard the uh, talk uh, title. And we're going to the North Polar region. And my co authors, uh, Jake Liu and June May Ban, who are responsible for the uh, MRI 40 bar, and Lu Shang Bai, who ran the simulations. And this work is supported by the Office of Naval Research. Okay, so this is kind of a wordy um, slide. I guess it shows up pretty good. Um, so just to go through uh, the motivation here, the uh, recently developed multi-resolution incremental 40 bar, uh, I'll use the acronym MRI 40 bar, together with the polar optimized version of WARF that uh, we maintain at the Bird Center, is uh, used to explore the regional predictive skill for intense cyclones over the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and these often cause substantial disintegration of the sea ice cover. So this is a particular interest to O&R. In comparison to global prediction systems, that's from ECMWF and NSAP, uh, it appears that enhanced forecast skill for up to five days ahead is demonstrated for extreme summer and winter cases. I can only show in view of time a limited uh, examples. And we think this forecast improvement is primarily due to the better representation of the stratospheric polar vortex in the initial conditions as a result of satellite radiance assimilation. Top right here is our model domain. So it's very large, extends well into the mid latitudes. Uh, we're using 4.1 of, we're gonna show results of uh, 3D bar two versions of this uh, multi-resolution 40 bar. So the minimization is at uh, lower resolution to speed up the computations. Um, the, we're gonna run it at 15 kilometers. The minimization for 40 bar, MRI 40 bar is done at, uh, for the inner loops, 135 and 45, and also 45, 45, so I'll show limited results from both of those. Uh, we're doing cycling assimilation in a six hour window. So plus or minus three hours of the nominal time. 
uh, for 40 bar, we have uh, 60 minute windows and there are 57 vertical levels. In the forecast, we're using the GFS forecast for the lateral boundary conditions to mimic uh, actual forecast conditions. So just to give you a quick overview, uh, the domain we have, uh, it has a lot of observations over the land area surrounding the Arctic Ocean. There's this data void close to the North Pole, and you can only see purple dots. Those are the drifting buoys that basically give you surface pressure. However, because we're so close to the pole, we have lots and lots of polar orbiting satellite data. Uh, in a six hour window, this is illustrative from of the coverage from four satellites, uh, and we're using AMPSU A temperature uh, information. So the GFS analysis is used as initial and lateral boundary conditions for the cycling assimilations, and the GFS forecasts that I've already said provide the lateral boundary conditions for the forecasts initi initialized by WARF DA. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. We ran 20 days of cycling assimilation for um, basically the first three weeks of August, 2016. And the goal here was to indicate or demonstrate the robustness and re reliability of this MRI 40 bar. The, uh, these are two plots, a uh, series of plots at the bottom uh, of the observation observations minus background, O minus B, for the ASCAT uh, ocean surface winds. So those are the ice-free ocean. Uh, the two 40 bar variants improve on the RMS uh, relative to 3D bar, and I'll leave it at that. On the right, this is for channel eight of AMSU, which peaks around 150 HPA. Um, at the top is the RMS of uh, 3D bar, and at the bottom is the RMS reduction. So if it's negative, it's improved on 3D bar for the, the fit. And the higher resolution uh, minimization, so two at 45, so that's three times the grid resolution of the forecast model. Um, and you can see the red dots are better than the green dots. Okay. How about the forecasts? So uh, th these forecasts were done at zero UTC every one of these days and roughly three weeks. Uh, the bias in the forecast, this is the domain mean uh, for 3D bar is in black. The two uh, MRI 40 bar variants, and this is for forecasts out to day seven are improved, but there is a negative bias. It's not particularly big. The RMS, uh, similar for the uh, improvement over 3D bar for the two versions of MRI 40 bar we ran. Uh, on the right is the forecast RMS through, once again, the domain mean, but uh, as a function of pressure. And I just want to highlight the uh, this is for the top line is for the 12 hour forecast. The bottom is for the seven day forecast. And the improvement of the 45 45 uh, assimilation is more evident near the top of the model. Red versus green, and negative is improvement over 3D bar. After seven days, there's not much signal left. Uh, and I should also emphasize that. The signal is best developed in geopotential height. Okay, I think it's a bit washed out. Um, there was this intense cyclone case that occurred in this uh, August period. Uh, this was one of the strongest cyclones over the Arctic Ocean. And unfortunately in the uh, uh, slide, it's kind of washed out here. Uh, these are, fields comparing the GFS analysis with the GFS forecast on the top row, uh, polar wall forecast initialized by 40 bar, and on the bottom row, polar wall forecast initialized by 3D bar. If you focus on day five, um, 
you can see that the polar wolf forecast with 40 bar is remarkable, actually, in its position and intensity. Less skillful with the GFS forecast and much less skillful with 3D bar. And in fact, the uh, skill in continues uh, out to day seven with 40 bar. Okay. This is a complicated diagram. I'm just going to show this to say that we looked at the detailed dynamics associated with the uh, development of this intense cyclone in terms of features like uh, the jet streams, the baroclinicity, um, the polar vortex itself, uh, the smaller scale features, the TPVs, the tropopause polar vortices. Okay. All right, so we also have been looking at um, these windborne balloon observations uh, that were done. This was an experimental program that was done for about three weeks in 2021 and continued in 2022. These are basically constant level radiosons. Um, they were released from <clears throat> the former Barrow. There's a picture in the top left in blue of the trajectories and also from Svalbard, that's the red trajectories. Um, and so we did uh, the cycling assimilations for these two for this uh, period. And once again, the GFS forecasts are used as the lateral boundary conditions for the forecasts that we ran four times every day. And um, at the bottom is an illustration of the observations that go into the cycling assimilation. Those long green stri uh, stripes there, they're, they're the windborne. And we were um, assimilating those in 10 minute windows to, because these are basically continuously transmitting and that's to increase the impact of these observations. Uh, and um, the time here is the, start of the six hour window. So in the second from the left, you can see the green dots over the um, the land areas. So those are the conventional radius points. Okay. Um, these um, windborne observations were mostly between 200 and 300 HPA. They tended to be um, to concentrate in the north, uh, the top left of this plot. Um, and the impact, uh, this is the MRI 40 bar analysis of the geopotential height differences between the assimilation with the windborne and without the windborne. And these are on two separate days at 200, 250, 300, and 500, just to show you the impact on the uh, in initial conditions, these are not big numbers at 200 millibars, plus or minus 15 geopotential meters. Okay, so here's an illustration of one forecast. This was a six and a half day forecast. We're comparing things against the GFS analysis. There'll be a quiz if you can remember <laughs> these. Uh, it's very hard to read the contours. So the difference fields are shown up in the colors, uh, which are the features to focus on. Uh, so actually this was a very good forecast by um, the GFS model out at uh, six and a half days. Uh, Polar Wharf with 40 bar is equally as good, I would say in general. When you add the windborne on the right, you can see if you want to compare with the two panels to the left, particularly over the central Arctic Ocean that uh, the errors uh, in relation to the GFS analysis are substantially less. Once again, these are not huge numbers. These are the ranges plus or minus 50 geopotential meters at 200 HPA. Okay, so to summarize then, uh, we've shown I've shown you these data assimilation and forecast experiments of Arctic cyclones. And I think that uh, this configuration has good performance over the Arctic. 
Uh, it appears that the forecast skill for such events is advanced over the global prediction systems, although we need much more verification to substantiate that. Why might be the, ca the case? Well, it could, it likely is due to the high resolution data assimilation and a regional model optimized for the Arctic. So if you get improved initial conditions, that's what we think is going on. Uh, when you have a regional prediction system, you can choose the physics that you want for things like the microphysics and the, the PBL schemes, the land surface model, and so on. Uh, and regional modeling systems are good um, to investigate impacts of observations, features like polar water seas, TPVs, and so on. So what are the future plans? Uh, we're going to, we have about, um, 10 months left on the funding. So we're gonna do some more cyclone assimilations with some improved versions of the, the model, particularly with regard to the NOAA MP land service model. And uh, in the spirit of the workshop, um, we want to start looking at the polar physics in MPAS and uh, see whether MRI 40 bar can be uh, used in MPAS JEDI. So thank you very much. I hope I'm on time. We have time for some questions. I, I'm curious if the if the 40 bar on the reduced grid did it add much to the to the time it takes to to do the assimilation or was it about a wash? Um, the three mean bar in relation to yeah. 3D bar. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's. It's a very computation. It's a heavy computational burden. Even on that reduced mesh, you're using yes. 45 kilometer yes. mesh. But in the prior, you know, prior to the introduction of this, of course, you had to run it at full model resolution. So that was an absolute right. hog. So right. Notice that uh, your surface pressure prediction, the pressure keep on becoming more and more negative. Why is that? Good question. We haven't uh, investigated that in detail. Um, you know, we are dependent on what comes across the lateral boundaries from the GFS forecast. So that could be a component of this. There's a spatial structure to this. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer for you. Okay, thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. And the next talk is going to be uh, given to us by Johan Roche, who's going to talk about uh, Euro 1K, a rapid refresh model for Europe. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really happy. Um, so first of all, my name is Johannes Rausch. And I'm really happy to talk and showcase today about a rather large project. Um, uh, my team, and myself, um, are working for the last two years. And I can't believe it, but it's uh, uh, fully operational since 1st of April. But before we dive into the Euro 1K, the first high resolution rapid refresh uh, weather model for entire Europe, um, I want to give you a brief overview of Meteomatics. Who, oops, who is Meteomatics? What are we doing? So, um, Meteomatics is um, founded 11 years ago in 2012 by a um, mathematician called Martin Fengler and uh, is headquartered based in St. Gall in Switzerland and nowadays um, has a subsidiary which recently opened in the States. 
and another office in Germany, Berlin. So what are, what are we offering? So basically four, four things. Um, first of all, a really, really uh, nice and easy to use weather API, an API to uh, query all kinds of meteorological data, uh, talking about observations, basically all weather models available on, on the market uh, and out there basically, uh, even up to climate uh, projection, climate data. Second big part is, uh, and this is why I'm here for, is the high resolution weather models, high resolution weather modeling based on WARF and the Euro 1K is one application. Then uh, in order to query, in order to visualize the, the data delivered by the weather API, um, Mathematics developed a, a visualization engine called Medex. And last but not least, um, uh, this is basically half of the company. Uh, we are developing and assembling um, our own weather drones called the Meteor drone, uh, which uh, which intention is to fill the metrological gap uh, between in the lower atmosphere. Those uh, drones can fly up to 6,000 meter and gather uh, metrological data, which then of course can be fed again into models. So now to the fun part. Um, and the motivation behind Euro 1K. If you fly over Europe, you will uh, pass, let's say you fly from the very west to the very east, you will pass 10 different limited area models. Yeah, Each of them uh, providing, creating their own idea of weather forecasts. <laughs> so I think there is, there is uh, room for one limited area model, which captures everything. And this is basically the idea of Euro 1K. So, have, so this and to meet the, the needs of the industry and of course the wider public. So let's, let's get to the, to the main thing. Um, this, is best, this is best practice at the moment. This is EC Europe, part of Europe, just a part of Europe, 10 kilometer resolution. Uh, United Kingdom, you see uh, here, Austria, Scandinavia, run up to Russia. And would be nice if that slide would work. Next one, please. And this is Euro 1K, here it is. So, yeah, a little bit more detailed, I would say. Let's go back, forth, back, forth. So, what what are the model spe specifications? What is what is the setup? So, we are running uh, WAF version four point three point one. We are running a one kilometer. We run it. We have eighty levels. We have four thousand six hundred by four thousand three hundred grid points. We produce 24 runs a day with 20 minute forecast interval. Each run computed out for 27 hours of lead time. We are assimilating all available observations via our Meteomatics weather API using Meteomatics drone exclusively weather stations, radar, satellite, and aircraft data. For doing that, we're not on GPU. We're on CPU. We need 40,000 CPUs at the moment um, on 300 uh, on prem HPC nodes located in Ludwigshafen, Germany next to DWD. Uh, uh, the whole thing is run is running on a fully separated workflow. So everything is running uh, in parallel. The, the wharf itself, the DA, the pre-processing, the, the post-processing, everything is uh, running in parallel and not, not interacting with each other, not disturbing each other. We are using the HER suite as physics. We are using a subgrid cloud parameterization. iCloud is free. 
we are doing soil moisture uh, and soil temperature and snow snowpack cycling. Uh, we have four cold starts a day using EC 06, 12, 18 UTC. The output we, we are creating, which is then be, being fed into the API is, um, a re, is containing a reduced set of uh, variables. Otherwise we couldn't cope with it. Each file 20 gig. And how, how are we able to output this uh, vast amount of data? with split IO, IO form is uh, 102 uh, and each run has 1.5 terabyte. This, this uh, model is operational since April, 2023. I already mentioned that. So before I start with uh, the cycling setup, I just want to give you a short introduction of our initialization and what kind of data assimilation we're using. Some low hanging fruits are in the static data, for example, in the leaf area index and vegetation fraction, which we are updating on a, a weekly basis uh, using the Sentinel Copernicus data. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, uh, not uh, completely changing everything, but it helps to, to reduce the bias a bit mean and RMSC as well. Um, then also low hanging fruit is of course to not use uh, Ostia or uh, lo lo uh, low course, a like course uh, resolved uh, SSD. We're using the NASA Moore GHR SSD on one kilometer, which is basically um, updated once, once a day. That has a, a, a significant impact on the forecast skills. What kind of uh, data simulation are we using? I and mean, we have to do some data simulation, otherwise it would not be very meaningful, sensible to run a rapid refresh, right? So we are using the simple, but very uh, beautiful uh, observational nudging, where we basically nudge all what we can get, which meets our quality criteria. Um, we have a problem in Europe, probably the same in the US and everywhere else. Some networks um, are not delivering all the data we need for ingesting into the observational nudging. Uh, pressure surface is needed by um, the observation and nudging routine to be ingested. So this is basically the coverage. If we just take the default uh, stations available, and uh, this is after we uh, use pressure surface from a previous uh, Euro 1K run. So we, we are able to increase the number of observations from 2000 to 5000. Um, uh, what we see in the scale, the typical behavior of observational nudging uh, after six to 10, after six to nine hours, the, the scale bounces back to the no, day, no observational nudging run, which is how it is, right? Uh, for Next slide, please. For radar simulation, we are using the GSI package uh, where we use the, use the cloud analysis package uh, for cloud building and hydrometeor modification and the radar DFI enabled compiled version of WARF for the subsequent latent heat nudging. We are applying like the her did it, uh, a 10 minute backwards DFI and a 20 minute forward DFI on a 1K grid. Yeah, you know that during the DFI forward, the uh, MP physics tendencies uh, will be become replaced by the GSI temperature tendencies. That works. You see on the left image, the measured radar reflectivity greater 25 dBZ, then the derived GSI temperature tendencies, which we then use in the radar DFI window. And then one hour later, the forecasted model reflectivity, we are basically close to the uh, reflectivity. Now to the uh, cycling setup, uh, we have four cold starts a day. We, let's say it's six o'clock, six o'clock the uh, EC arrives. We apply a five hour catch up run from zero to five doing observational nudging. Then we apply the radar DFI and uh, and an hour of observation nudging, and then we trigger the six UTC run. Uh, 
now Euro 1K7 UTC run. So we go back one hour, do the uh, radar notching, uh, temperature increment supplying on six set and do a one hour observation nudging and then trigger again a run, 27 hours and so on and so on and so on. So is this working? Looks like it, it's working. Uh, on the left, we have satellite and radar for some thunderstorms in the in the mat. Um, in the middle, we have EC and on the right, we have the Euro 1K forecast 2.5 hours after the radar DFI has been done. Another case, uh, so a little bit more is going on southern of the Alps, um, France, Switzerland, Italy. Um, left again the radar, in the middle EC, it's kind of this uh, convective, parameter, convective parameterized uh, um, widespread behavior of EC. And to the right, 2.5 hours after radar DFI has, has been done, Euro 1K. So I see quite a bit of um, a match. Now my favorite one, that was just a few days ago, was a massive squall line uh, surpassing France. Radar to the left, Euro 1K. Um, it's actually the first, first cycle, already captures it, it, it well. And you see to the right. In, ter in terms of skill, uh, of course, this is a, a good case, but it's a verific verification over 5,000 stations in Europe. So there are many stations which are not contributing in a positive way, of course, to this verification. But you see the, the strong signal from the well-captured precip uh, on the probability of detection, yes. Green is the Euro 1K POD versus uh, EC and on the critical success index for five millimeter, so strong precip per hour. How are we doing in general is the question now. So in our pre-operational phase, uh, we already ran it basically semi-operational and, and then verified it over four months. Uh, this is the, give me a break. This is a zero UTC initialization. Um, what you see here is uh, in blue, the EC and in what color is this? <laughs> turquoise. In turquoise, the, the Euro 1K, the dashed uh, line is the downscale, downscale line where we uh, or topographically, topographically correct uh, the forecast based on a 90 meter SRTM topography. So if you look at those scores, uh, Um, yeah, and look at it, bias, uh, temperature biases between minus 0 0.4 and 0 0.2 mean, um, mean error for wind is basically a straight line around zero after being downscaled, which makes sense, right? And CSI is always above EC with a slightly higher frequency bias. So what is the conclusion out of that? Yes, and that was the that was the exercise, right? Uh, we are adding value on top of EC. Yeah, that brings me to the last slide for the Euro One K slides. Ongoing, a lot of work it needs to be done. Uh, basically, everywhere needs, uh, wherever I, I look, I see work which needs to be done. But we are on a good way, and we uh, we have this point now. This, this state where we just, we made the model run, we figured the, the IO, we solved the IO, and now we can just add functionality. So we are now working on adding satellite data to the uh, cloud analysis building via GSI. Then we are making first steps in doing the WARF DA on the DO2 grid, uh, one kilometer grid. You can, I think you can imagine that that is quite a hassle because um, we are consuming a lot of uh, memory and sometimes we still experience crashes of WARF DA. We will further enhance our radar simulation by doing 3D 
radar simulation probably at the end of the pre-forecast period why not we will add uh, severe satellite that's what we plan then we are looking forward uh, to add the wind profiler and the aircraft data we have to nudging and to 3d warden this is what we're doing right now and outlook is there is uh, this met wharf which is kind of interesting for short term radiation improvements also kind of nudging method we'll look into that then everywhere you see potential parameters we have to tune we have to, to screw and probably like we find a way to replace our ourselves by <laughs> by a kind of automated way of doing parameter tuning for microphysics lens surface models and PBL schemes just to to name a few like what is the ideal parameter to be tuned on the automated way in an automated way roughness plan coefficient and so on and so on then on the satellite um, side of things so much stuff is going on uh, we're waiting for the lightning imager which will then convert to radar and assimilate. And we're waiting for the flexible combined imager, which is the next generation of Severi with offering more channels and in higher resolution. That was it for, from the Euro 1K side and just a brief introduction of the, um, of the meteor we're, drones. We're um, running late. So yeah, I think if you just want to leave your slide up while we transition, um, Okay, that would be good. So thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry for it was too much, I know. <laughs> um, and you should hold your questions for Johannes to find out how you can get 40,000 cores continuously <laughs> for forever uh, uh, to the break. Uh, next up is uh, Lou Wicker. He's going to talk about adding MPAS to the convective scale model test suite. So good afternoon, glad to be here again. It's been a while. Um, I was just thinking I was at Avery Brewery last night and I didn't, hadn't been there probably in five years. So beer's still good, that's good. So um, so uh, anything that good that you see here today is probably due to my collaborators and anything that looks a little bit shady, it's probably me. So just in case that uh, this talk uh, grows out of, I think some of you are aware that I've been looking at the differences between UFS die core at the CAM scales and the current operational models like her. And, um, and, and this is sort of adding impasse to the game. So we'll take a look at that. So one of the motivate, there's been lots of different motivations over the last three or four years, trying to understand the differences in the behavior and, and presentation of convection, explicit convection at CAM scales and the RRFS versus the her. Um, and then another issue sort of popped up in the last year or so as we've trying to, as Noah's trying to get close to being able to uh, do a, a replacement of the HER, which is that the RRFS tends to have these extreme precip events. Um, on the left, you see something from last year's FAIR experiment, which is a, a flood uh, precipitation QPF experiment run by WPC uh, almost every summer for about the last three or four years. And you see um, that if, uh, let's see if I can get this pointer thing to work there it is that here's the her down here with one hour precip amounts about almost six inches in some cases certainly not uh, not excessive but then when you go out here with some of these different configurations of the rrfs there are some being tested you see an extreme bias uh, here and long long tails and in the here's just a particular example what this looks like here's mrms uh, on a particular southeast day uh, which is, has about eight inches an hour projected whereas um, the RRFSs are in 20 and 30 inches um, projected or forecast. And, and this is not an uncommon occurrence. So going, stepping back for a second, and then we'll get back to that. I mean, one of the things about, I started this work with, with Larissa Reams and some others was that uh, looking at real data differences. And I think we all understand that trying to understand why models are different in real data cases are hard. It's hard. It's hard to control for the physics, uh, initial conditions. And the other thing is that convective scale, there are very few observations that really validate. Um, 
And Lister will show you some of the real data stuff here next. Um, I just thought it'd be, if, can we reproduce behaviors in a less complex framework? And what I've decided to do uh, to just move it along, there has been some previous work, but it's been very limited, is to consider that since most convection in the United States occurs in lines or clusters of cells, that maybe we should look at squall lines as a way of validating different types of, of, of model dynamic cores and, and things like that. And the nice thing about squall lines is you generate a large number of cells, you get a lot of statistics you can process, and then you can go through and look at different effects of different environments, vertical wind shears, just like essentially 1982 to 84 from Wiseman, the Wiseman Clemp days again. And then you can obviously in these idealized runs, you can really, I think, do a better one-to-one -one comparison. This is a complicated slide. I'm not gonna go through all of it. Um, I started this process with looking at FE3. The solo core is just sort of a cut down core, but it's the same dynamic core with uh, minimal physics. Wharf and CM1, and now I've added MPAS in the last month. Um, basically, I'm looking at a variety of soundings. Uh, the important thing about these soundings to know is that the boundary layer relative humidity is fixed from the McCall and Wiseman technique. And then I've looked at three different sort of uh, shallow squall line shears, which, and I'm going to focus on the, the sort of two capes, uh, 2,000 and 3,500 joules per kilogram, and look at the six and 18 meter per second shear over two and a half kilometers just to kind of look at the space. The grid spacing is three kilometers. It's a big grid, doubly periodic, and um, and we're using RFS uh, NVP vertical grid spacing, which is 60 levels and, and 12 meters near the ground. And the usual methodologies are done for initializing everything. So what do the squall lines look like? Uh, this top here is just what it looks like after an hour in one of the experiments. Here's the wharf. Um, the, I'm going to try to keep the color code with WARF as results are in black, MPAS is green, CM1 is blue, and FE3 is in red in some of these plots. You know, you see a little bit of a coal pool uh, is this sort of light grade shading. And then the updrafts are the little uh, blotches in the middle here. Uh, and you can see that the, that the uh, WARF and MPAS look, and CM1 look uh, very much the same. And one of these things doesn't look like the others here. And I'm not going to emphasize, I will emphasize it slightly, but that's this thing kind of floats around. It's kind of interesting. Um, at the bottom, let me go to the next slide because that's really what I want to compare. So at the bottom, this is the same thing I just showed on the previous page. We'll look at the squall line structure after five hours. And these are just uh, the W's. At, well, the max W in the uh, uh, lowest two and a half kilometers. So this top thing, if you might want to look, is like 5.9 here, 5.8 Ampass, 5.9 NCM1, and then 10.4 for FE3. And then you also see in these blotches, which are really the objects that I'm going to be identifying later, that there's definitely differences in scale uh, and distribution throughout the cold pool. MPAS makes a very big cold pool, as big as the FE3 does. I can't quite figure out why that is just yet. Uh, this is really a first or second pass through the data. So you can see at the shallow shear and low cape, I'm sorry, small shear, low cape, you know, you get these nicely propagating systems. If you go up to large cape and strong shear, 18 meters per second, you get a honking squall line that's moving a lot faster after five hours. Um, and you see sort of uh, similar shapes, but different issues on the front edge and different structures behind it in the cold pool. Um, and the other thing to sort of notice here is the differences, let's say in max updraft, and this will be a theme, uh, are maximized at these low ends, this low cape shear end, and they're much closer at the high cape shear end. So now we're going to go back to the precipitation. And I wanted to show these are uh, kernel density estimations, estimates of the 15 minute precipitation rates for three experiments the C2006, um, the 3506, and then the 3518. And what I want you to notice here is how, in the shallow, uh, I call this sort of the, the summertime convective regime. Um, which incidentally is where the F-fair was having problems. You see that all the, the three NCAR models, if you will, uh, are all pretty similar. And then, but the FE3 has this very long tail and very extreme rain rates for some of the entities out there. As you increase the CAPE, um, things get a little bit more sane in terms of the FE3. It's a lot closer to the other models. MPAS seems to be uh, having uh, some large events, but none of the NCAR models ever exceed about 40 millimeters per 15 minutes, even in this one. FE3 starts to come back in line, 
and passes a little uh, weak here early on. And then by the time you go to the strong shear, you see that all the models, in my opinion, are pretty close together. So one thing to really think about here is that the, the differences between the models and the precipitation space seem to be a function of the environment. And that's a very important uh, theme that seems to be coming up over and over again. Um, another way to look at this is uh, Hoffmuller diagrams. And here is the uh, shallow or the weak moderate cape, 2000 cape, we'd all take that with good shear, I know. But uh, 2000 cape with uh, shallow, weak shear, two and a half kilometer shear of six meters per second. You see the initial bubble up here. These are averaged in Y, so this is X. And I'm showing the differences in the position of the gust front essentially, which is really not that large over two hours, the differences in the propagation. But you can see that here, and then there's some scattered convection behind the line as you go, and pass has a little bit more. Uh, CM1, uh, similar to Wharf, maybe the weakest of all the three. It actually had the smallest cold pool, or actually Wharf, I think, had the smallest cold pool, but CM1 was close. And in the FP3, you see that we have multiple bursts of uh, strong convection here, and then some resurgent strong convection back down behind the line later on, which are pretty intense. And if you look at just sort of what the max is in these uh, spaces on these plots, you go from the max of impasse of 15 millimeters every 15 minutes is sort of the max you'd see, and the FE3 has 28. Now, if you go to the next slide and look at this uh, high end, high shear case, the differences start to go away. Um, here you see the wharf. Um, again, strong squall line, maybe a secondary round of convection right behind it. Same thing a little bit with impasse. Again, you see. Uh, some convection behind, and CM1 now has some fairly intense cells and intense convective rates on the leading edge, 20 millimeters in 15 minutes, and FE3 is about the same. So again, very different behaviors based on the environment in these two models. Um, the MPAS model, to me, looks like it needs a little bit of tuning up for these idealized runs, but it hasn't been tested extensively at those scales, and it's hard to get all the mixing and, and filtering right across these, as I'll point out later. So a lot of what we do at NSSL uh, with our warm forecast system is try to uh, basically validate not only just fields, but objects. And we identify convective objects with some fairly simple criteria. Corey Potvin's talk will have a much more sophisticated uh, criteria, but all I'm gonna do in these squall lines is just look for the composite rec reflectivity greater than 35 and where W is greater than five meters per second above 700 millibars. And you mask those two fields, and this is what you get for objects. And from these objects, you can extract the size, the shape, and profiles of the W and temperature and pressure, whatever you want, and precipitation associated with each object. Um, so one of the things I wanted to look at, um, basically based on my visual analyses and expectations, is that what's the size of the storm objects in the first two hours of these squall lines after initiation? They all have the same initiation. And what immediately stands out is that in the 90th percentile up in here, uh, and still even at the 50th, the FB3 is always has larger objects. And sometimes by the 90th percentile, it has double the size and then the wharf and the CM1 and, and the and impasse does. And I think this is basically why you're getting these extreme rain rates as these large objects early on. When you go up to higher Cape, everything spreads out a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit bigger down low. It's uh, definitely bigger up at the 90 percentile. FP3 is still out as the outlier. It always is uh, on the outlier in sense of things. And by the time you get to um, S18 in the first two hours, the 90th percentile is pretty complicated. You get these large objects. I don't plot past 50 pixels, but you're getting those long gust front bands that you were seeing. So at lower shears, the income, mo income models have similar sizes. The MPAS looks very similar to the other models. FE solo is uh, too uh, larger. I, I think I forgot to mention, and this is rather important. I went back and this is all with Kessler microphysics because it's the only microphysics code I can look at and know that they're all the same. Um, it's very difficult to match codes across models. I think that's one of the problems, challenges with the wharf is what version of wharf has what version of Thompson, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think GitHub and, 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 and hashtags was gonna help that a lot, but this is all with very simple physics. So it's natural to think, okay, I've got bigger storm objects. Maybe I have bigger updrafts, less entrainment, more efficient precipitation. So from those storm objects, which I just showed you, this is what the cumulative uh, frequency 
looks like for W. W is along the bottom here, just like the pixels were on the last one. And here is what you see for the SO6, uh, 2000 shear. It's not that different. I mean, it's not a big difference. And this sort of surprises me a little bit. And I don't know, I mean, this, and this is the number of, of, of profiles. So one of the things you're gonna see here is that FE3 has a ton of objects, uh, meaning the criteria. In fact, it usually has about twice as many objects as this. So when you average it out, it may be averaging down a little bit, um, but certainly uh, you, you don't see that much difference. And then as you increase the cape, they get a little bit closer together. Again, they're not totally different. Again, FE3 has almost 20, 50, at least 60, 70% more objects than CM1 and WARF and, and about 30% more objects than, than MPAS. MPAS has a lot of objects too. And then when you go to the high shears, everything kind of lines up except MPAS seems to be sort of lagging behind a little bit. So I look at this and I'm like, and I've looked at some other things, obviously, and I couldn't quite figure out what's going on. And so I went back uh, a few days ago and looked at what, so this, so it's important to understand this plot on the left is from the storm objects. This plot on the right is from the W from all the domain. Now remember this, in order to be a storm object, you have to have a composite reflectivity of 35 dBZ. And this is Kessler, so that's kind of a funky criteria because there's no ice. But if you look here, for all of W in the domain, you see a much bigger difference between the three model, four models, especially FE3, than you do over here. And I haven't quite figured out if this means anything yet. It means that there might be some places where FE3 is raining with lower reflectivity, but you have some extreme tail out in this region. And so there's a lot of questions. And these, these, this is millions of points because it's basically 25 time levels over 256 squared. So there's a lot of data in here. I do threshold it, but at five meters per second. So this is always uh, above a certain amount. So summarize, um, for similar grips and time steps and et cetera, all models have their own climate, um, even for the simple experiments here, but systematic differences apparently can be detected. And what's I think kind of cool is that you can sort of replicate what you see in the real data cases with these simple tests. MPAS looks good. Um, it seems to have a high bias in objects, but I think there's uh, probably plenty of room to sort of uh, spruce that up in terms of trying to get everything to match well. Uh, FE3 doesn't have any vertical dissipation due to its uh, moving coordinate. And so um, we've got to uh, work on that a little bit more. The bias doesn't impact the reflectivity. Uh, given that the real data biases uh, can be reproduced, it suggests that the differences are in the dynamical cores of these models, particularly uh, with a dynamic one dynamical core being uh, developed for large scale applications. It's important to understand that these biases seem to be where, where IFE3 appears to work pretty well sometimes is because it's dependent on the environment. And just the last caveat, it's, it's summary to challenging to match advection schemes and filters, and it's impossible to limit all the differences. And I'll, I'll put up my future work slide, and I just want to throw uh, a little quick out. I'll get in trouble if I don't with someone back in, at the office. of We have openings for people to work on a reanalysis project at NSSL, and I'm also looking for a new NRC postdoc to, to do some work on data simulation and work on impasse. Thank you. Hey, we have time for maybe one quick question while we transition. Anyone, any takers? Hi, Lou. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on why the cold pool was so much larger in impasse compared to wharf. No. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've just put impasse in the last three or four weeks, and I've actually backed off from the fourth of the, the running the pseudo three and a half order advection to the third, and that seemed to decrease it a little bit. But uh, uh, I don't. And that's something I want to look at and understand. Make sure that making sure the initial condition is exactly the same. Everything while bubbles are in the right place, that kind of thing. So, but I think it is because I've had several iterations, so. Okay, thank you, Lou. Uh, next up, we have Larissa Reams talk to us about the development of the CONUS NSSL Regional MPAS forecast system. So um, I'm gonna try to keep this quick so we can get to some of the, the, the fun results from all of the, the model development that you'll um, hear about here. Um, so as Lou mentioned, the FE3, which um, all the work that he's done with that, uh, in addition to all of the other work that we and 
our colleagues at other labs, including lots of people in this room. We've been looking at FV3 since 2016 um, to both replace potentially the HER and perhaps the WARF core also in our worn on forecast system, which if you don't know is run um, during specific severe weather events over the CONUS, but a very small domain at very, uh, lots of radar data assimilation over a very um, small uh, domain over CONUS. So with specific uh, intention to forecast severe weather very well. So uh, unfortunately, we we haven't had the kind of luck at NSSL that we'd hoped to have using the FV3 in that sort of situation. So last fall, we made the decision to start exploring MPASS to replace the WARF core in one on forecast. Such, um, so um, that's some of the work that uh, we've been doing since then to try and help NCAR test uh, and uh, push forward um, MPASS into the uh, regional domain as opposed to running globally. Um, so that's that's the goal we're working towards, but first we wanted to see how it would do at uh, CONUS. So we're looking at regional domains here and not nested global domains. So essentially what we came up with was running three different uh, configurations of MPASS. If you went over to Kent's poster yesterday, you saw some of the results from these runs. We run three times daily out to 48 or 60 hours. Uh, we've been doing this since January of 2023, uh, although there's a caveat, we've changed the configuration a lot since then. Um, we've been running in the configuration we are now since about the beginning of May. A three kilometer approximately um, CONUS nest. We're running on NOAA's jet. I think on the first day, there were some questions about how long it was taking and how many cores. Uh, so approximately 180 minutes of runtime, 1,200 cores, uh, 25 second time step. The goal here with our physics setup was to reproduce what the HER and Rufus use so that we're as giving as fair a comparison as we can for MPASS to look at forecast skill. Although the one difference that you'll notice there is the uh, HER NSSL there. Um, obviously, Rufus and the HER don't use NSSL, but we at Warn for our Warn on Forecast runs, that is what we use. So we wanted to see what the NSSL uh, microphysics model would look like in MPASS. We're uh, running convection, MYNN boundary layer, shortwave radiation, RRTMG. And then the, the, the uh, major difference that you'll notice here also is the difference in the initial conditions. And we'll talk about how we were able to get the HER and the Rufus as initial conditions for MPASS because that uh, wasn't an option when we first started running, uh, as well as the uh, the RUC land surface model. That's also uh, not available in the, the uh, canned uh, MPASS currently. So some changes that we did have to make um, along the way, we added hydrometeor uh, to the, both the input file and the lateral boundary conditions. This is particularly important for a short-term forecast. You see a big difference in this in the first three hours of the forecast to help the model spin up convection where it should be. Uh, as you can see, oh, uh, there is the MRMS data and here is the one hour forecast with the hydrometeors and without. So you'll see much better representation of uh, precipitation in, in those early parts of the forecast when you include hydrometeors and in the input conditions in particular. Uh, we also, this is very recent, it's not actually implemented yet. We plan on implementing this change when we get back. Um, we have uh, added in this uh, new uh, soil type that is what the uh, HER uses. Uh, and what I'll draw your attention to here is the purple line in each of these is the old Stasco soil type. And the black line is the BNU, which is new. So you see the, R, the, root, the RMSE isn't changed much, but we do get a pretty big change in the bias. Of course, you exchange, you're getting warmer at night, but cooler during the day here for temperature. But the dew point bias and RMSE are significantly improved when we move to this new soil type. Um, I'd say the impasse is probably um, close to the best uh, bias here for the, the dew point. So that was, uh, a big improvement that we're looking forward to implementing in um, in the next week or two. 
Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we added support for initialization from model data on the Lambert conformal grid, uh, i.e. the HER and the Rufus. That was um, a, a big thing. A lot of these things were not done by us. They were done in really close coordination with uh, Michael Duda and Bill. So we've uh, that's been a big help to have that sort of input from the developers. Um, but at, obviously, at, uh, with one on forecast, we initialize and use boundary conditions from the HER. So that was a really um, important capability that we needed to be able to, to uh, do this kind of work. We also had to add some physics, as I mentioned. We added the NSSL microphysics, uh, which we use in Warren Forecast. Huge thanks to Ted Manzel and House at NSSL for doing that. Uh, the RUC land surface model, I did a lot of that work, but I ran into lots of problems. And uh, Tanya Smirnova, who's the original developer of RUC, was a huge help with that as well. Uh, I just recently, as literally, literally last Friday, uh, got the MYJ uh, PBL and surface layer scheme to work. Um, it, it was my fault. It always is. Um, so um, we're hoping to have that implemented so that we can, as you can see down here on the bottom, this is our, um, this is what our WAS ensembles are like. These are the numbers. They don't matter. It's just to, to give you an idea for all the, the 36 members. These are the basic physics schemes that uh, we'll need to run a WAS like ensemble with MPAS. And the red is the, um, I've outlined the things either we need or did need and had to add. Um, so in particular, we do still have left the revised Mona Nobokov. Um, parameterization because right now it's the original one. Um, hopefully that shouldn't be too bad because the original Mona Nobokov is already in there. So hopefully a lot of uh, code copying uh, as is usual. Um, we do not have plans to add in the RRTM plus the Dudia scheme. Um, we're just going to stick with RRTMG for now. Um, we also added some um, significant improvements to either what's available in the output or how we post-process the data. Uh, we look at a lot of various diagnostics in our output, uh, and we wanted to make sure we could get as many of those as we could. Uh, for those looking to add diagnostics to MPAS, it was very easy. Um, so if you know Fortran, uh, the code is very, very organized, very well documented. It was very easy to figure out how to do. So don't, don't be afraid to do that yourself. I found that to be really, um, really easy to do. Lots of updraft helicity, categorical precipitation, wind diagnostics. Um, you can see this, di uh, as you'll see this link several times today, um, you can see all of the output on the web, although we're still working. It's been a long spring with spring forcing, forecasting experiment and preparing for this. So um, we're, we're still working on getting the output on the, uh, the web, but hopefully by the end of summer, um, you'll be able to see a lot more diagnostics. And in order to get these kind of diagnostics onto the web, we use um, UPP, Unified Post Processing, so which requires the data to look very in a very particular form. And we, in order to use it with our workflow, we had to put MPAS output on a uh, unstructured mesh into a Lambert conformal grid that looked like WORF data. Um, so for that use, um, I created the MPASIT post-processing tool, which you can download at GitHub down there at that link. It takes that data from that irregular grid, puts it onto a file that looks like WORF data, a WORF naming convention. So it will look a lot like what you're used to. So if you're scared of the, the irregular mesh, this makes things a lot easier. It runs in parallel. Um, it runs very quickly. You're not sitting there waiting forever. You can configure what variables you want out. Um, you can, it takes uh, your output grid, if you've ever done WPS and you've created a grid with WPS, it uses those exact same parameters. So you can create whatever grid you have from your output data. Um, so that's available. It's been tested uh, by some folks at NCAR. Um, so feel free to download it, test it. Um, you know, if you have contributions, if you'd like some changes, it's on GitHub. So uh, I would definitely encourage you to use that and uh, contribute. Uh, we also obviously to do these runs daily, we needed a workflow that was easy to use. Um, so we created some bash workflow. We wanted it to be flexible so that we could give it lots of options. Obviously note, this is not flexible for everybody. This is flexible for our uses. It wouldn't just work on uh, any uh, system um, portability so that we could move from NCAR systems to Cheyenne to our local systems. 
Uh, we tested it with several different uh, fixed domains, several different models, different physics options. Um, so this has been um, a lot of work. This a lot of this is Yun Hung's work. He's he's not here today, but this this is why he's um, he he does a lot of this work for us, and it's really instrumental in what we're doing, making sure that we have our a good workflow that that uh, has good fault tolerance and can be restarted and um, can be used out of the box essentially for what we need. So some challenges, hopefully, um, are. I wanted to mention some of these in case to hopefully prevent other people from running into these things and to encourage you to if you have issues, the developers are very helpful. Um, so sometimes there were times where we had these issues, we tried to work on them in house, we spent a week bashing our heads against the wall. We contacted Bill and Michael and within an hour they're like we know what the problem is, and we're like we should have contacted you a week ago. Uh, so. One of, one of the really big ones that uh, you might have heard, uh, if you spoke to Kent yesterday, you might have heard him mention, we were using her grid data, which uh, the winds are uh, grid relative on a Lambert conformal grid, not earth relative. Uh, and even though that information is available in the grid two files, the, um, uh, and WPS, obviously we do use WPS in our, in our uh, pre-processing utilities, WPS can read that information, but MPASS, did not know what to do with that information. So we were putting grid relative winds when it thought it was getting earth relative winds. And that was a fun, that, that one was fun um, to, to diagnose that problem. We were getting crazy waves in the pressure field and we thought there was some massive problem. It was a big problem, but the fix was relatively simple and uh, huge thanks to Bill and Michael for getting uh, that fixed for us. We had some significant issues with IO on JET. This was before the uh, SMEAL um, that Michael and uh, uh, Bill mentioned was available. So thanks to Michael for giving us his branch months before it was available elsewhere so that we could run on JET. We were getting just randomly files that were completely corrupted. So we just lose forecast hours. Uh, we did have problems running at larger time steps and other instabilities, but as Bill has mentioned several times, that was a problem with the, um, with the boundary conditions, some instabilities on the boundary conditions, and that's been fixed. So that obviously has made a will make a big difference for for those planning to use the regional impasse and not having to run at really really low time steps. Challenges that we continue to face, we've uh, again because we needed that SMEAL capability, we had to uh, use a branch that looked nothing like what's in develop now. So we'll have to do some significant work to get all of the changes that we made back onto on top of the develop branch so that we can continue to contribute back hopefully to uh, the the public repository. Uh, we would like to see at some point some version of the impasic capabilities integrated so that you can get your data onto a regular grid outside of straight from um, MPAS. I, I'm not saying that that's going to happen anytime soon, but that would definitely make our workflow easier and other workflow easier that we know it's a big ask, but that's something that we, we hope at some point in the future um, we can move towards that. And as I mentioned, there's still some physics um, and obviously there's a lot of uh, workflow with data assimilation that has to be done before we can truly run our worn on forecast like simulations. Um, so in summary, we have these daily impasse runs uh, using physics similar to her and uh, Rufus. Uh, we've made a lot of contributions to MPASS code base, and they've helped us a lot. It's been a very good collaboration, uh, very helpful. Um, looking forward, hopefully, to something like WARF or MPASS WAFs in the fall. Um, and then uh, the same uh, that Lou mentioned, we'll be looking for a postdoc. You're, you're going to get banged over the head by that in this session. So um, uh, there's some eye candy on the right because there wasn't enough in this talk. So <laughs> I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Larissa. We have time for a question or two. Um, please. Could the MPASIT tool be used to um, convert MPAS Jedi to WARF input? Is impasse Jedi on an unstructured mesh? Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> the, the only thing it assumes is that you know the, it has a, a grid file and then some sort of history or output file. Um, if it's on an unstructured mesh, it could certainly be. You could 
uh, try it and provide contributions if you have to make any changes, but it should it should be easy enough to make the kinds of changes you might need to do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Larissa. Oh, she has a, oh, there's a Zoom question. Oh, jeez. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so they want to know um, if there is an available tool or program to update the soil type and impasse like in WPS or WARF. Um, so we have those contributions in our branch. It like it's it's in it's in their version. It's not in WPS. It's in um, their um, like regional grid, like the init atmosphere. It's in that program in our version. So at some point, I assume we can contribute that back. And because um, it's it's the wharf data. It's the stuff that they. It's the same data set that they use in WPS. I just grabbed it from somewhere that it was available. So um, whenever we contribute that back. That'll be available as an option. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up, we're going to hear from Corey Potman. He's going to talk to us about verifying and comparing forecasts on this system on the HER, RFS, and NSSL impasse models. Hey, thank you. All right. Okay, I'll begin by uh, thanking all of my many collaborators and launch right into this, maybe. All right, so some of this is a repeat of what's been said earlier this session, but uh, the, the three main goals for these uh, verifications and intermodel comparisons are first to evaluate the impasse as a candidate war on forecast system or WAF's uh, die core. Uh, and then assuming that we don't identify any major issues in, in the coming months, to help inform the initial uh, configuration of the, the, the WAFs impasse. And uh, specifically in, in the work I've done so far, uh, I, I've looked at longer lead times um, to kind of separate, try to better isolate the impacts of the different dynamical cores and microphysics and so forth uh, from the impacts of the different model initializations. Uh, and this is to, to identify any more intrinsically impasse type issues uh, that would then be exacerbated by rapid data assimilation. Because as many of you know, uh, sometimes the model warts really manifest once you start uh, assimilating high resolution observations very frequently. Uh, and then more broadly, uh, I intend for this work to support ongoing efforts to compare the HER and the RUFUS, uh, you know, the plan being for the RUFUS to replace the HER and other systems, uh, and also to, uh, to bring MPAS into, into those comparisons. Uh, so the model and observations data uh, used for this work so far, uh, I'll get into the, the various model configurations on the next slide, uh, but here on the right, we have uh, the, a slightly larger version of, of the domain that's used um, for, for the various models. Um, I'm looking at 18 to 26 hour uh, forecast lead times initialized off zero uh, Z, uh, but, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 18 to 26 hour forecasts from zero Z initialized uh, forecast runs. So I'm looking at the day one convectively active period. I'm using 29 cases uh, from last month. And for verification so far, I focus on composite reflectivity primarily. And so I'm, I'm using the uh, NSSL multi-radar multi-sensor or MRMS uh, composite reflectivity product for that. I won't dwell on this too long because uh, Larissa did a, a great job kind of outlining uh, the differences and the motivations for those differences among the uh, various MPAS models. I will note uh, that Lou alluded to this, uh, the Thompson schemes uh, do vary uh, among the models. So there is uh, a bit of a difference there. Um, yeah, and I think that's all I'll say on this slide in the interest of time. Okay, so launching right into some results here I've plotted uh, composite reflectivity percentiles. Uh, we have MRMS in the black line. Uh, HER is orange, which doesn't show up great on this plot. Uh, the RUFUS is uh, green. And then the, the three MPAS models are blue with the different uh, st line styles to, to distinguish between the, the three MPAS runs. Um, so the first thing to note is, uh, not surprisingly, the, the MRMS reflectivity is, is quite a bit lower. So I'm pointing that out to kind of motivate uh, the importance of using a percentile-based approach for this uh, kind of work. Um, uh, 
for you, to, to get the one kilometer MRMS state onto a three kilometer data uh, onto a three kilometer grid, you have to make a number of decisions about how you're going to do that. Those decisions are going to uh, you know, shift this line considerably up and down. And it's not necessarily clear what the best way to do it is. And even that aside, um, we would expect systematic differences between the observations and the, the, the model reflectivity and systematic differences between the, the, the reflectivity climatologies and the various models. And for a lot of types of analysis, you, you just want to ignore those systematic differences. Obviously, depending on what question you're trying to answer, you may want to highlight those differences. But for the analyses that, that uh, I've done so far, I've, uh, attend I've attempted to uh, mitigate those differences um, using a percentile-based approach. And I'm using uh, quasi-arbitrarily the 99.8th percentile. Um, so that gives us uh, an MRMS reflectivity uh, threshold of something like 38 and then something about 45 dBC for the various models. Okay, all of that said, so some of the differences we're seeing between the models, uh, the Rufus uh, runs hotter than the HER and the MPAS models uh, in the 45 to 65 dBC range. And this is something that many of you I'm sure have already noticed. If, if you look at this stuff, it's something that um, SFE participants definitely noticed and Adam will talk more about the SFE results. Um, it's interesting that uh, you, the use of the, uh, the two moment missile microphysics and the MPAS runs uh, results in lower uh, composite reflective, uh, reflectivity values at the, at the higher end of the reflectivity range. Uh, so uh, looking at some storm object stats, this is similar to work that uh, Larissa Reams has done. And this is basically replicating what, what, what she's already done, but now for this, um, uh, for these uh, May, 2023 data. Um, so again, using that 99.8th uh, percentile threshold uh, as part of the object criteria, and then using standard object segmentation criteria, um, uh, to, to uh, identify storms. Uh, so in this first plot, we see the, the max uh, composite reflectivity within storm objects. These are kernel density, density estimates. We see the, the Rufus stands out as a high outlier, not surprisingly, and of course, MRMS is on the low end. The MR, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the, NIS, the NISL microphysics MPAS run is, is an outlier relative, uh, is a low outlier relative to the other to end pass runs consistent uh, with the previous slide. Now, if we look at uh, solidity, and you can get at this using other criteria or other um, uh, properties like object area and, or object eccentricity, and Lursa has done this, um, you can see that um, the HER and the Rufus storms are a bit too blobby. They, they tend to be a little too big, a little too uh, circular uh, compared to reality. It's striking to me how well the, the MPAS runs actually follow uh, the, the MRMS generated objects that, that we use as an approximation for truth. Uh, another percentile plot, we're gonna dip into uh, two to five kilometer updraft helicity here. Um, we see that uh, the HER, not, not surprisingly to many of us, the, the HER uh, updraft helicities are considerably lower. And we would expect this, if nothing else, then simply because the, the Warf ARW heavily smooths the updraft helicity field before its output. Um, the other thing I'll note is that the, uh, the MPAS uh, uh, model that uses the NSSL microphysics has uh, substantially higher updraft helicities at the higher ends than the other two uh, MPAS models. Okay, looking at the uh, convection diurnal cycle, and again, this is for day one. Uh, in both of these slots, we have uh, slides, yeah, plots. Uh, we have lead time uh, on the x-axis. Uh, in the left plot on the uh, y-axis, we have the mean, the daily mean coverage in grid cells of composite reflectivity exceeding that 99.8th percentile. And again, MRMS is the black curve. You can see that um, the three of the models uh, follow the, the, uh, the quote unquote true uh, diurnal cycle pretty well uh, for these 29 cases. Um, the two outliers are the Rufus, which um, has a, a too sharp of a peak and it's an hour too early. Um, and uh, relative to both truth and to the other models. Uh, and then the MPAS uh, with the NSSL microphysics uh, is also shifted an hour early. 
Now we, we get somewhat different looking results if we uh, instead look at uh, storm object frequency. So the daily mean number of storms present at each of these lead times. Uh, we see the HER, which actually almost perfectly matched the MRMS curve uh, for the previous analysis, now has a pretty large uh, frequency bias, especially at later uh, times. Um, and then we see that the uh, positive frequency bias in the RUFUS in increases uh, further uh, relative to the coverage-based analysis. So one thing I thought of that might explain this is, well, are we getting um, differences in the rate of upscale growth? Um, and so the, which would have different impacts on the storm object frequency versus simply the total coverage of high reflectivity. And the answer is yes. So on the left, we have uh, mean total QLCS area as a function of lead time. And on the right, we have the uh, mean uh, QLCS fraction of the total coverage. So in other words, the percentage of that high reflectivity coverage that's, uh, com that comprises QLCSs. Um, and, and both tell a similar story. Uh, the MPAS runs uh, do a decent job of uh, capturing the upscale growth uh, of storms into QLCSs uh, during this period, uh, whereas the, the HER and the RUFUS, uh, that, that upscale growth is uh, not nearly as, uh, as uh, prominent as, as it should be. Okay, looking at uh, fraction skill score, uh, again, for, for the threshold, I'm using this 99.8% uh, uh, 99.8th percentile. I've looked at a range of scales here. I've just plotted 60 and 240 kilometer neighborhoods. Um, we can see that at later times that the HER uh, at both of these scales is uh, doing substantially better than the other models and the NPAS models now are actually lagging behind. Um, and then at longer lead times, I think it's interesting that the HER driven NPAS models, uh, which are these two here, they're actually lagging the, uh, the RUFUS driven uh, model, despite the fact that the uh, HER itself uh, has, has the best uh, fraction skill score at these lead times. Now looking at something a bit different, this is following work that I did in uh, 2019 and 2020, where I uh, identify storms. Um, I then look only at storms that are classified as cell cellular storms. Uh, and then that um, are uh, that are not surrounded by a lot of uh, uh, composite reflectivity. So I'm trying to capture storms that have not, uh, whose environments are not heavily convectively contaminated. And then I plunk 120 kilometer uh, uh, patches uh, on the, the centroids of those storms and then derive statistics uh, that characterize the, the storm environment for the different models. So here I've got a KDE of the uh, spatial 90th percentile of surface base Kate. Uh, over all of these thousands of uh, storm sector patches from each of the models. And we see that the, uh, the RUFUS shows up as an outlier, a low outlier with, with a substantially lower uh, surface base cape than the other models. And this is consistent with what I found in a 2019 paper where the, um, the two FV3 uh, models that were contributed to the 2017 spring forecasting experiment as part of, of the CLUE Community Leverage Unified Ensemble, uh, they also had substantially lower uh, surface base CAPE. Uh, so if we take all of these storm center patches and we do a probability match composite mean over all of them to kind of get at the you know, a spatial representation of the systematic differences in these near storm environments, um, we get something like this. So starting with surface base CAPE, I've got the uh, probability matched mean 10, 30, and 50 dBZ uh, composite reflectivity contours uh, on these. Uh, but the main thing is to look at the, uh, the, the environmental field that I've plotted. Uh, so this uh, shows that that systematically low, uh, I'm losing my pointer here. Oh, that's tragic. Oh no, it's right here. Um, yeah, so, so the systematically lower uh, RUFUS surface base capes, that, that's uh, something that, um, that, that's actually uh, something that occurs, um, that, that's just how to say that. The near storm environment is characterized by lower surface base cape all around the storm on average in, in, the, in the RUFUS uh, versus the other models. And here I've, I've shown the, the, uh, the HER. So pretty large differences. Um, 
Yeah, it's showing up okay. Um, we see much smaller differences in the magnitudes of the um, uh, probability matched mean zero to three kilometer storm relative helicity. I'm a little intrigued by the different storm relative location of the maxima in this field. Um, the HER, you know, we're getting that maximum closer to where we would expect it to be in a storm relative sense in the HER, but I'll, I'll need to take a look at a lot of individual cases to, to see if that's a meaningful result. I suspect it is. Okay, so uh, these are prelim preliminary conclusions, or many of these are anyway. Uh, this work's still early. It's not a gigantic data set. And, and May, it's 29 cases from May, but the, there is certainly less uh, mutual independence between those cases as we would see in a more typical May. Um, but uh, just confirming what other people have found, the, the Rufus uh, composite reflectivity runs hotter than the other models inside of storms. Uh, the HER, but especially the Rufus storms, tend to be too blobby. Um, the impasse uh, best predicts upscale growth. This, this is, I, I don't know that anyone else has pointed this out, and I certainly need to look at more cases just to confirm uh, the objective uh, analysis. But yeah, it appears the uh, HER and the Rufus are not uh, growing storms upscale uh, rapidly enough, and that contributes to the large uh, uh, storm frequency bias we see in those models. Um, the uh, her driven impasse with initial microphysics and the Rufus diurnal peak is about an hour too early. Um, at least as measured by fraction skill score, the her uh, seems to predict storm location the best at later lead times within this uh, 18 to 26 hour period. Um, yet the her driven impasse models actually have the worst FSS uh, later in the period. Uh, um, of all the models. So that's something I need to investigate further. Uh, so again, early work, lots more to do, including uh, expanding the data set to include more cases, uh, looking at uh, uh, longer lead times uh, to see if these results carry over uh, to longer lead times, and then also looking at earlier lead times to try to capture uh, some of the differences arising from the different uh, model initializations and also stratifying the verification, for example, geographically to see if, if some of these uh, uh, model biases and intermodal differences uh, vary substantially uh, geographically. Um, and I forgot to put in the plug that everyone else is putting in for the uh, uh, position, the zero position um, that, that we're looking for, but you can refer to the, the links in the previous talks. And I guess I, I might as well put in a plug like Lou did that I'm always on the lookout for an, an NRC postdoc for, you know, there's, I have a range of uh, topics uh, in the NRC uh, project database. So if anyone's interested in working with me on anything related to uh, the WAS ensemble prediction, predictability or machine learning, uh, uh, please uh, reach out to me. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Corey. We have time for question during the transition here. All right, stop looking at radar scope. <laughs> okay. Um, then, oh, uh, wait. The her forecast you're using, is that directly from NSET? Yeah. I, I wonder if uh, you think it has something to do. You said this blog. Uh, something, whatever, yeah, but, and it's some, something to do with specific diffusion option they're using in their model? That's, that okay, that's not something I've thought of and something I would definitely need to talk to Lou Wicker about. <laughs> okay, thank you, Corey. Um, if, for the very last talk, Wharf Empath Workshop. I have Adam Clark talking about, um, no, he's got a long title, so I'll let you all read it. Adam. Yeah, essentially, I'm going to talk about those three MPAS configurations that the last three talks have referred to. Uh, but I'll be looking at things more from a subjective standpoint in terms of uh, what we saw during the spring forecasting experiment. So the first thing I want to do is just acknowledge uh, all the co-authors on this talk. This was a very collaborative thing. So we're working with folks at the SPC, uh, CRO, um, NCAR, and GSL. Okay, 
So these spring forecasting experiments, if you're not familiar with them, uh, we do them every year. They're held for five weeks in the spring during the peak of the severe weather season, and they're facilitated by SPC and NSSL. So our 2023 SFE was hybrid, uh, and it was actually the first time that we had people there in person since before the pandemic. So in 2019 was the last in person. Uh, we had 50 remote people and 77 in person participants. Uh, there are several goals that we have for doing these experiments, but relevant to this talk, um, we facilitate these experiments to optimize deterministic and ensemble CAMs. Uh, to inform UFS system development. And we use this framework, uh, Corey referred to it, the Community Leveraged Unified Ensemble. Really, this is just a way to coordinate all the different model contributions that we get from uh, the people that contribute them to the experiment. So this is just a plot. It kind of just shows all the unique model comp contributions each year since 2007 in the HWT. The green bars there depict um, kind of the aggregated um, ensembles that that are the uh, the clue. Okay, so MPAS, this was kind of a new thing for 2023. Um, and why did we do it? Well, we want a next generation model core to replace WORF in the Warner Forecast system. And we tried to do this with FV3, uh, but we ran into issues. Too many spurious storms during model spin-up. Uh, this inability to recover from early imbalances, uh, and then uh, what we thought were unrealistic storm characteristics. So we want a model that accommodates one, further refinements and grid spacing. Eventually we want WASPs to be sub one kilometer, uh, advances in data assimilation, uh, and it fits within NOAA's UFS framework, which is kind of beyond the scope of what we can do, but we can at least recommend um, stuff based on the evidence, right? So the first step is to test MPAS at these day one lead times. Um, this table is just showing uh, the different groups of, uh, or it's basically how the clue was configured for 2023. Uh, and the two items that are highlighted there, those are the, uh, the three MPAS configurations run by NSSL. And then I'll also highlight the five member NCAR MPAS ensemble that Craig Schwartz talked about uh, earlier in the workshop. Uh, so those three MPAS configurations, uh, the key here is the two letters at the end. So MPAS HN initialized from her, that's what the H stands for, uses the NISL microphysics, that's what the N stands for. The HT is her Thompson, RT is RRFS Thompson. So initialized from RRFS Thompson microphysics. And these forecasts can be viewed online at cams.nissl.noaa.gov. We don't just run these during the spring experiment, we run them year round. So uh, every, every day those forecasts should be available in this, unless there was an, an issue. So this is just showing the different evaluations that we do in the HWT. So um, these are all, so this is a big part of the experiment. We uh, uh, spend time every day uh, looking at different sets of model output and different tools for severe weather prediction, uh, and we rate them subjectively. Uh, usually it's on a scale of one to 10, where 10 is the best, one is the worst. Uh, and then we allow the participants to also provide feedback alongside those evaluations. And in that feedback, we're able to get really, really useful information uh, about performance characteristics. And so the red highlighted ones here, those are just highlighting the MPAS related evaluations that we did. And I'm only really gonna talk about two of these different uh, evaluations. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, the first one is what we call uh, day one zero Z deterministic flagships. Basically, this is just a way for us to take kind of the best deterministic model configuration from each group that contributes to the experiment and just compare them to each other. And most importantly, compare them to the HER, which is kind of the operational baseline. And this is just showing a six panel chart of uh, these different forecasts. We look at uh, updraft helicity and composite reflectivity, compare it to the observations, 
loop through the length of the forecast, and then assign a subjective rating on a scale of one to 10. Um, so we want people to consider things like the timing of convective initiation uh, in the different models, the convective mode, the, just the general like realism of the systems, uh, displacement errors, that sort of thing. Importantly, we blinded these. And so you see the names of the different uh, configurations at the top, but when we do the evaluations, it only says model A, model B, model C, et cetera. So that allows us to kind of eliminate any implicit or explicit biases against any particular model core that, that people may have. Um, for the flagship comparisons, we only looked at the MPAS RT configuration, so the Rufus Thompson. Uh, because for one, those went out to 60 hours, uh, which we could do because the RRFS from which it's initialized goes out 60 hours. And we had been running that configuration the longest. So we kind of like trusted it the most to be reliable. So what did we find? Um, this is a summary of uh, the distributions of the subjective ratings. And so the Y axis here, Oops, the y-axis is uh, on a scale of one to 10. So 10 is the best. And then I'm also showing the mean subjective ratings below each of these violin plots. So I think it's pretty clear here, Hervey four was the top performer. Uh, and then the differences between it and the other models was statistically significant. Now, MPAS RT was a clear uh, runner up to the HER. Uh, and importantly, it performed better than the RRFS from which it was initialized. So one interesting thing, the RRFS in 2023 did not do well compared to the HER, but the year before it did. Uh, it performed in, in terms of our subjective ratings, it actually performed pretty similarly uh, to the HER. So why is it doing worse this year? I have a couple theories. One is that the radar DA was implemented in 2023 for the RRFS. And so we see these clear problems with intensity biases and spurious convection um, right at the time of initialization and, and a few hours afterward. Um, so I think that radar DA could have actually been degrading the forecasts. Um, and we found similar issues with uh, the FP3 core when we tried to do radar DA in Warner forecast. Also, uh, it was a relatively kind of like quiet, quiescent weather regime with a lot of weekly force severe weather events. Uh, and you know, Lou was showing those results where uh, when the shear was low, that's when you got the relatively higher intensity biases in the RRFS. So it may be that that was more apparent because of the weather regime that we had this year. Okay, so I just wanna show an example case to show how we do these evaluations. Um, so this is just a case from 23rd May, uh, 2023. We have this, uh, and I'm starting at the three hour forecast. So there's this dissipating MCS that's tracking across North Texas. Um, so you can kind of see how it does um, in all these configurations. I should probably point out the bottom right panel here these are the observations. The top middle is the RRFS. The bottom middle is the HER. And then uh, over here is the, the MPAS RT run. So they all get the dissipation of this system pretty well. They even kind of spin up a, a kind of an MCV that you can see from the swirl um, in the radar signatures there. Um, so as we go forward in time, so now we're getting into the early afternoon and we have this uh, kind of loosely organized uh, linear system that forms in West Texas and moves East. Uh, Her gets this quite well. There's a little bit of an eastward displacement error. So maybe you ding it a couple points for that. Um, but the overall look, um, kind of the intensity and the evolution was depicted really well. If you look at the RRFS, 
and then the MPAS RT, which was initialized from the RRFS, you see this spurious convection in central Texas. That's important because that's the environment that this uh, system is moving into. Uh, and then the system that was present in the observations isn't quite as organized um, as it is in the OBS and also compared to the HER. So probably get a lot more dings uh, for those two particular models in this case. Then as we go into the evening hours, you'll see that this thing really grows into a pretty extensive arcing uh, MCS. Look at the HER, the HER does great with this. This is exactly what, what we wanna see. Um, and then the other two models that I'm kind of focusing on for this RFS and the MPAS RT, um, they don't look as good. And I think that's related to the environment downstream from that system, a lot of the instability being wiped out because of the spray of storms that were there earlier uh, in the day. So, so these are the kind of things that we look for that we evaluate when, when we're in the HWT and also when we're forecasting too. If we can pick out a model that's got spurious convection, then perhaps we can improve uh, add value over what the model is saying. So. All right. Oh, and the, in terms of the average scores for this, um, you'll see what the participants um, rated. So they gave the HER a 7.7, .7, all the others four to five. All right. So I also wanted to show, um, in addition to the reflectivity in the UH, we had people uh, subjectively rate the temperature fields. So when they did this, uh, the HER came out on top. Um, but the RRFS actually came in second this time with the MPAS RT falling uh, behind that. So we also wanted to know, well, what were you even looking at when you rated these temperature forecasts? Um, and so um, this is just a sample of some of the uh, answers that people gave. So it's really useful to do this because, uh, you know, if you're just objectively verifying, you know, you don't know like, okay, maybe west of the dry line, there's a warm bias, maybe east of the dry line, you have the opposite bias. So in different types of environments, you can see different types of biases or, or errors. And so uh, we ask people that, what, what are you looking at when you're doing this uh, evaluation? So they look at things like boundary placement, um, the, the evolution of the boundaries, the progression, um, the temperatures and areas where there was conductive initiation to see if it was you know, off, because obviously that's gonna have an impact. Um, so that kind of thing. So um, here are the results for dew point and surface base Kate. Uh, for dew point, our RFS actually came out on top. Her was in second, and then MPAS RT was in third. And Cape was a little bit different. Uh, the her does really well with Cape, um, and so does the MPAS RT. Although it's quite a ways behind uh, the her. Uh, and then the RRFS was in third place there for, for the CAPE. Um, if you combine all the different things that we evaluated in this flagships comparison, uh, we can get kind of an aggregate you know, mean subjective rating. And so that's what I have pictured here. Um, so the HER comes out on top it is the clear winner. We are not um, getting that close to beating the HER yet. Um, MPAS RT in the aggregate, performs a little bit better than the RRFS, which is important, I think, because that's the model that it's, it's initialized from, and it's doing slightly better than it. Uh, and then also note, um, I haven't talked about them a lot, but these two uh, other FV3 configurations from GFDL and NASA were consistently the, um, you know, the lowest uh, rated configurations. Okay, so that's the flagships. Now I want to talk about uh, comparing the three impasse configurations to each other. Um, so same type of thing as for the flagships. Um, now recall that it was the RT impasse configuration that was in the flagship comparison. So let's see how the her initialized ones did. Uh, so it turns out that in the subjective ratings, and this kind of is opposite to what Corey found with the objective stats. So I can't really explain the, the difference here, but in the subjective stats, the HER initializations came out on top. So the HER HN right here uh, was the most highly rated and then the HT um, came in second. And in hindsight, I wish we would have compare, compared the HN directly to the HER, but we didn't. But if you look at this Delta, um, you can kind of infer that uh, 
if we would have, I think we would have seen pretty similar performance in terms of the subjective ratings uh, to the HER. All right, so what's going on with these different configurations? And, and really, I just picked out some comments about uh, why the HN looked better. So things like placement mode and intensity, uh, the storm evolution, the organization and the structure, um, the stratiform region, the structure of um, you know, bow echoes, that's what people noted when they rated the, the HN as being uh, the best one. Um, and this is just an example. Um, so the upper right shows the HN and then below it is the observations. Obviously this is a better forecast than the HT and the RT that have way too extensive uh, regions of convection. All right, now what is going on with this you know, Rufus versus her initializations? Well, it's pretty clear to me at least that these uh, errors in the RT uh, runs are being inherited from the RRFS. So this is just a one hour forecast showing the RRFS on the left, her in the middle, OBS on the right. Um, RFS is too hot, spurious storm right here. Uh, her looks better, magnitudes um, look um, more, <laughs> more comparable to OBS. And then if you look at the one hour forecast from the MPAS runs, that are initialized from those models, they just inherit these biases. So uh, if you look at the RT run one hour forecast, it looks almost the, the exact same as the RRFS, too hot and you have the spurious storm. So obviously that's gonna you know, impact things later into the forecast. Okay, I'll wrap it up. So um, yeah, this is just driving home what I, what I just said. So I'll skip this so we can uh, finish it up. Um, the takeaway, I'll just go to the takeaway. We made some pretty good progress, I think, with MPAS over a very short period of time. So big credit to the developers at NCAR and also NOAA management for supporting the work. Uh, and then, Corey, you're going to be in big trouble from NewsRat for not showing this. I'm going to tell her. <laughs> but I have to advertise the, the positions that we have um, open. So um, there you go. Definitely let us know if, uh, or you know, see that website. So anyway, thanks. Thank, thank you, Adam. I think uh, we're we're running over a bit, and the ice cream we don't want it to melt. So please uh, talk to Adam during the break over ice cream. And well, w welcome back, everyone. I, I hope you all enjoyed your your ice cream or fruit bar or whatever you had, and uh, checked the radar. We we missed the big storms and went south and north of us, which is often the case. Um, so, so to start off this discussion session, I'm going to present a few slides, and it's just a small number, to give you an idea of, of where we are and where we think we're going, both in the near term and some of the things we have in the queue that we hope to be able to move forward with in a little bit longer term. And But just to, to remind you, we, we just came out with a new release, so if you're thinking of starting any new projects, uh, jump on that release. Importantly, in that release are some updates to the regional impasse, and we just saw a number of talks that highlighted that. And, and the point I'd like to make is it's robust, it's running daily, and it's solid. So, so if you're going to think about trying regional applications, this new version is the one to use. And, and I'll also say if you run into problems with it, regional or global, please get back to us with those problems because that, that's how we know they're out there and can try to address them. Um, there are a number of reasons to go to that. Uh, you get both global and regional capabilities and the global is solid with that, with that mesh that doesn't have pole problems, et cetera. Uh, we're getting efficiency very similar to WARF. Uh, the defaults in the nameless you see are kind of very conservative time steps. You can probably push that time step. I'm thinking of putting together a document that we'll put on the MPAS webpage that'll give you recommendations for how to do that. Uh, you also get variable resolution, but I also wanna point out is that we do have a GPU capability. We haven't merged it in yet. I'll talk about that in the next few slides, but that's our future for GPU, for uh, community-based open source implementation of an atmosphere model with that capability. MPAS is the code we're looking at. It's not gonna be WARF. Uh, so I, I just want to talk about a few things before I open it up. Uh, we do have work going on to bring to the weather community, our weather community here, the capability to run an Earth system model. You heard about a little bit about that with Earthworks. Uh, Dave Randall talked about that on the first day of the workshop. 
I'll talk a little bit about the GPU pathway. And then I'm going to specifically point out some things that we expect to release soon and that we have in, in process. So first off, we are MPAS is in the climate model here at NCAR and CESM, the community earth system model. We haven't released it formally, but it's the earth system model is on GitHub. So if you knew where to go, you could get it. Um, but there are a lot of issues with it right now, in particular, running it for weather applications. If you want to want to run high resolution right now, the infrastructure associated with CESM has problems. It effectively doesn't allow us to run at high resolution, and we're trying to solve those infrastructure problems. We're also working on the physics inside of that uh, system. We think we can tune the physics to give us reasonable representations of convection uh, when we're down, for example, at convection permitting. Uh, but again, the, the infrastructure is not allowing us to quite run at high resolution yet. People are looking at it. Hopefully, we'll be able to to release that capability sometime soon, but I have no idea when soon is because it's out of our hands in terms of uh, those of us in MQ. Okay, on Tuesday, you heard from Dave Randall about Earthworks. This is a, a very, a, pro, a program that overlaps quite a bit with SEMA. Uh, this is again using MPAS, the dynamical core from the atmosphere inside of CESM, but also with the ocean dynamical core that's in MPAS uh, together and going to GPUs. So there's a lot of synergy between SEMA and Earthworks. We're taking advantage of that, uh, hopefully to move things along more quickly. If, if we can't get the infrastructure fixed for SEMA, Earthworks is not gonna work either. So uh, this is an NSF funded project. So it has a lot of visibility. So all this pressure to, to find out whether the climate model infrastructure will work for us and whether uh, is we're going to find out soon, I would say. So uh, as Dave mentioned, there's already configurations of earthworks that are out there. I think for any of our weather applications, to be honest, those configurations are pretty useless. But I think future configurations, I think that will run at higher resolution may actually be, be interesting to use. And certainly when we get to that GPU capability, if we can solve these other problems, this can be a really powerful tool for us. Okay, in terms of uh, the GPU implementation we have, if you remember, uh, it's not in the version eight release, it's actually on a branch. And if you, if you go to the MPAS webpage, the download page, you'll see instructions on how to pull it down and run it. Uh, we've looked at it. I think we've learned a lot in the course of its production. A lot of things that we'd like to have, or some things that we'd like to have done differently. And essentially what we're going to do is re-implement both in a cleaner manner and for more generality and flexibility. And that would probably constitute our next major release. So we can certainly see that as a version nine uh, somewhere down the road. I, I think it's a question for us in terms of the resources we can bring to bear. To, to do that re-implementation, uh, that's going to determine the timeline. Uh, M-cubed and, and our weather community model uh, section here at NCAR, we, we, we actually have uh, significantly more software engineering resources as of these this last year where we brought a number of people online. Uh, those of you who remember, Dave Gill left a while back, so that was a big hit. And uh, so I think we're going to be making progress on this, but it really depends upon how much time we can devote to it. Uh, one of the things, of course, is now we have a machine here at NCAR, Duratio, which is actually running now for science. It's in its acceptance phase, so there's a few big projects that are running on it. Uh, it's going to open up to the general community, I believe, early September, and they're on, they're, it looks like they're pretty much on schedule. That has a major GPU component to it, about 20% of the machine is GPU enabled. So that's a big resource for us. And it also provides us impetus to get these GPU systems uh, running smoothly at scale, which is what we need to release it to the community and for you to be able to make good use of it. So uh, we'll be doing that also. Um, probably the, the release branch first that currently exists, but slowly release it into our, our main release as we bring those GPU capables, capabilities along. Okay, we've uh, released version eight and we have a, a new release schedule in the sense that our new release paradigm in that we are going to release things that come in uh, 
when they're ready. We're not going to hold them back for a, a yearly release. When we have a significant capability ready, ready it goes out. So uh, there are, are several you heard about this past week. One is, uh, Rosie talked about the aquaplanet configuration, um, primarily initialization, but there's just a little bit more of that. Uh, that's going to come out hopefully later this summer. We had hoped to get it out in version eight, but we were just a couple of weeks behind. And of course, the workshop occurred. So, so, so that's going to happen soon. Um, there's a lot of work we did to accommodate uh, the interface with the data simulation system, JEDI, that Jake talked about uh, earlier this week. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the infrastructure. Uh, there's a two-stream I.O., which I want to which I want to mention, and that uh, it makes the restart files much smaller because now the restart files only contain effectively state as opposed to state plus all the grid information and stuff that we can recompute or read from a previous previously existing file. So a two-stream I.O. capability will come out, and that'll be really nice for conserving disk space and the amount of things you have to push into and out of the model. Uh, the last thing I want to mention in that release is that we're also running a, we're testing a, an ability to decrease the time step at the very earliest parts of the integration. I think a number of you have had the experience where if you're doing uh, data simulation, so you put in increments and the increments are maybe not uh, what the model likes in terms of balance. Uh, sometimes that can cause instabilities. Sometimes we see that just in cold starts from other analyses. So, so this will give us uh, an ability to reduce the time step for the early part of the integration. Um, and you can also uh, look at this as potentially it'll provide the hooks if we want to ultimately go with an adaptive time step. So, so that'll be part of that release. And I think that's gonna happen uh, end of the summer, uh, somewhere in the fall, early October is what we're looking at. We also have a, a version of NOAA MP uh, that we've been testing. And that's also going to, to go out uh, bef certainly before the end of the year, hopefully sometimes this fall and, and not till, till later in the year, uh, holding off that long. Again, we are going to make these releases when they're ready uh, individually. We're not bringing them all together in a single package. And what we'll do is we'll announce it on our website and we'll be sending our usual reminders uh, or notifications to everybody. If you've registered to download Wharf, you'll get one of those notifications, but we'll make it very prominent on our web pages too. There's a, a number of things that we're also working on, many of them that you heard about in the workshop this week, uh, physics and, and nudging from the EPA. Um, that is, we've got a number of pull requests we're gonna be working through. Uh, and I haven't put a timeline on that only because uh, that's in part uh, the work that's being done outside of NCAR, so it's harder for us to gauge how long it'll take for the whole process to work, but I expect that's going to come out somewhere before the end of the year, but we'll see. Um, we have the physics from the NSSL configurations you've heard about, particularly as they move towards bringing that into their one-on forecast system for testing. They want to bring in other physics. You heard about the ensembles, the physics ensembles they have. There are other groups that are interested in using MPAS, uh, weather services else outside of the US that are also interested in physics ensembles. So I think there's gonna be a fair amount of physics activities in terms of bringing in components that groups need to use for their configurations that we're going to see over these next few years, certainly. Uh, Laura talked about the shared physics repository we're putting together for the physics that we use in WARF, MPAS, and CM1. Uh, that's gonna come online uh, somewhere in the not too distant future. Uh, and those physics will have the CCPP interface to them. Uh, to remind you again, if you're thinking about physics, we would like to, well, we, we're gonna require uh, going forward that, that new physics have that CCPP interface. And, and they would go into a shared physics repository Although being in the shared physics repository does not imply that they actually run on all three models, but that they could uh, if the interfaces that are used by the other models uh, adapt them and, and bring them in. I mentioned uh, GPU configurations for a ratio. As soon as we get on and get things running, actually we are already trying to run as part of some of these scientific, the big science projects that run during the acceptance period. 
uh, once we have configurations that make sense to release, and that shouldn't be too long down the road, we will release those configurations. Running on GPUs is a major endeavor. Um, it's it's not easy for a, a non-software engineer, like someone like me to actually, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I would just go to Michael and my software engineers to figure it out. So, so, so really having those configurations, I think is gonna be crucial for people coming in to, to, to make use of the GPUs, at least at the start. And the last thing I, well, the, the last capability I wanna mention is uh, an LES capability. I've been working, Jimmy and I have been working with a few other folks in MCUBE, NEDPAT, Nedpat and a few others. Uh, we've brought uh, two LES subgrid uh, turbulence models in, a Smagorinsky, a 3D Smagorinsky, and a 1.5 or a prognostic TKE model in there. Uh, we have those, uh, they're, they're not terrain enabled yet, but that's not a big uh, hurdle to overcome. And we are going to likely release those somewhere down the road. There's already a few uh, groups that are interested in that capability. So that's effectively already there. We have test results that look good and we just need to expand a little bit and then merge it into our system. On the Documentation side, we are talking about putting together a contributor's guide. So you'll see that hopefully in the not too distant future, because as we've mentioned now, everything comes in through pull requests. Uh, we would like to have people whom are considering contributing code to us to talk to us first uh, before they do major coding so we can work with them to uh, help them uh, know how they should code things so the pull requests are easy to push through. Uh, and that would be part of a contributor's guide. Uh, we've started work on a technical note. Those of you who have used the technical note WARF, which explains in detail how the model works, we have a similar idea for doing that for MPAS, and I'm starting to, to write uh, the DICOR side of it now, for example. Um, where it will differ from the WARF technical note is that our intent is to have the technical note reference the code, specifically reference the code, and have the code reference back to the technical note. So that's going to be uh, the difference in the technical note. I think it'll be perhaps uh, more useful to everybody uh, when that's done. And, and we are coming, we are updating both the WARF and MPAS web pages such that they sit in the same place, have the same look and feel, and can cross reference each other when needed, et cetera. Now, what I've left out here are, are critical needs that a number of you have talked to me about and to others here at, in our crew. We, we appreciate our, the analysis and post-processing capabilities for MPAS are, are limited right now. Uh, you've heard a lot about what some people have already put together. We, we really, really do encourage contributions from the community in this area because that's a, a big aspect of a modeling system. And it's the part that uh, we've uh, struggled to find resources to, I think, adequately address. Um, but that's something I think the community is in a really good spot to, to contribute things back. And hopefully that'll help, uh, that'll help grow the capabilities there. And we also heard uh, quite a bit about mesh generation tools. We've in the past told you it's very expensive to generate meshes. And then you hear talks where it doesn't sound like it's very expensive to generate meshes. Um, that could that could well be the case. Um, Michael and I have talked about this a lot. Uh, one thing we don't know is how uh, how good the quality of the mesh is in various in various measures of how smooth and well constructed the meshes the final meshes are to the accuracy of the solutions. And that's something I think we're going to look at in in the near future with these other groups that are doing mesh generation and seeing if we can get together and put together some easier to use tools that are less expensive and maybe get a, an idea of what we can get by with in terms of uh, functioning meshes. Because the meshes that we release out of the NCAR pages, they are very well conserved and they're very clean, clean, clean mesh, meshes, maybe much more so than they need to be. Um, so hopefully with these other tools, we can explore a little bit of how that works. So that's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to open things up with. And if anyone has anything they want to, to comment on, suggest, critique, uh, please, uh, the floor is open and there's microphones here and there. And, and we don't have that, that, that squishy cube microphone, right? Okay. 
So, so if you want to make comments, please uh, stand up to, please, please come up to the microphones and make them. Um, particularly if you have very specific things you'd like to see at high priority, we'd like to hear about it. Please. I have, I have two things. Uh, first one is under critical needs. You mentioned that you'd like community contributions on analysis and post-processing capabilities. Is there a preference toward the language of whether it's Fortran, R, Python, whatever? Is there some something that's preferred here or is it you'll take what you get? Does anyone have, have anything they particularly want to say about that? Now, I, I can say, of course, silence. <laughs> I know Fortran because I'm old. Same, same um, here. I, I, and but, we're a dying breed. And I know a, a, a enough Python to get in trouble where, where I need to talk to my software engineers to fix things typically. I haven't heard anything, anybody say anything good about R. R, R, yeah. But um, so, uh, so, 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 so I think we're, we're willing to, to accept most things, but particularly the, the directions we seem to be going in are largely Python, uh, Python based. So that's would be the top of my list. Yeah, and I, and the second thing I'll let the, I'll let you address that. But the second one is I was going to comment on the first bullet that my colleagues at EPA are, are really motivated to get the physics and nudging done, and they will be they will be happy to work with you as fast as possible because they don't like retrofitting it, which they've been doing since like version four. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you address the R Python Fortran thing. Yeah, I, I also have nothing good to say about R. So, you know, apologies for any of the R users in the room. Uh, that's just not my thing either. But um, the yeah, no, but we take R and we take everything. I think is the deal because we have users that use all of these platforms. Um, and but you know, we are we've got staff putting out stuff in Jupyter Notebooks, which is I think really exciting and really. Uh, ups the level of accessibility for more users and that's for impasse and and so yeah the the uh landscape of impasse post-processing is not as mature as wharf because wharf has been around so long and that maturity comes from the community so really looking to have everybody bring in stuff and then i think we're still figuring out how to how can we get the word out if you've got a great package I think we have teams within the lab that are looking to see like, how can we, we're not gonna be the gatekeepers for that, but how could we at least put a place together that people can communicate to each other about post-processing? So, thanks. Okay, I, I haven't been keeping track of who stood up when, so. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we are investing resources uh, in the Developmental Test Pet Center to work uh, have met plus be able to work directly with the unstructured grids there's there's because it's a broad collaboration there are multiple unstructured grid models that are interested in having that capability so we're bringing all those efforts together and hopefully we'll be able to get that out sometime soon so that'll be a, a like a post-processing type capability does that include the the se core which is unstructured in cesm is that part of that um they're trying to make it general enough, I believe, right. okay. because the UK Mat Office is also investing in this effort and they have an unstructured grid. So, okay. so hopefully they're gonna be able to come up with a general enough solution that it will be multi-purpose. So anyway, thanks. This is a bit of a shift away from that. And this may be a silly question. So I hope this is the right place for those. Um, what I see is the biggest strength of MPAS is really the smooth refinement of the grid as you go away from the area of interest out to the globe. So you kind of get the global model without the computational expense. And I really love the idea of having a shared physics repository for WORF MPAS CM1. But my question is, wouldn't any physics package in MPAS by nature have to be sufficiently scale aware? And do you see physics packages in WERF just not working in impasse due to the fact that you you may have, uh, for example, a grid that permits convection that expands out to one that you, you need a, a parameterization in. Whereas in WERF, you just handle it with the different nest. I, I think they'll both work because the scale awareness usually just looks at the local grid size. So in WERF, it'll just see, okay, I'm on a nest, so I'll do a little differently. So I think Wharf would actually like to use that scale awareness as opposed to having to choose to turn off a convective parameterization on the three-kilometer mesh. That's 
for example. Right, I guess like, so for all the, the uh, would all the physics that currently have no scale awareness to them, would those, do you see those porting smoothly over into the MPAS framework or would those have to be re kind of configured? Well, if you want to use them on a variable resolution mesh, they would absolutely need to be configured if you wanted good solutions. So for example, the TICA that was in the previous release, which wasn't scale aware, you run it down at three kilometers. Why? Because it's gonna take over the convection anyway. So, so, so if you want to have that capability at convection permitting resolutions, yes. But if you're, if you're just running on hydrostatic scales, maybe you want a physics package that you think is very, very good there. It isn't scale aware that you include it. So, so, so we're not going to require scale awareness for, for physics contributions. Cool. But, but we would certainly document that you shouldn't run this at, across the, the variable resolution. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Everybody and his mother is running MPAS at down to convective permitting resolution. But what's the solution for a coupled ocean for us at this point? I mean, that was a problem several years ago. Is, is there a solution to have? A, an ocean model that we could run paired with a high resolution impasse. Right. So five or six years ago, we identified the solution was to bring impasse in the CESM and run coupled with the ocean and CESM. Right. And as you can see, we're not there yet. Right. Um, and because I, I, I tried to make, made as clear a statement as I could, it's because the infrastructure right now will not support high resolution simulation. Now, the idea is the infrastructure should be able to, so why doesn't it appear to? And the software engineers don't quite have that answer, don't have answers for us yet, but they're looking at it closely and testing and trying to fix it. Because we desperately need this capability. We do, and, I agree. Well, this earthworks business, is that, do they have a solution? Well, they're using the same infrastructure, SEMA, and and we're using we're we're okay. we're running we're, we're essentially the, the overlap is so big that I don't okay. I don't think about it. do I work for Earthworks or SEMA okay it's the same thing as far as I'm concerned so we're both stuck so there's a lot of pressure on the on the climate model uh, the software engineering group to find to find out what's going on with the infrastructure it's a memory problem it runs out of memory anyway this needs so, this needs a lot of priority it should. if you want to do things like simulate NJOs or you name it. You know, right. we, we absolutely desperately need this. I, I, okay. I, I'm I in complete agreement. I mean, we're in complete agreement. I, I um, was curious if there's any sort of coordinated approach that could be taken to identify maybe some of the more mature capabilities that are available on the wharf side that, you know, maybe somebody's retired or like the postdoc that developed them or the expertise that came from the agency or university that put them there might be gone. Like, is there... Maybe a way to identify a, a, a elements of, of the WARF framework that don't necessarily have a champion behind them that we could do like a help wanted community board that you know maybe somebody else could step up. I, I don't know who wants to address this, but we we went through that exercise. Geez, I used to, I'd, say, I'd say somewhere before COVID, but it could have been a decade ago, but it could have been three years ago. I, I'm kind of at that stage where. I, a couple of years ago, could have been a decade ago, where we actually put out a, uh, we put out a, a survey, you know, who's using what physics and pretty much somebody's using almost all of them. But, but then we said, well, we're thinking of taking out this, this and that. And we communicated that and that stirred up a lot of uh, people who were unhappy that we were taking out their favorite scheme. So it, we kind of came to the conclusion that it was more effort to try to identify which ones to take out and to pull them out than was worth the, the community angst of us doing this. And it wasn't obvious we were going to save much because if you look at the regression test for WARF, for example, we don't test everything in right. WARF, absolutely not. And we can't. So it, it just didn't seem for WARF that it was worth our time to do that kind of cleanup. And I don't think we're gonna let that happen with MPAS, of course, in 10 years, if, if I'm still standing here in 10 years and you see 100 physics packages, then we'll just laugh about it. And, sure. oh, but, yeah. but yeah, that's, <laughs> so the idea is not to let what happened with WARF happen with MPAS and to try to focus more. But we also know that a lot of the applications, people want to use physics ensembles as much as I cringe at that. Um, 
okay. That they, when you do the test, they show that they, they add value, they give you spread. So, so I think we're going to have to support that and support a variety of physics packages. So, but, but hopefully we can stay on top of them and hopefully we can unify our physics and be pulling physics from developers repository. So we're going to have a physics repository here in MCubed with our shared physics. But if, uh, for example, for MYNN or something, we'd like to pull that from what's the authoritative development repository perhaps from the DTC, for example, and, and for other physics, wherever the developers are maintaining it. That, that's our ultimate goal, single source across the board. All right, great, thank you. So I just feel like I have to say something about scale awareness um, and I, I yeah. will struggle to be diplomatic as I usually do, but Scale awareness is more aspirational than operational in a lot of these cases. And um, if you are actually looking at an application that needs to run across the critical range of scales. So if you, for example, in the boundary layer are anywhere between three kilometers and 60 kilometers, it probably doesn't matter. If you really think you want to run below a kilometer, you probably better know what you're doing. And you probably shouldn't just trust that something that's called scale aware is going to work. Um, I don't know anything about microphysics or cumulus schemes, but I can't imagine that it's really different. So just because something is labeled scale aware doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that the designer designed it to do what you need it to do. And it doesn't mean that what the designer designed it to do is, was correct. So yeah, just, it's a hard problem. And a lot of the solutions that are out there, um, it's very immature, let's just say. Agreed. I'm not a physics developer, so. Kind of, kind of related to Cliff's question. And um, yeah, in GSL, we'd like to adopt MPAS 2 and start testing on it. And I'd be willing to pick it up for you know our participation in this wind forecast improvement project coming up. But it would it would hinge upon it being able to be coupled to a wave model, specifically Wave Watch 3. Otherwise, it couldn't be a candidate for this. I, I, I think it'd be a great opportunity to actually adopt it for that. But um, I, without knowing the complexities of coupling to a wave model, would there be any support for it? Would there, is there any plans to have this uh, supported with MPAS? Not directly that I'm aware of at this point. Chances of it happening in the next six months would be low. Uh, I, I would say zero. Yes. Okay. Uh, unless it's unless it's a really trivial thing, and I don't think it is. So probably not. Um, Couples the wharf from couplers. So I don't, I'm not sure of how general these couplers are between what you use in wharf and do, does wharf use a, a formal coupler for this, or or is it just run on the wharf grid? No, it's is that it's so? So it's not it doesn't require a coupler. Does someone know? MCT, Coast does. Ah, uh, MCT, okay. Um, that work for MPAS? Uh, that's WARF. That's, that's the coupling technology that was replaced in the climate model with the the nuopsy cmeps um so so ncar has moved towards the towards what uh, i think the ufs is using actually or is going to use for whatever its coupling technologies is so so that would be that would be what what we would be using right now we're we're hooked up to it in the climate model the climate model doesn't have a wave model in it right now that I that I know of, and that's not the way we would want to access it anyway for the kinds of applications you're talking about. 
Sounds like it might be a possibility, though. It, it, it does, it does. And, and I, I think we would be happy to consider uh, that coupling technology, given the fact that it's well supported, it's got a long, it's got a good future in front of it, and it should be fairly solid. So we, we should, we should talk about those possibilities more for sure. Um, so especially in the last session, we saw some nice examples how MPAS can be leveraged for severe weather applications. Um, how about tropical cyclones? Knowing that 95% of all the numerical studies on TCs that you find in MWROGS use the vortex following capability of WORF. And um, how do we bring that or a similar capability into MPAS? Because I think we're, the hurricane community is really, they need the moving nest. Well, they've been needing the moving nest. And that's one of the big hurdles for the TC folks too. Is, is this two way? Yes, that's two way, yeah. That's a lot of infrastructure that's needed to support that inside of a, a modeling system. And that's, we, we have not uh, committed to, to do that. Um, we, we have wharf. Uh, and the second, uh, yeah. second thing, um, um, talking about climate, weather, bringing them closer together, I think we're we on the weather side, we're a little bit in the wild west in terms of variables and, and compliancy. And what would be really good if MPAS had a CF compliant time variable. Um, a lot of the post-processing tools that the climate, climate folks are using, you know, they, they're CF compliant, they, they ask for that compliancy so you can easily, uh, more easily run the post-processing tools. And I, from my own work, I'm talking to people and they say, well, MPAS, you have this X time variable, that's, of, that's no use. So I think putting a CF compliant numeric time variable in the output is, would, would help a lot. Okay, I, I would suggest, uh, let us know about that or remind us of that or? I think I mentioned it before. Well, put, put it in a form or something. Uh, so, so these are easy, these are very easy things for us to do. So, so please just let us know and, and that would be easy for us to, to take care of. Sure, absolutely. The office is down, so. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, yep. But, but Michael's the person that you're gonna to talk to, not me. Yeah, that's right, four offices. I was ironically gonna ask about the same question on the moving nest um, capability and whether that's even something that's so technically far afield that we just don't wanna consider that for impasse or is that just? There's a substantial amount of infrastructure sure. that you have to put in place to, to deal with that. And it's not something we, we just wanted to, to adopt. Um, we have that capability in WARF, and I, and I know that's like, okay, we're, we're moving away from WARF. And, right. and, and it's, I want to say it's a niche community, but it's technology that, all right, it's been around forever. We, we, have, we have good codes that do it. Uh, WARF, uh, co-amps, then, okay, these models do it. And, and I think that's the models that that community should probably maybe, maybe stay with. Um, personally, in terms of TCs, I kind of view global variable resolution ensembles and, and the moving nests are okay. But, That's fair. Okay. But yeah, it really is the, the amount of effort it would take to implement it and the amount of code it would introduce would really grow. Uh, yeah. If you, if you look at, if you look at wharf and you look at the code that supports nesting moving and everything, and you look at MPAS, the MPAS is so much smaller, so much cleaner, and, and we'd like to maintain that if we can, particularly given we have those capabilities and other modeling systems that everyone can access. Uh, maybe not co-amps, but at least you could, WARF is there. So that's. Thanks. Well, on that subject, I, I know NCAR doesn't have any plans for moving nests, but there are ways of, when you have a refined grid, you can rotate it. Um, maybe by roughly one grid length on the finest grid uh, every time. And um, it wouldn't conserve because you're doing interpolations. You, you can't rotate it exactly and keep all the grid points the same place, but you can, you can in some way capture most of the needs of a moving nest by having a, a 
the same grid, but just rotating it and then just shifting things and right interpolations. Yep. Then all your static fields have to be. That's the other issue with yeah, that's, warp that's, as well. That's, that's a big issue. issue. The terrain um, has to be shifted to. Okay. Lou, Lou, I'm going to hold off. There's a there's a Zoom question or comment. Um, uh, there are people asking, uh, oh, they're supporting the idea to make a um, NPAS app output CF. CF compliant. It's the CF compliancy of. Still now it works, but still <laughs> now the move to N And we make it a CF. That's the double stage. So, so, so we can make it CF compliant. Is it much work for us to do so? And and is it a backward compatibility thing with? Yeah, probably some of that too. Okay, so we'll put that on the list with the time variable, and then we'll we'll, we'll see when we can uh, we can push that out. We've heard that before. Lou, yeah, just one quick comment on that. I was just with. Larissa's and pass it uh, post processing. It's probably possible just to use if you want to go to the Cartesian. Then it probably would be very simple. I think warp variables are almost already CF compliant, right? So if the end pass it utility isn't quite there, it probably wouldn't be that hard to do that. So at least you might maybe the raw mesh isn't perfect. Yeah, it works with UPP. So there may be some there may be some capability there if, if you're. If you want to look at the, I mean, it's hard to look at these grids other than just sticking in on a Cartesian mesh for a lot of our tools. So anyway, I just had a comment about this. I mean, because I think about the hurricane problem in terms of UFS and all that. I think there's two solutions. If you want a two-way nested uh, interactive hurricane simulation, then just run the global nested, the global stretch grid thing and just run it. Yes. Is it going to be cost you more? Yeah. But I think one of the things that a, a GPU version will get you is that you'll be able to run these denser meshes over the over the globe. And if you start thinking about trying to do GPUs with nesting with multiple levels in there, it's going to be a mess. And if you don't want to run it with more two way feedback, then I think you just somehow figure out a way to do a workflow where you have the coarse mesh throwing the boundary conditions out for your regional mesh and that can do it. So I don't think there's really a huge impediment here. It's, it's certainly not the impediment of trying to move a, a, a mesh across these, the, one of the cube sphere interfaces that they're doing, trying to mess with in FP3. So I, th I think there's two ways to do this problem. And honestly, yeah. I think we will benefit from not ha by, by having smoothly, I mean, for the two-way interactive, long forecast, feedback, all that stuff, I think the impasse mesh is the perfect thing to do. It, it, it's going to be expensive, but this, think about the fact that the code will be simple enough to GPU wise, and that will, I think will pay for itself. Any other comments? Any votes for what we should work on first here? I... Quick question about stochastic physics that hasn't been mentioned yet. Ah, yes, okay. Curious to hear if there are any plans to transfer that over from WORF. We've done a lot of work at GSL on SPP, uh, on the WORF framework with Judah Burner, and recently in the FE3 LAM, the regional FE3, to get SPPT, Shum, Skeb, and SPP uh, running. So for single physics ensemble configurations, it's really important. So, so we, we've had a number of discussions with Judith and a number of false starts trying to actually get that going. Um, one, one thing is the, uh, the need to have a uh, spherical harmonics transform running to, to, get, the, to get the perturbations. Uh, I, I would like to put in some recursive filtering or something else. Uh, actually, that would that potentially would scale because that approach doesn't scale. Um, I, I think a lot of it is just finding the people who have the time to do something, wh whether it be implementing the, the current techniques with the spherical harmonics or or coming up with something new. So, so it really is a time and prioritization thing. But well, we hear about it more and more, of course. So, so, so it's not on this list, but there is people thinking about it. Um, I have a short question. Are we stuck with ungrid forever? 
I think you have to ask Noah that question, right? Is that where that came from? Oh, oh. Well, actually, so I'm not the person who can answer that. Who, who can? So I take it the answer is yes. <laughs> We're stuck with it. Okay. I've heard the European Central changing their mm. European Central changing their grid format in the near future. So that's another headache for people. I hope. Um, the other thing that comes up in regional climate is uh, spectral nudging, which they would like because you would like to control your simulation on the large scale while um, while having a free running fine region like the US. So the regional climate, you often use spectral nudging to keep things on track when you have a reanalysis, when you're forcing your simulation to the reanalysis. So that will be something that's not yet in MPAS, but I think some people will be asking for. I, I'd like to do a wavelet decomposition in place of, a, again, a spherical harmonics, which would be more intensive. And, and again, it's another one of these things I haven't had the time to try it because we've got to build. Well, we actually have the wavelet decomposition as part of a multi-grid solver in an old MPAS code that was developed a long time ago that never got released. And, and effectively that can be used as a, uh, for the wavelet decomposition. But we haven't taken that machinery and brought it to the latest version and started using it for these, potentially these other purposes where it might be quite useful. So I hope this won't damage our friendship. So speaking of hurricane applications, which I think are important, is there ever going to be a regional version of, of an ocean model that can be coupled to pass regional if you wanted to do it that way? There, there's nothing that precludes it outside of a coupler. Okay. And interestingly enough, if it's we could get, if we minute, could get the climate model, the climate model version, the climate model running at high resolution in MPAS, they, the, the claim is that CESM can run regional, that all the hooks are there. Of course, no one's turned it on, so it's a hard claim to back up, but, but the claim is there. However, that may not be the pathway if you want it in your lifetime. That, that may not be the pathway to take, so. Well, I'm a storm model. I'm a storm, severe yeah. weather guy, so I don't really but, but care. Yeah. But I thought yeah. I'd ask. It. Yeah. So, 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 I, so I don't see I don't see an issue there in terms of it's just a coupling problem, and MPAS should be able to to you utilize the couplers that are out there now to to do that coupling. So there is a um, online person who wants to actually speak. Ah, I, I'm all for it. Okay, um, can I speak now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, maybe simpler questions, but about GPU configuration. I wonder at this stage, I got some partial answer on the text, but I, 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 I know it's going to be more officially available to the users next year sometime, but then at this moment, do you guys sort of discourage users to try GPU enabled version. I see two branches in the GitHub repo. The one is probably older version six of OpenACC. There's another one, Atmosphere Thrust developed OpenACC. And uh, so for some computing center, GPU readiness is really urgent. Uh, this is my case at the DOE computer center. So. Actually, I downloaded and uh, start to <laughs> try myself, but I have starting with have HPC forks to install some dependency module compiled for and pass in NV NVIDIA compiler. So well, not that stage yet, but uh, if it's not discouraged, it'd be really nice if there's some place we can see the sort of latest information or latest state on a GPU, particularly. Uh, the computing center I use has lots 
in common with derecho. So whatever improvement problem solves for derecho might be applicable to other uh, computing center, particularly uh, in my case, NORF. So yeah, two questions, is it encouraged or discouraged? Or and then is there any way of um, keep us updated on this problem? So we certainly are not discouraging people from trying it, um, but we are trying to make it clear that you need some capabilities, some, some software engineering capabilities or a lot of experience to, to actually be successful in this because it's a whole nother level trying to make use of the GPUs, getting the, the software stack right, et cetera, getting it mapped properly and getting it to run efficiently. Uh, that, that, that's a whole nother matter. In terms of the, the versions that are on there, um, Michael, do you want to say anything about those? Or I, I know our release version points to one. Yeah, so there there are two versions that are available. As you said, there's that Atmosphere V six point X Open ACC branch, uh, which is the original port, and that Atmosphere Develop Open ACC branch was our attempt to try to bring that up to date with something that resembled the head of our develop branch at the time, um, and to also update the ports of the physics schemes. Uh, and that's, if you browse around the open pull requests and search for the open ACC label, you'll see that there are still some open pull requests to fix issues there. Um, I, yeah, I would state it thusly. Um, we don't discourage using those branches, um, but I wouldn't pin your hopes on those. Um, I'll admit this, I can't, I can't get those myself to run reliably. Um, so that's kind of the state of things. Um, but it, it's certainly worth giving it a try. Um, and I think feedback is, is helpful knowing how it breaks, why it breaks. That's a bigger question. Um, yeah. yeah. It, yeah, <laughs> it's, I, mean, I, I don't mean to be negative, but it's, um, you know, it's kind of one of the things we found in this. Um, this is kind of, I think, why we're charting a very careful pathway towards a, what we call the net second slide. If you back up one slide, uh, Bill. Well, it was the slide that said, you know, towards an impasse. A for the community. Um, so, you know, neither of those branches support regional simulations right now. Um, and in this first bullet point here, we say the code lacks robustness. And you know, that's not to imply that on the very specific hardware for which it was designed with the specific versions of compilers and with very specific configurations, it can't be made to work well. Um, but robustness there refers to the fact that if you if you change anything in the name list, you know, change physics schemes, do anything, you know, look at it wrongly, um, it it just won't run. Um, there, there's a very specific mapping of MPI ranks to devices that's hardwired for like AC 922 architectures. So it's, um, that's all to say, yeah, it, we, we don't necessarily discourage people. Certainly if you, if you have access to Summit or things like Summit, um, go ahead and give it a try. But, but otherwise, um, uh, it'll be more yeah. difficult. Oh, I see. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this very honest actually uh, replies. And that kind of, uh, I was, as a user, I was thinking once we started using GP level version, I was wondering probably we get quite different kind of compile time and runtime errors that probably most of the users are not familiar with. So actually you guys are really being careful in robustness. It's really, I appreciate that. And uh, as a user, I think we also need to learn something about GPU enabled core, not not really the basic simple example that we can get in uh, like a training event, you know, solve some uh, simple question is GPU enabled code or not, but probably at practically what kind of errors we should expect or what kind of so, you know, solutions we can uh, get. But uh, again, thanks. I really appreciate that uh, carefulness and uh, I'm looking forward to, I probably still keep it a try. <laughs> looking okay. forward to some, yeah, okay. some, having some interaction. Yeah, no, we, we, we would value the feedback, I think. Um, 
the, yeah, the errors will be myriad and, and inscrutable. Um, but so this raises, an, uh, I think, a really interesting point, right? Like if we go all in on GPUs and the result is a code that's so temperamental that no one can even run, run it reliably, you know, I can see usage of MPAS falling off a cliff. People will create Neo Wharf or something to, to pick up the slack. So, I mean, that, that really is part of the challenge, I think, is how do we produce codes that run well on accelerated architectures, but that are still maintainable and usable by, you know, by Joe scientists um, and, and that people can still develop and contribute to without saying, you know, for every hour that you put in in your development, we need 10 hours to get that ported and working well on GPUs. That, that is the challenge before us, I think. Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Koichi. Um, Joe, do you yeah. wanna come and, and close things here? Well, it's great to have such an active audience here uh, participating all the way to the uh, end of our session. So that's uh, very refreshing. Uh, before we break up today, I want uh, to acknowledge some of the folks that have helped make this uh, a very successful workshop. Uh, first of all, uh, Neely Smith uh, has been uh, so helpful in holding things down out in the atrium and making sure everything was in the right place and current. Uh, you probably got your name tags from her when you first uh, came. I think she had to leave early, so she, she's not here. Uh, also, Robin Ty, Kay Sandoval, and Kelly Warner have been very helpful uh, in uh, with administrative and logistical aspects of it. I see Kelly back there has been uh, monitoring the uh, uh, the remote uh, participants and, and their questions. Is is Robin here somewhere? Uh, well, anyway, and I don't think Kay is here. Um, <clears throat> also, want to uh, acknowledge Ryan Johnson is our webmaster and is very helpful in uh, in web support, and we certainly appreciate that. Uh, the UCAR event services are responsible for the uh, uh, providing and laying out the, the break food and the lunches and the food and drink at, at the reception that uh, I think all has uh, worked out very nicely. We certainly appreciate. Um, also, the, uh, the multimedia group uh, has really made this uh, hybrid uh, workshop with the combined in-person and, and remote presentations work so smoothly. And you guys back there have just done a wonderful job. Is it Kelvin and Joey? All right, yeah, that was <laughs> All right, well, and uh, Finally, I want to uh, uh, especially acknowledge the contributions from Wei Wang, who has led the organization and planning for virtually every aspect of this workshop and uh, dealt with a, a number of challenges that we've had to face coming back to an in-person uh, format after years of COVID and with things fun working much more different, much different than uh, uh, they, than they used to, and uh, uh, the, everything is is worked out in, in great fashion. So thank you, Wei. So finally, I hope that you all will come and participate in the mini tutorials uh, tomorrow morning. So we'll pick it up again. <laughs>